She-Wolf by Maurice Drouin Part 1 From the Thames to the Garonne Chapter 1 No one ever escapes from the Tower of London A monstrous raven, huge, gleaming and black, nearly as big as a goose, was hopping about in front of the dungeon window. Sometimes it halted, lowered a wing, and hypocritically closed its little round eye as if in sleep. Then suddenly, darting out its beak, it pecked at the man's eye shining behind the bars. His grey, flint-coloured eyes seemed to have a special attraction for the bird. But the prisoner was too quick for it, and had already drawn his face back out of danger. The raven continued its constitutional, taking short, heavy hops. Then the man reached his hand out of the window. It was a long, shapely, sinewy hand. He moved it forward slowly, then let it lie still, like a twig on the dusty ground, hoping to seize the raven by the neck. But the bird, in spite of its size, could move quickly too. It hopped aside, emitting a hoarse croak. "'Take care, Edward, take care,' said the man behind the bars. "'I'll strangle you one day.' For the prisoner had given the treacherous bird the name of his enemy, the King of England. The game had been going on for eighteen months. Eighteen months during which the raven had pecked at the prisoner's eyes. Eighteen months during which the prisoner had tried to strangle the bird. Eighteen months during which Roger Mortimer, eighth baron of Wigmore, lord of the Welsh marches, and the king's ex-lieutenant of Ireland had been imprisoned, together with his uncle Roger Mortimer of Chirk, one-time justiciar of Wales in a dungeon in the Tower of London. For prisoners of their rank, and they belonged to the most ancient aristocracy in the kingdom, it was the normal custom to provide a decent lodging. But King Edward II, when he had taken the two Mortimers prisoner at the Battle of Shrewsbury, where he had defeated his rebellious barons, had assigned them to this low and narrow prison, whose only daylight came from ground level in the new buildings he had constructed to the right of the clock tower. Compelled, under pressure from the court, the bishops, and even the common people, to commute the death sentence he had first decreed against the Mortimers to life imprisonment, the king had good hopes that this unhealthy prison cell, this dungeon in which their heads touched the ceiling, would in the long run perform the executioner's office for him. And indeed, though Roger Mortimer of Wigmore, who was now thirty-six years of age, had been able to endure the miserable prison, the eighteen months of fog pouring in through the low window, and rain trickling down the walls, or, in the summer season, the oppressive, stagnant, stifling heat at the bottom of their hole seemed to have got the better of the Lord of Chirk. The elder Mortimer was losing his hair and his teeth. His legs had swollen, and his hands were crippled with rheumatism. He scarcely ever left the oak plank that served him for a bed, while his nephew stood by the window, staring out into the light. It was the second summer they had spent in the dungeon. Dawn had broken two hours ago over this most famous of English fortresses, which was the heart of the kingdom and the symbol of its prince's power, on the white tower, the huge square keep, which gave an impression of architectural lightness in spite of its gigantic proportions, and which William the Conqueror had built on the foundations of the remains of the ancient Roman castrum, on the surrounding towers, on the crenellated walls built by Richard Coeur de Lyon, on the king's house, on the chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula, and on the traitor's gate. The day was going to be hot, sultry even, as yesterday had been. 
The sun glowed pink on the stonework, and there was a slightly nauseating stench of mud coming from the banks of the Thames, which lay close at hand, flowing past the embankments of the moat. Edward, the raven, had joined the other giant ravens on that famous and melancholy lawn, the green, where the block was set up on days of execution. The birds pecked at the grass that had been nourished by the blood of Scottish patriots, state criminals, and fallen favourites. The green was being raked, and the paved paths surrounding it swept, but the ravens were unconcerned. No one would have dared harm the birds, for ravens had lived here since time immemorial, and were the objects of a sort of superstition. The soldiers of the guard began emerging from their barracks. They were hurriedly buckling their belts and leggings, and donning their steel helmets to assemble for the daily parade, which had, this morning, a particular importance, for it was August the first, the feast of St. Peter ad Vincula, to whom the chapel was dedicated, and also the annual feast day in the tower. There was a grinding of locks and bolts on the low door of the Mortimer's dungeon. The turnkey opened it, glanced inside, and let the barber in. The barber, a man with beady eyes, a long nose, and a round mouth, came once a week to shave Roger Mortimer the younger. The operation was torture to the prisoner during the winter months. For the constable, Stephen Seagrave, governor of the tower, had said, If Lord Mortimer wishes to be shaved, I will send him the barber, but I have no obligation to provide him with hot water. But Lord Mortimer had held to it, in the first place to defy the constable, secondly because his detested enemy, King Edward, wore a handsome blonde beard, and finally and above all, for his own morale, knowing well that if he yielded on this point he would give way progressively to the physical deterioration that lies in wait for the prisoner. He had before his eyes the example of his uncle, who no longer took any care of his person. His chin a matted thicket, his hair thinning on his skull, the Lord of Chirk had begun to look like an old anchorite, and continually complained of the multiple ills assailing him. "'It's only my poor body's pain,' he sometimes said, "'that reminds me I am still alive.' Young Roger Mortimer had therefore welcomed Barber Ogle week after week, even when they had to break the ice in the bowl and the razor left his cheeks bleeding. But he had had his reward— for he had realised, after a few months, that Ogle could be used as a link with the outside world. The man's character was a strange one. He was rapacious, and yet capable of devotion. He suffered from the lowly position he occupied in life, for he considered it inferior to his true worth. Conspiracy offered him an opportunity for secret revenge, and also enabled him to acquire by sharing the secrets of the great, importance in his own eyes. The Baron of Wigmore was undoubtedly the most noble man, both by birth and nature, he had ever met. Besides, a prisoner who insisted on being shaved, even in frosty weather, was certainly to be admired. Thanks to the barber, Mortimer had established tenuous, yet regular communication with his partisans, and particularly with Adam Orleton, Bishop of Hereford. Again, through the barber, he had learned that the lieutenant of the tower, Gerard de Elspe, might be won over to his cause, and through the barber once more he had set on foot the dilatory negotiations for his escape. The bishop had promised him he would be rescued by summer, and summer had now come. The turnkey looked through the spy-hole in the door from time to time, not because he was particularly suspicious, but merely out of professional habit. Roger Mortimer, a wooden bowl under his chin, 
Would he ever again have a fine basin of beaten silver, as in the past? Listen to the polite conversation the barber made in a loud voice, for appearance's sake. The summer, the heat, the weather continued fine, very lucky on the feast of St. Peter. Bending low over his razor, Ogle whispered in the prisoner's ear, Be ready tonight, my lord. Roger Mortimer gave no sign. His flinty eyes, under his thick eyebrows, merely looked into the barber's beady eyes, and acknowledged the information with a wink. Alsby, Mortimer whispered. He'll go with us, the barber replied, attending to the other side of Mortimer's face. The bishop, the prisoner asked again. He'll be waiting for you outside after dark, said the barber, who began at once to talk again at the top of his voice of the heat, the parade that was to take place that morning, and the games that would fill the afternoon. The shaving done, Roger Mortimer rinsed his face and dried it with a towel. He did not even feel its rough contact. When Barber Ogle had gone with the turnkey, the prisoner put both hands to his chest and took a deep breath. With difficulty, he prevented himself shouting aloud, Be ready tonight. The words were ringing through his head. Could it really be true that it was for tonight at last? He went to the pallet bed on which his companion in prison was sleeping. Uncle, he said, it's tonight. The old Lord of Chirk turned over with a groan, looked at his nephew with his pale eyes that shone with a green glow in the shadowy dungeon, and replied wearily, no one ever escapes from the Tower of London, my boy. No one. Neither tonight, nor ever. Young Mortimer showed his irritation. Why should a man who, at worst, had so comparatively little of life to lose, be so obstinately discouraging and refuse to take any risks whatever? He didn't reply so as not to lose his temper. Though they spoke French together, as did the court and the nobility of Norman origin, while servants, soldiers, and the common people spoke English, they were still afraid of being overheard. He went back to the narrow window and looked out at the parade, which he could see only from ground level, with the happy feeling that he was perhaps watching it for the last time. The soldiers' leggings passed to and fro at eye level. Their thick leather boots stamped the paving. Roger Mortimer could not but admire the precision of the archers' drill. Those wonderful English archers, who were the best in Europe, and could shoot as many as twelve arrows a minute. In the centre of the green, Alspe, the lieutenant, standing rigid as a post, was shouting orders at the top of his voice. He then reported the guard to the constable. At first sight, it was difficult to understand why this tall, pink and white young man, who was so attentive to his duty and so clearly concerned to do the right thing, should have agreed to betray his charge. There could be no doubt that he had been persuaded to it for other reasons than mere money. Gerard de Alspe, the lieutenant of the Tower of London, wished, as did many officers, sheriffs, bishops, and lords, to see England freed from the bad ministers surrounding the king. In his youthful way he was dreaming of a great career, and, what was more, he loathed and despised his immediate superior, the constable, Seagrave. The constable, a one-eyed, flabby-cheeked, and incompetent drunkard, owed his high position, in fact, to the protection of those bad ministers. Overtly indulging in the very practices King Edward displayed before his court, the constable was inclined to use the garrison of the tower as a harem. He liked tall, fair young men, 
and Lieutenant Alspay's life had become hell, for he was religious and had no vicious tendencies. Alspay had indeed repelled the constable's advances, and as a result had become the object of his relentless persecution. From sheer vengeance, Seagrave seized every opportunity to plague and vex him. Slothful though he was, this one-eyed man found the leisure to be cruel. And now, as he inspected the men, he mocked and insulted his second-in-command over the merest trifles. A fault in the men's dressing, a spot of rust on the blade of a dagger, a minute tear in the leather of a quiver. His single eye searched only for faults. Though it was a feast day, on which punishments were generally remitted, the constable, faulting their equipment, ordered three soldiers to be whipped on the spot. They happened to be three of the best archers. A sergeant was sent to fetch the rods. The men who were to be punished had to take their breeches down in front of the ranks of their comrades. The constable seemed much amused at the sight. If the guards know better turned out next time, Alspay, it'll be you, he said. Then the whole garrison, with the exception of the sentries on the gates and ramparts, gathered in the chapel to hear mass and sing canticles. Listening at his window, the prisoner could hear their rough, untuneful voices. Be ready tonight, my lord. The ex-lieutenant of the king in Ireland could think of nothing except that he might perhaps be free this very night. But there was a whole day in which to wait, hope, and indeed fear. Fear that Ogle would make some silly mistake in executing the agreed plan. Fear that Alspay would succumb to a sense of duty at the last moment. There was a whole day in which to dwell on all the obstacles, all the hazards that might prejudice his escape. It's better not even to think of it, he thought and take it for granted that all will go well. It's always something you've never even considered that goes wrong. Nevertheless, it's also the stronger will that triumphs. And yet his mind, inevitably, returned again and again to the same anxieties. In any event, there'll still be the sentries on the walls. He jumped quickly back from the window, the raven had approached stealthily along the wall, and this time it was a near thing that it did not get the prisoner's eye. Oh, Edward, Edward, that's going too far, Mortimer said between clenched teeth. If ever I'm going to succeed in strangling you, it must be today. The garrison was coming out of the chapel and going into the refectory for the traditional feast. The turnkey reappeared at the dungeon door, accompanied by a warder with the prisoner's food. For once, the bean soup was accompanied by a slice of mutton. Try to stand up, uncle, Mortimer said. They even deprive us of mass, as if we were excommunicated said the old lord. He insisted on eating on his palate, and indeed scarcely touched his portion. Have my share. You need it more than I, he said to his nephew. The turnkey had gone. The prisoners would not be visited again till evening. Have you really made up your mind not to go with me, uncle? Mortimer asked. Go with you where, my boy? No one ever escapes from the tower. It has never been done. Nor does one rebel against one's king. Edward's not the best sovereign England's had. Indeed he's not. And those two dispensers deserve to be here instead of us. But you don't choose your king. You serve him. I should never have listened to you and Thomas of Lancaster when you took up arms. Thomas has been beheaded, and look where we are. 
It was the hour at which his uncle, having swallowed a few mouthfuls of food, would sometimes talk in a monotonous, whining voice, recapitulating over and over again the same complaints his nephew had heard for the last eighteen months. At sixty-seven, the elder Mortimer was no longer recognizable as the handsome man and great lord he had been, famous for the fabulous tournament he had given at his castle at Kenilworth, which had been the talk of three generations. The nephew did his best to rekindle a few embers in the old man's exhausted heart. He could see his white locks hanging lank in the shadows. In any case, my legs would fail me, the old man added. Why not get out of bed and try them out a little? In any case, I'll carry you. I've told you so. Oh, yes, I know. You'll carry me over the walls and into the water, though I can't swim. You'll carry my head to the block, that's what you'll do, and yours too. God may well be working for our deliverance. And you'll spoil it all by this stubborn folly of yours. It's always the same. There's rebellion in the Mortimer blood. Remember the first Roger, the son of the bishop and the daughter of King Herfast of Denmark. He defeated the whole army of the King of France under the walls of his castle of Mortimer Ombury. And yet he so greatly offended the conqueror our kinsman, that all his lands and possessions were taken from him. The younger Roger sat on a stool, crossed his arms, closed his eyes, and leaned backwards a little to support his shoulders against the wall. Every day he had to listen to an account of their ancestors, hear for the hundredth time how Ralph the Bearded, son of the first Roger, had landed in England in the train of Duke William. How he had received Wigmore in fief, and why the Mortimers had been powerful in four counties ever since. In the refectory the soldiers had finished eating, and were bawling drinking songs. Please, uncle, Mortimer said, do leave our ancestors alone for a while. I'm in no such hurry to go to join them as you are. I know we're descended from royal blood, but royal blood is of small account in prison. Will her fast sword set us free? Where are our lands, and are we paid our revenues in this dungeon? And when you've repeated once again the names of all our female ancestors, Hadevigge, Melisande, Matilda the Mean, Valcheline de Ferrer, Gladusa de Braus, Am I to dream of no women but them till I draw my last breath? For a moment the old man was nonplussed, and stared absent-mindedly at his swollen hands and their long, broken nails. Then he said, Every one fills his prison life as best he can. Old men with the lost past, young men with tomorrows they'll never see. You believe the whole of England loves you and is working on your behalf, that Bishop Orleton is your faithful friend, that the Queen herself is doing her best to save you, and that in a few hours you'll be setting out for France, Aquitaine, Provence, or somewhere of the sort, and that the bells will ring out in welcome all along your road. Yeah, but you'll see, no one will come tonight. With a weary gesture, he passed his hands across his eyes, then turned his face to the wall. Young Mortimer went back to the window, put a hand out through the bars, and let it lie as if dead in the dust. Uncle will now doze till evening, he thought. He'll make up his mind to come at the last moment, but he won't make it any easier. Indeed, it may well fail because of him. Ah, there's Edward. The raven stopped a little way from the motionless hand and wiped its big black beak against its foot. If I strangle it, I shall succeed in escaping. If I miss it, I shall fail. 
It was no longer a game, but a wager with destiny. The prisoner needed to invent omens to pass the time of waiting and quiet his anxiety. He watched the raven with the eye of a hunter, but as if it realized the danger, the raven moved away. The soldiers were coming out of the refectory, their faces all lit up. They dispersed over the courtyard in little groups for the games, races and wrestling that were a tradition of the feast. For two hours, naked to the waist, they sweated under the sun, competed in throwing each other or in their skill in casting maces at a wooden picket. Then he heard the constable cry, The King's Prize! Who wants to win a shilling? Then, as it drew towards evening, the soldiers went to wash in the cisterns, and, noisier than in the morning, talking of their exploits or their defeats, they went back to the refectory to eat and drink once more. Anyone who was not drunk on the night of St. Peter ad Vincula earned the contempt of his comrades. The prisoner could hear them getting down to the wine. Dusk fell over the courtyard, the blue dusk of a summer's evening, and the stench of mud from the riverbank became perceptible once again. Suddenly a long, fierce, hoarse croaking, the sort of animal cry that makes men uneasy, rent the air from beyond the window. "'What's that?' the old Lord of Chirk asked from the far end of the dungeon. "'I missed him,' his nephew said. "'I got him by the wing instead of the neck.' In the uncertain evening light he gazed sadly at the few black feathers in his hand. The raven had disappeared, and would not now come back again. "'It's mere childish folly to attach any importance to it,' the younger Mortimer thought. "'And it's nearly time now.' But he had an unhappy sense of foreboding. But his mind was diverted from the omen by the extraordinary silence that had fallen over the tower during the last few minutes. There was no more noise from the refectory. The voices of the drinkers had been stilled in their throats. The clatter of plates and pitchers had ceased. There was nothing but the sound of a dog barking somewhere in the garden and the distant cry of a waterman on the Thames. Had Alspe's plot been discovered? Was the silence lying over the fortress due to a shock of amazement at the discovery of a great betrayal? His forehead to the window bars, the prisoner held his breath and stared out into the shadows, listening for the slightest sound. An archer reeled across the courtyard, vomited against a wall, collapsed onto the ground and lay still. Mortimer could see him lying motionless on the grass. The first stars were already appearing in the sky. It would be a clear night. Two more soldiers came out of the refectory, holding their stomachs, and collapsed at the foot of a tree. This could be no ordinary drunkenness that bowled men over like a blow from a club. Roger Mortimer went to the other end of the dungeon. He knew exactly where his boots stood in a corner and put them on. They slipped on easily enough, for his legs had grown thin. "'What are you doing, Roger?' the elder Mortimer asked. "'I'm getting ready, Uncle. It's almost time. Our friend Alspe seems to have played his part well. The tower might be dead.' "'And they haven't brought us our second meal.' the old lord complained anxiously. Roger Mortimer tucked his shirt into his breeches and buckled his belt about his military tunic. His clothes were worn and ragged, for they had refused his requests for new ones for the past eighteen months. He was still wearing those in which he had fought and they had taken him, removing his dented armour. His lower lip had been wounded by a blow on the chin-piece. If you succeed, I shall be left all alone, and they'll revenge themselves on me, his uncle said. 
there was a good deal of selfishness in the old man's vain obstinacy in trying to dissuade his nephew from escaping. "'Listen, uncle, they're coming,' the younger Mortimer said, his voice curt and authoritative. "'You must get up now.' There were footsteps approaching the door, sounding on the flagstones. A voice called, "'My lord!' "'Is that you, Alspe?' Mortimer asked. "'Yes, my lord, but I haven't got the key. "'Your turnkey's so drunk he's lost the bunch. "'In his present condition it's impossible to get any sense out of him. "'I've searched everywhere.' "'There was a sniggering laugh from the uncle's pallet. "'The younger Mortimer swore in his disappointment. "'Was Alspe lying?' had he taken fright at the last moment. But why had he come at all in that case? Or was it merely one of those absurd mischances, such as the prisoner had been trying to foresee all day, and which was now presenting itself in this guise? "'I assure you everything's ready, my lord,' went on Alspey. "'The bishop's powder we put in the wine has worked wonders. They were very drunk already and noticed nothing.' and now they're sleeping the sleep of the dead. The ropes are ready, the boat's waiting for you, but I can't find the key. How long have we got? The sentries are unlikely to grow anxious for half an hour or so. They feasted, too, before going on guard. Who is with you? Ogle. Send him for a sledgehammer, a chisel, and a crowbar, and take the stone out. I'll go with him and come back at once. The two men went off. Roger Mortimer measured the time by the beating of his heart. Was he to fail because of a lost key? It needed only a sentry to abandon his post on some pretext or other, and the chance would be gone. Even the old lord was silent. Mortimer could hear his irregular breathing from the other side of the dungeon. Soon a ray of light filtered under the door. Alspe was back with the barber, who was carrying a candle and the tools. They set to work on the stone in the wall into which the bolt of the lock was sunk some two inches. They did their best to muffle their hammering, but even so it seemed to them that the noise echoed through the whole tower. Slivers of stone fell to the ground. At last the lock gave way and the door opened. "'Be quick, my lord,' Alspe said. His face glowed pink in the light of the candle and was dripping with sweat. His hands were trembling. Roger Mortimer went to his uncle and bent over him. "'No, go alone, my boy,' said the old man. "'You must escape. May God protect you. And then don't hold it against me that I'm old.' The elder Mortimer drew his nephew to him by the sleeve, and traced the sign of the cross on his forehead with his thumb. "'Avenge us, Roger,' he murmured. Roger Mortimer bowed his head and left the dungeon. "'Which way do we go?' he asked. "'By the kitchens,' Alspe replied. The lieutenant, the barber, and the prisoner went up a few stairs, along a passage, and through several dark rooms. "'Are you armed, Alspey? Roger Mortimer whispered suddenly. "'I've got my dagger. There's a man there.' There was a shadow against the wall. Mortimer had seen it first. The barber concealed the weak flame of the candle behind the palm of his hand. The lieutenant drew his dagger. They moved slowly forward. The man was standing quite still in the shadows. His shoulders and arms were flat against the wall, and his legs wide apart. He seemed to be having some difficulty in remaining upright. "'It's Seagrave,' the lieutenant said. The one-eyed constable had become aware that both he and his men had been drugged, and had succeeded in making his way as far as this. He was wrestling with an overwhelming longing to sleep. He could see his prisoner escaping and his lieutenant betraying him, but he could neither utter a sound nor move a limb. 
In his single eye, beneath its heavy lid, was the fear of death. The lieutenant struck him in the face with his fist. The constable's head went back against the stone, and he fell to the ground. The three men passed the door of the great refectory in which the torches were smoking. The whole garrison was there, fast asleep. Collapsed over the tables, fallen across the benches, lying on the floor, snoring with their mouths open in the most grotesque attitudes, the archers looked as if some magician had put them to sleep for a hundred years. A similar sight met them in the kitchens, which were lit only by glowing embers under the huge cauldrons, from which rose a heavy, stagnant smell of fat. The cooks had also drunk of the wine of Aquitaine, in which the barber ogle had mixed the drug, and there they lay, under the meat-safe, alongside the bread-bin, among the pitchers, stomachs up, arms widespread. The only moving thing was a cat, gorged on raw meat and stalking over the tables. "'This way, my lord,' said the lieutenant, leading the prisoner towards an alcove, which served both as a latrine and for the disposal of kitchen waste. The opening built into this alcove was the only one on this side of the walls wide enough to give passage to a man. Ogle produced a rope ladder he had hidden in a chest and brought up a stool to which to attach it. They wedged the stool across the opening. The lieutenant went first, then Roger Mortimer, and then the barber. They were soon all three clinging to the ladder and making their way down the wall, hanging thirty feet above the gleaming waters of the moat. The moon had not yet risen. My uncle would certainly never have been able to escape this way, Mortimer thought. A black shape stirred beside him with a rustling of feathers. It was a big raven wakened from sleep in a loophole. Mortimer instinctively put out a hand and felt amid the warm feathers till he found the bird's neck. It uttered a long, desolate, almost human cry. He clenched his fist with all his might, twisting his wrist till he felt the bones crack beneath his fingers. The body fell into the water below with a loud splash. "'Who goes there?' a sentry cried. And a helmet leaned out of a crenel on the summit of the clock tower. The three fugitives clinging to the rope ladder pressed close to the wall. Why did I do that? Mortimer wondered. What an absurd temptation to yield to! There are surely enough risks already without inventing more. And I don't even know if it was Edward. But the sentry was reassured by the silence and continued his beat. They heard his footsteps fading into the night. They went on climbing down. At this time of year the water in the moat was not very deep. The three men dropped into it up to the shoulders and began moving along the foundations of the fortress, feeling their way along the stones of the Roman wall. They circled the clock tower and then crossed the moat, moving as quietly as possible. The bank was slippery with mud. They hoisted themselves out onto their stomachs, helping each other as best they could then ran, crouching to the river bank. Hidden in the reeds, a boat was waiting for them. There were two men at the oars, and another sitting in the stern, wrapped in a long, dark cloak, his head covered by a hood with earlaps. He whistled softly three times. The fugitives jumped into the boat. "'My Lord Mortimer,' said the man in the cloak, holding out his hand. "'My Lord Bishop,' replied the fugitive, extending his own. His fingers encountered the cabochon of a ring, and he bent his lips to it. "'Go ahead, quickly,' the bishop ordered the rowers. And the oars dipped into the water. Adam Orleton, Bishop of Hereford, who had been provided to his see by the Pope, and against the king's wish, was leader of the clerical opposition, 
and had organized the escape of the most important baron in the kingdom. It was Orleton who had planned and prepared everything, had persuaded Alspe to play his part by assuring him he would not only make his fortune but attain to paradise, and had provided the narcotic which had put the Tower of London to sleep. Did everything go well, Alspe? he asked. As well as it could, my lord, the lieutenant replied. How long will they sleep? Two days or so, no doubt. I have the money promised each of you here, the bishop said, showing them the heavy purse he was holding under his cloak. And I have also sufficient for your expenses, my lord, for a few weeks at least. At that moment they heard the sentry shout, Sound the alarm! But the boat was well out into the river, and no sentry's cries would succeed in awakening the tower. I owe everything to you, including my life, Mortimer said to the bishop. Wait till you're in France, Orleton replied. Don't thank me till then. Horses are awaiting us at Bermondsey on the farther bank. A ship has been chartered and is lying off Dover, ready to sail. Are you coming with me? No, my lord. I have no reason to fly. When I have seen you on board, I shall go back to my diocese. Are you not afraid for your life, after what you've just done? I belong to the church, the bishop replied with some irony. The king hates me, but will not dare touch me. This calm-voiced prelate who could carry on a conversation in these circumstances, and in the middle of the Thames, as tranquilly as if he were in his episcopal palace, possessed a singular courage, and Mortimer admired him sincerely. The oarsmen were in the centre of the boat, Alspe and the barber in the bows. And the queen? Mortimer asked. Have you seen her recently? Is she being plagued as much as ever? At the moment the Queen is in Yorkshire, travelling with the King. His absence has made our undertaking all the easier. Your wife? The bishop slightly emphasised the last word. Sent me news of her the other day. Mortimer felt himself blush and was thankful for the darkness that concealed his embarrassment. He had shown concern for the Queen before even inquiring about his family and his wife. And why had he lowered his voice to ask the question? Had he thought of no one but Queen Isabella during his whole eighteen months in prison? The Queen wishes you well, the bishop went on. It is she who was furnished from her privy purse, from that meagre privy purse, which is all our good friends the dispensers consent to allow her, the money I am going to give you, so that you may live in France. As for the rest, Alspe, the barber, the horses, and the ship that awaits you, my diocese will pay the expenses. He put his hand on the fugitive's arm. But you're soaked through he said. No matter, replied Mortimer. A free air will dry me quick enough. He got to his feet, took off his tunic and shirt, and stood naked to the waist in the middle of the boat. He had a shapely, well-built body, powerful shoulders, and a long, muscular back. Imprisonment had made him thinner, but had not impaired the impression he gave of physical strength. The moon, which had just risen, bathed him in a golden light, and threw the contours of his chest into relief. Propitious, dangerous to fugitives, said the bishop, pointing to the moon. We timed it exactly right. The night air was laden with the scent of reeds and water, and Roger Mortimer felt it playing over his skin and through his wet hair. The smooth black Thames slid along the sides of the boat, and the oars made golden sparks. The opposite bank was drawing near. 
The great baron of the marches turned to look for the last time at the tower, standing tall and proud above its fortifications, ramparts, and embankments. No one ever escapes from the tower. And, indeed, he was the first prisoner who ever had escaped from it. He began to consider the importance of his deed, and the defiance it hurled at the power of kings. Behind it the sleeping city stood out against the night. Along both banks, as far as the great bridge, with its shops and guarded by its high towers, could be seen the innumerable, crowded, slowly waving masts of the ships of the London Hans, the Teutonic Hans, the Paris Hans of the Marchands d'Eau, indeed of the whole of Europe, bringing cloth from Bruges, copper, pitch, wax, knives, the wines of the Saint-Ange and of Aquitaine, and dried fish, and loading for Flanders, Rouen, Bordeaux, and Lisbon, corn, leather, tin, cheeses, and above all wool, which was the best in the world, from English sheep. The great Venetian galleys could be distinguished by their shape and their gilding. But Roger Mortimer of Wigmore was already thinking of France. He would go first to Artois to ask asylum of his cousin Jean de Fienne, the son of his mother's brother. He stretched his arms wide in the gesture of a free man. And Bishop Orleton, who regretted that he had been born neither so handsome nor so great a lord, gazed with a sort of envy at this strong, confident body that seemed so apt for leaping into the saddle, at the tall, sculptured torso, the proud chin, and the rough, curly hair, which were to carry England's destiny into exile. Chapter 2 The Harassed Queen the red velvet footstool on which Queen Isabella was resting her slender feet was threadbare. The gold tassels at its four corners were tarnished. The embroidered lilies of France and leopards of England were worn. But what was the use of replacing the footstool by ordering another? If the new one were immediately to disappear beneath the pearl-embroidered shoes of Hugh Dispenser, the king's lover. The Queen looked down at the old footstool that had lain on the flagstones of every castle in the kingdom, one season in Dorset, another in Norfolk, a winter in Warwick, and this last summer in Yorkshire, for they never stayed more than three days in the same place. On August the 1st, less than a week ago, the court had been at Cowick. Yesterday they had stopped at Eswick. Today they were camping, rather than lodging, at Kirkham Priory. The day after tomorrow they would set out for Lockton and Pickering. The few dusty tapestries, the dented dishes, and the worn dresses which constituted Queen Isabella's travelling wardrobe would be packed into the travelling chests once again. The curtained bed, which was so weakened by its travels that it was now in danger of collapsing altogether, would be taken down and put up again somewhere else. That bed in which the Queen took sometimes her lady-in-waiting, Lady Jeanne Mortimer, and sometimes her eldest son, Prince Edward, to sleep with her for fear of being murdered if she slept alone. At least the dispensers would not dare stab her under the eye of the heir apparent. And it was thus they journeyed across the kingdom, through its green countryside and by its melancholy castles. Edward II wanted to be known personally to the least of his vassals. He thought he did them honour by staying with them, and that a few friendly words would assure their loyalty against the Scots or the Welsh party. In fact, he would have done better to show himself less. He created latent discord wherever he went, the careless way he talked of government matters, which he believed to be a sovereign attitude of detachment, offended the lords, abbots, and notables who came to explain local problems to him. 
the intimacy he paraded with his all-powerful chamberlain, whose hand he caressed in open council or at mass, his high-pitched laughter, his sudden generosity to some little clerk or astonished young groom, all confirmed the scandalous stories that were current even in the remotest districts, where husbands no doubt deceived their wives as everywhere else, but did so with women. And what was only whispered before his coming was said out aloud after he had passed by. This handsome, fair-bearded man, who was so weak of will, had but to appear with his crown on his head, and the whole prestige of the royal majesty collapsed. And the avaricious courtiers by whom he was surrounded helped considerably to make him hated. Useless and powerless, the queen had to take part in this ill-considered progress. She was torn by two conflicting emotions. On the one hand, her truly royal nature, inherited from her Capet ancestors, was irritated and angered by the continuous process of degradation suffered by the sovereign power. But on the other hand, the wronged, harassed, and endangered wife secretly rejoiced at every new enemy the king made. She could not understand how she had once loved, or persuaded herself to love, so contemptible a creature who treated her so odiously. Why was she made to take part in these journeys? Why was she shown off, a wronged queen, to the whole kingdom? Did the king and his favourite really think they deceived anyone, or made their relations look innocent by the mere fact of her presence? Or was it that they wanted to keep her under their eye? She would have so much preferred to live in London or at Windsor, or even in one of the castles she had theoretically been given, while awaiting some change in circumstance, or simply the onset of old age. And how she regretted, above all, that Thomas of Lancaster and Roger Mortimer, those great barons who were really men, had not succeeded in their rebellion the year before last. Raising her beautiful blue eyes, she glanced up at the Count de Bouville, who had been sent over from the court of France, and said in a low voice, For a month past you have been able to see what my life is like, Messer Oug. I do not even ask you to recount its miseries to my brother, nor to my uncle of Valois. Four kings have succeeded each other on the throne of France. My father, King Philip, who married me off in the interests of the crown. Oh, God keep his soul, madame, may God keep it, said Fat Bouville, with conviction, but without raising his voice. There's no one in the world I loved more, nor served with greater joy. Then my brother Louis, who was but a few months on the throne, then my brother Philippe, with whom I had little in common, though he was not lacking in intelligence. Bouville frowned a little, as he did whenever King Philippe the Long was mentioned in his presence. And then my brother Charles, who is reigning now, went on the Queen. They have all been told of my unhappy circumstances, and they have been able to do nothing, or have wished to do nothing. The kings of France are not interested in England except in the matter of Aquitaine, and the homage due to them for that fief. A princess of France on the English throne, because she thereby becomes Duchess of Aquitaine, is a pledge of peace. And provided Guienne is quiet, little do they care whether their daughter or sister dies of shame and neglect beyond the sea. Report it or not, it will make no difference. But the days you have spent with me have been pleasant ones, for I have been able to talk to a friend. And you have seen how few I have. Without my dear Lady Jeanne, who shows great constancy in sharing my fortunes, I would not even have one. As she said these words, the Queen turned to her lady-in-waiting, who was sitting beside her. Jeanne Mortimer, 
great-niece of the famous Seneschal de Jeanville, was a tall woman of thirty-seven, with regular features, an honest face, and quiet hands. Madame, replied Lady Jeanne, you do more to sustain my courage than I do to maintain yours, and you've taken a great risk in keeping me with you when my husband is in prison. They all three went on talking in low voices, for the whisper and the aside had become necessary habits in that court where you were never alone, and the queen lived amid enmity. In a corner of the room three maidservants were embroidering a counterpane for Lady Eleanor Dispenser, the favourite's wife, who was playing chess by an open window with the heir apparent. A little farther off, the queen's second son, who had had his seventh birthday three weeks earlier, was making a bow from hazel switch, while the two little girls, Jane and Eleanor, respectively five and two, was sitting on the floor playing with rag dolls. Even as she moved the pieces over the ivory chessboard, Lady Dispenser never for a moment stopped watching the Queen and trying to hear what she was saying. Her forehead was smooth but curiously narrow. Her eyes were bright but too close together. Her mouth was sarcastic. Without being altogether hideous, there was nevertheless apparent that quality of ugliness which is imprinted by a wicked nature. A descendant of the Clare family, she had had a strange career, for she had been sister-in-law to the king's previous lover, Piers Gaveston, whom the barons under Thomas of Lancaster had executed eleven years before, and she was now the wife of the king's current lover. She derived a morbid pleasure from assisting male amours, partly to satisfy her love of money, and partly to gratify her lust for power. But she was a fool. She was prepared to lose her game of chess for the mere pleasure of saying provocatively, Check to the Queen! Check to the Queen! Edward, the heir apparent, was a boy of eleven. He had a rather long, thin face, and was by nature reserved rather than timid though he nearly always kept his eyes on the ground. At the moment he was taking advantage of his opponent's mistake to do his best to win. The August breeze was blowing gusts of warm dust through the narrow arched window, but when the sun sank it would turn cool and damp again within the thick, dark walls of ancient Kirkham Priory. There was a sound of many voices from the chapter house where the king was holding his itinerant council. Madame, said the Count de Bouville, I would willingly dedicate all the remainder of my days to your service, could they be useful to you. It would be a pleasure to me, I assure you. What is there for me to do here below? Since I am a widower and my sons are out in the world, except to use the last of my strength to serve the descendants of the king who was my benefactor. And it is with you, madame, that I feel myself nearest to him. You have all his strength of character, the way of talking he had when he felt so disposed, and all his beauty, which was so impervious to time. When he died at the age of forty-six, he looked barely more than thirty. It will be the same with you. No one would ever guess you've had four children. The Queen's face brightened into a smile. Surrounded as she was by so much hatred, she was grateful to be offered this devotion. And her feelings as a woman continually humiliated, it was sweet to hear her beauty praised, even if the compliment was from a fat old man with white hair and spaniel's eyes. I am already thirty-one, she said, of which fifteen years have been spent, as you see. It may not mark my face, but my spirit bears the wrinkles. Indeed, Bouville, I would willingly keep you with me were it possible. Alas, madame, I foresee the end of my mission, and it has not had much success. King Edward has already twice indicated his surprise. 
since he has already delivered the Lombard up to the high court of the King of France, that I should still be here. For the official pretext for Bouville's embassy was a demand for the extradition of a certain Thomas Henry, a member of the important Scali Company of Florence. The banker had leased certain lands from the crown of France, had pocketed the considerable revenues, failed to pay what he owed to the French treasury, and had ultimately taken refuge in England. The affair was serious enough, of course, but it could easily have been dealt with by letter, or by sending a magistrate, and most certainly had not required the presence of an ex-great Chamberlain who sat in the Privy Council. In fact, Bouville had been charged with another and more difficult diplomatic negotiation. Monseigneur Charles of Valois, the uncle both of the King of France and Queen Isabella, had taken it into his head the previous year to marry off his fifth daughter, Marie, to Prince Edward, the heir apparent to the throne of England. Monseigneur Valois, who was unaware of it in Europe, had seven daughters, whose marriages had been a continual source of anxiety to this turbulent, ambitious, and prodigal prince, who inevitably used his children for the promotion of his vast intrigues. The seven daughters were by three different marriages, for Monseigneur Charles, during the course of his restless life, had suffered the misfortune of twice becoming a widower. You needed a clear mind not to lose your way amid this complicated family tree, to know, for instance, when Madame Jeanne of Valois was mentioned, whether the Countess of Hainaut was meant, or the Countess of Beaumont, the wife of Robert of Artois. Just to help matters, the two girls had the same name. As for Catherine, heiress to the phantom throne of Constantinople, who was, by the second marriage, she had wedded in the person of Philip of Tarentum, Prince of Achaea, an elder brother of her father's first wife. It was, indeed, something of a puzzle. And now Monseigneur Charles was proposing that the elder daughter of his third marriage should wed his great-nephew of England. At the beginning of the year, Monseigneur Valois had sent a mission, consisting of Count Henri de Sully, Raoul Sevin de Jouy, and Robert Bertrand, known as the Knight of the Green Lion. To curry favour with Edward II, these ambassadors had accompanied him on an expedition against the Scots, but at the Battle of Blackmore the English had fled, and allowed the French ambassadors to fall into the hands of the enemy. Their freedom had had to be negotiated, and their ransoms paid. When, at last, after a number of unpleasant adventures, they had been released, Edward had replied, evasively and dilatorily, that his son's marriage could not be decided on so quickly, that the matter was of such great importance that he could make no contract without the advice of his Parliament, and that Parliament would be summoned to discuss the matter in June. He wished to link this affair with the homage he was due to pay the King of France for the Duchy of Aquitaine. And then, when Parliament had at last been convoked, the question had not even been discussed. In his impatience, Monseigneur Valois had taken the first opportunity of sending over the Count de Bouville, whose devotion to the Capet family was undoubted, and who, though lacking in genius, had considerable experience of similar missions. In the past, Bouville had negotiated in Naples, on the instructions of Valois himself, the second marriage of Louis X with Clemence of Hungary. He had been curator of the Queen's stomach after the Outin's death, but that was not a period he cared to recall. He had also carried out a number of negotiations in Avignon with the Holy See, and in matters concerning family relationships his memory was faultless. He knew all the infinitely complex interweavings that formed the web of the royal house's alliances. Honest Bouville was much vexed at having to go back this time with empty hands. Monseigneur of Valois will be very angry indeed, he said, 
since he has already asked the Holy Father for a license for this marriage. I've done all I can, Bouville, the Queen said, and you can judge from that what weight I carry here. But I do not regret it as much as you do. I do not want another princess of my family to suffer what I have suffered here. Madame, Bouville replied, lowering his voice still further. Do you doubt your son? He seems to take after you rather than after his father, thank God. I remember you at his age, in the garden of the Palace of the Cité, or at Fontainebleau. He was interrupted. The door opened to give entrance to the King of England. He hurried in. His head was thrown back, and he was stroking his blond beard with a nervous gesture, which, in him, was a sign of irritation. He was followed by his usual counsellors, the two dispensers, father and son, Chancellor Baldock, the Earl of Arundel, and the Bishop of Exeter. The king's two half-brothers, the Earls of Kent and Norfolk, who had French blood, since their mother was the sister of Philip the Fair, formed part of his entourage, but rather against their will, so it seemed. And this was also true of Henry of Leicester. The last was a square-looking man, with bright, rather protruding eyes, who was nicknamed Crouchback, owing to a malformation of the neck and shoulders which compelled him to hold his neck completely askew, and gave the armourers who had to forge his cuirasses a good deal of difficulty. A number of ecclesiastics and local dignitaries also pressed into the doorway. "'Have you heard the news, madame?' cried King Edward, addressing the Queen. "'It will doubtless please you. Your Mortimer has escaped from the tower.' Lady Dispenser, at the chessboard, gave a start and uttered an exclamation of indignation, as if the Baron of Wigmore's escape were a personal insult. Queen Isabella gave no sign, either by altering her attitude or expression. Only her eyelids blinked a little more rapidly over her beautiful blue eyes, and her hand, beneath the folds of her dress, furtively sought that of Lady Jeanne Mortimer, as if encouraging her to be strong and calm. Fat Bouville had got to his feet and moved a little apart, feeling himself unwanted in this matter which purely concerned the English crown. "'He is not my Mortimer, sire,' replied the Queen. "'Lord Mortimer is your subject, I should have thought, rather than mine, and I am not accountable for the actions of your barons. You kept him in prison. He has escaped. It's the common form.' "'And that shows you approve him. "'Don't restrain your joy, madame. "'In the days when Mortimer deigned to appear at my court, "'you had no eyes except for him. "'You were continually extolling his merits, "'and you have always put down the crimes he has committed against me "'to his greatness of soul. "'But was it not you yourself, sire, my husband, "'who taught me to love him at the time he was conquering on your behalf, "'and at the peril of his life, the Kingdom of Ireland?' which indeed you had great difficulty in holding without him. Was that a crime? Put out of countenance by this attack, Edward looked spitefully at his wife, and found some difficulty in replying. Well, your friend's on the run now, running hard towards your country, no doubt. As he talked, the king was walking up and down the room, working off his useless agitation. The jewels hanging from his clothes quivered at every step he took. The rest of the company followed him with their eyes, turning their heads from side to side as if they were watching a game of tennis. There was no doubt that King Edward was a fine-looking man, muscular, lithe, and alert. He kept himself fit with games and exercises, and had so far resisted any tendency to stoutness though his fortieth birthday was close at hand. He had an athlete's constitution. But if you looked closer, you were struck by the fact that his forehead was utterly unlined, as if the anxieties of power had failed to mark him, 
by the pouches beginning to form beneath his eyes, by the uncertain line of the curve of the nostril, and by the long chin beneath the thin curled beard. It was not an energetic or authoritative chin, nor even a really sensual one, but merely too big and too elongated a chin. There was twenty times more determination in the Queen's little chin than there was in this ovoid jaw, whose weakness the silky beard could not conceal. And the hand he passed from time to time across his face was flaccid. It fluttered aimlessly, and then tugged at a pearl sewn to the embroidery of his tunic. His voice, which he hoped and believed was imperious, merely suggested lack of control. His back, which was wide enough, curved unpleasantly from the neck to the waist, as if the spine lacked substance. Edward had never forgiven his wife for having one day advised him to avoid showing his back if he wished to gain the respect of his barons. His knee was shapely and his leg well turned. Indeed, these were the best points of this man, who was so little suited to his responsibilities and to whom a crown had fallen by some curious inadvertence on the part of fate. "'Haven't I enough worries and difficulties already?' he went on. "'The Scots are always threatening and invading my frontiers, and when I give battle my armies run away. And how can I defeat them when my bishops treat them without my permission, when there are so many traitors among my vassals?' and when my barons of the marches raise troops against me on the principle that they hold their lands by their swords, when some twenty-five years ago, have they forgotten? It was determined and ordered otherwise by King Edward my father. But they learned at Shrewsbury and Boroughbridge what it costs to rebel against me, didn't they, Leicester? Henry of Leicester shook his great crippled head. It was hardly a courteous way of reminding him of the death of his brother, Thomas of Lancaster, who had been beheaded sixteen months before, when twenty great lords had been hanged, and as many more imprisoned. Indeed, sire, my husband, we've all noticed that the only battles you can win are against your own barons, Isabella said. Once again Edward looked at her with hatred in his eyes. What courage, Bouville thought. What courage this noble queen has. Nor is it altogether fair, she went on, to say that they rebelled against you because they hold their rights by their swords. Was it not rather over the rights of the county of Gloucester which you wanted to give to Sir Hugh? The two dispensers drew closer together as if to make common front. Lady Dispenser, the younger, sat up stiffly at the chessboard. She was the daughter of the late Earl of Gloucester. Edward II stamped his foot on the flagstones. Really, the Queen was impossible. She never opened her mouth except to tease him with his errors and mistakes of government. I give the great fiefs to whom I will, madame. I give them to those who love and serve me, Edward cried, putting his hand on the younger Hugh's shoulder. On whom else can I rely? Where are my allies? What help, madame, does your brother of France, who should behave to me as if he were mine, since after all it was in that hope I was persuaded to take you for wife, bring me? He demands that I go and pay him homage for Aquitaine, and that is all the help I get from him. And where does he send me his summons? To Guienne? Not at all. He has it brought to me here in my kingdom, as if he were contemptuous of feudal custom, or wished to offend me. One might almost think he believed himself also suzerain of England. Besides, I have paid this homage. Indeed, I've paid it too often. Once to your father, when I was nearly burnt alive in the fire at Nobisson, and then again to your brother Philippe three years ago, when I went to Amiens. Considering the frequency with which the kings of your family die, madame, I shall soon have to go to live on the continent. The lords, bishops, and Yorkshire notables, who were standing at the back of the room, looked at each other, by no means afraid, but shocked rather at this impotent anger which strayed so far from its object, and revealed to them not only the difficulties of the kingdom, 
but also the character of the king. Was this the sovereign who asked them for subsidies for his treasury, to whom they owed obedience in everything, and for whom they were to risk their lives when he summoned them to take part in his wars? Lord Mortimer must have had good reasons for rebellion. Even the intimate counsellors seemed ill at ease, though they well knew the king's habit of recapitulating, even in his correspondence, all the troubles of his reign whenever a new difficulty arose. Chancellor Baldock was mechanically rubbing his Adam's apple above his archidiaconal robe. The Bishop of Exeter, the Lord Treasurer, was nervously biting his thumbnail and watching his neighbours out of the corner of his eye. Only Hugh Dispenser the Younger, too curled, scented, and overdressed for a man of thirty-three, showed satisfaction. The king's hand, resting on his shoulder, made it clear to everyone how important and powerful he was. He had a short, snub nose and a well-shaped mouth, and was now raising and lowering his chin like a horse pawing the ground, as he approved every word Edward said with a little throaty murmur. His expression seemed to imply, This time things have really gone too far. We shall have to take stern measures. He was thin, tall, rather narrow-chested, and had a bad, spotty skin. Monsieur de Bouville, King Edward said suddenly, turning to the ambassador, you will reply to Monseigneur of Valois that the marriage he proposes, and of which we appreciate the honour, will most certainly not take place. We have other views for our eldest son, and we shall thus put a term to the deplorable custom by which the kings of England take their wives from France without ever deriving any benefit from it. Fat Bouville paled at the affront and bowed. He looked sadly at the Queen and went out. The first and most unexpected consequence of Roger Mortimer's escape was that the King of England was breaking his traditional alliance. By this outburst he had wanted to wound his wife, but he had also succeeded in wounding his half-brothers of Norfolk and Kent, whose mother was French. The two young men turned to their cousin Crouchback, who shrugged his heavy shoulder in resigned indifference. Without reflection, the king had casually alienated forever the powerful Count of Valois, who, as everyone knew, governed France in the name of his nephew, Charles the Fair. Caprices such as this have sometimes lost kings both their thrones and their lives. Young Prince Edward, still motionless by the window, was silently watching his mother and judging his father. After all, it was his marriage that was being discussed, and he was allowed to have no say in it. But if he had been asked to choose between his English and French blood, he would have shown a preference for the latter. The three younger children had stopped playing. The Queen signed to the maidservants to take them away. And then, with the greatest calm, looking the king straight in the eye, she said, When a husband hates his wife, it is natural he should hold her responsible for everything. Edward was not the man to make a direct answer to that. My whole tower guard dead drunk, he cried, the lieutenant in flight with that felon, and my constable sick to death with the drug they gave him. "'unless the traitor's malingering to avoid the punishment he deserves. "'It was up to him to see my prisoner didn't escape. "'Do you hear, Winchester?' "'Hugh Dispenser the Elder, who had been responsible for the appointment of Constable Seagrave, "'bowed to the storm. "'He was thin and narrow-shouldered, with a stoop that was in part natural "'and in part acquired during a long career as a courtier.' His enemies had nicknamed him the Weasel. Cupidity, envy, meanness, self-seeking, deceit, and all the gratifications these vices can procure for their possessor were manifest in the lines of his face and beneath his red eyelids. 
and yet he was not lacking in courage. But he had human feelings only for his son and a few rare friends, of which Seagrave indeed was one. You could better understand the son's character when you had observed the father for a moment. My lord, he said in a calm voice, I feel sure that Seagrave is in no way to blame. He's to blame for negligence and laziness. He's to blame for allowing himself to be made a fool of. He's to blame for not suspecting that a plot was being hatched under his nose. He's to blame, perhaps, for his bad luck. And I never forgive bad luck. Though Seagrave is one of your protégés, Winchester, he shall be punished. And people will no longer be able to say that I'm unfair, and that my favours are lavished only on your creatures. Seagrave will take Mortimer's place in prison, and perhaps his successor will take care to keep a better watch. That, my son, is how you rule, the king added, coming to a halt in front of the heir to the throne. The boy raised his eyes to him, and immediately lowered them again. Hugh the Younger, who knew how to turn Edward's anger aside, threw back his head, and, gazing up at the beams of the ceiling, said, It's the other criminal, dear sire, who's defying you most contemptuously. Bishop Orleton organized the whole thing himself, and seems to fear you so little that he has not even taken the trouble to fly or go into hiding. Edward looked at Hugh the Younger with gratitude and admiration. How could one not be moved by that profile, by the fine attitudes he struck when speaking, by that high, well-modulated voice, and that way at once so tender and respectful of saying, Dear Sire, in the French manner, as sweet Gaveston, whom the barons and bishops had killed, used to do. But Edward had learned from experience. He knew how wicked men were, and that you never won by coming to terms. He was determined never to be separated from Hugh, and all who opposed him would be pitilessly struck down, one after the other. I announce to you, my lords, that Bishop Orleton will be brought before my Parliament to be tried and sentenced. Edward crossed his arms and looked round to see the effect of his words. The Archdeacon Chancellor and the Bishop Treasurer, though they were Orleton's worst enemies, looked disapproving, for they could not help standing by members of the cloth. Henry Crouchback, who was by nature a wise and moderate man, couldn't help making an effort to bring the king back to the path of treason. He observed calmly that a bishop could be brought only before an ecclesiastical court consisting of his peers. Everything has to have a beginning, Lester. Conspiracy against kings is not, so far as I know, taught by the Holy Gospels. Since Orleton has forgotten what should be rendered to Caesar, Caesar will remind him of it. Another favour I owe your family, madame, the king went on, addressing Isabella since it was your brother Philippe V who, against my will, had Adam Orleton provided to the See of Hereford by his French Pope. Very well, he shall be the first prelate to be sentenced by the royal judiciary, and his punishment shall be exemplary. Orleton was not originally hostile to you, cousin, argued Crouchback, nor would he have had any reason to become so, if you had not opposed, or if your council had not opposed, the Holy Father's giving him the mitre. He is a man of great learning and strength of character, and you might even now, perhaps, precisely because he is guilty, rally him to your support more easily by an act of clemency than by a trial at law, which, among all your other difficulties, will draw upon you the anger of the clergy. Clemency! Forbearance! Every time I'm scorned, provoked, or betrayed, that's all you have to say, Lester. I was implored to spare the Baron of Wigmore, and how wrong I was to listen to that advice. You must admit that had I dealt with him as I did with your brother, 
The rebel will not be fleeing down the roads today. Crouchback shrugged his heavy shoulder and closed his eyes with an expression of weariness. How very irritating was Edward's habit, which he considered royal, of calling the members of his family and his principal councillors by the names of their counties, addressing his cousin Germain by shouting Leicester, instead of simply saying, My cousin, as did everyone else, including the Queen herself and his bad taste in mentioning the execution of Thomas on every possible occasion, as if he gloried in it. Oh, what a strange man he was, and what a bad king! To imagine you could behead your nearest relations, and that no one resented it, to believe that mourning could be effaced by an embrace, to demand devotion from those you had wronged, and expect loyalty from everyone, while you yourself were so cruelly inconstant. No doubt you're right, my lord, said Crouchback, and since you've now reigned for sixteen years, you must know the consequences of your actions. Call your bishop before Parliament. I won't stand in your way. And, muttering between his teeth, so that no one should hear but the young Earl of Norfolk, he added, my head may be set askew on my shoulders, but I'd rather keep it where it is. You must admit, Edward went on, his hand fluttering, that it's simply snapping his fingers at me to escape by piercing the walls of a tower I built myself especially so that no one should escape from it. Perhaps, sire, my husband, the Queen said, when it was building you were more preoccupied with the charms of the masons than with the solidity of the stonework. A sudden silence fell over the company. The insult was flagrant and most unexpected. They all held their breath and stared, some with deference, some with hatred, at the rather fragile-looking woman who sat so upright and lonely in her chair and held her own like this. Her lips drawn back a little and her mouth half open, she was showing her fine little teeth. They were clenched, sharp, carnivorous. Isabella was clearly delighted with the blow she had dealt, whatever the consequences might be. Hugh the younger was blushing scarlet. Hugh the elder made a pretense of not having heard. Edward would certainly have his revenge, but what means would he adopt? The retort lagged. The Queen watched the drops of sweat pearling her husband's brow, and nothing disgusts a woman more than the sweat of the man she has ceased to love. Kent! cried the King. I made you warden of the Sank Ports and Governor of Dover. What are you doing here? Why aren't you on the coast you're supposed to be guarding, and from which our felon must inevitably take ship? Sire, my brother, said the young Earl of Kent, somewhat taken aback. It was you yourself who ordered me to accompany you on your journey. Well, now I'm giving you another. Go back to your county, have the towns and countryside searched for the fugitive, and see to it personally that every ship in port is visited. Send agents on board the ships and apprehend Mortimer, dead or alive, if he embarks, said Hugh the Younger. Sound advice, Gloucester, Edward approved. As for you, Stapledon... The Bishop of Exeter stopped gnawing at his thumbnail and murmured, My lord, you will make haste to London and go immediately to the tower on the pretext of checking the treasure which is in your charge. Then, furnished with an order under my seal, you will take command of the tower and supervise it till a new constable is appointed. Baldock will make out the commissions at once so that you'll have the necessary powers. Henry Crouchback his eyes turned toward the window, and his ear, propped on his shoulder, seemed to be dreaming. He was calculating that six days had elapsed since Mortimer's escape, that it would take at least eight days more before these orders could be executed, and that unless he was a fool, which Mortimer most certainly was not, he must already have left the kingdom. He congratulated himself on having joined with the greater part of the bishops and lords who, 
after Boroughbridge, had succeeded in obtaining a reprieve for the Baron of Wigmore. For now that Mortimer had escaped, the opposition to the dispensers might well find the leader it had lacked since the death of Thomas of Lancaster, and a stronger, cleverer, and more effective leader than Thomas had been. The king's back bent sinuously. Edward pirouetted on his heels and came face to face with his wife. "'What's more, madame, I hold you entirely responsible. And in the first place, let go that hand you've been holding ever since I came into the room.' "'Let go, Lady Jeanne's hand!' cried Edward, stamping his foot. "'It's going surety for a traitor to keep his wife so ostentatiously at your side. The people who helped Mortimer to escape well knew they had the Queen's support.' Besides, you can't escape without money. Treason has to be paid for. Walls aren't pierced without gold. But the conduit's evident. The queen to her lady-in-waiting. The lady-in-waiting to the bishop, the bishop to the rebel. I shall have to look more closely into your privy purse. Sire, my husband, I think my privy purse is already sufficiently controlled, said Isabella, indicating Lady Dispenser. Hugh the Younger seemed suddenly to have lost interest in the discussion. The king's anger was turning at last, as indeed it usually did, against the queen. Edward had found an object for his vengeance, and Hugh felt all the more triumphant. He picked up a book that was lying nearby, and which Lady Mortimer had been reading to the queen before the Count de Bouville had come in. It was a collection of the Lays of Marie of France. The silk marker signalled this passage. En Lorraine, ni en Bourgogne, ni en Anjou, ni en Gascogne, en ce temps ne pouvait trouver si bon ni ce grand chevalier. Sous ciel n'était dame ou poussel, qui tant fou noble et tant fou belle qui non voulu amour avoir. France. It's always France. She never reads anything that doesn't relate to that country, Hugh thought. And who's the knight they're dreaming of in their thoughts? Mortimer, no doubt. My lord, I do not superintend the charities, said Eleanor Dispenser. The favourite looked up and smiled. He would congratulate his wife on that remark. "'I foresee I shall have to give up my charities, too,' said Isabella. "'I shall soon have no queenly prerogative left, not even that of charity. "'And also, madame, for the love you bear me, of which every one is aware,' Edward went on, "'you must part with Lady Mortimer, for not a soul in the kingdom will understand her being near you now.' and now the queen turned pale and sank back a little in her chair. Lady Jeanne's long, pale hands were trembling. A wife, Edward, cannot be held responsible for all her husband's actions. I am an example of it myself. You must believe that Lady Mortimer has as little to do with her husband's errors as I have with your sins, supposing you commit any. But this time the attack was unsuccessful. Lady Jeanne will leave for Wigmore Castle, which from now on will be under the supervision of my brother of Kent, and will remain there until I've decided what to do with the property of a man whose name will never again be mentioned in my presence, except to sentence him to death. I believe, Lady Jeanne, that you would prefer to go to your house of your own free will, rather than be taken there by force. I see, said Isabella, that you wish me to be left utterly alone. "'What do you mean by alone, madame?' cried Hugh the Younger, in his fine, well-modulated voice. "'Are we not all your loyal friends, being the kings? "'And is not Madame Eleanor, my devoted wife, a faithful companion to you?' "'That's a pretty book you have there,' he added, pointing to the volume, "'and beautifully illuminated. "'Would you be kind enough to lend it to me?' "'Of course!' "'Of course the Queen will lend it to you,' the King said. 
I'm sure, madame, that you will do us the pleasure of lending the book to our friend Gloucester. Most willingly, sire, my husband, most willingly. And I know what lending means when it's to your friend, Lord Dispenser. I lent him my pearls ten years ago, and, as you can see, he's still wearing them about his neck. She wouldn't surrender, but her heart was beating wildly in her breast. From now on she would have to bear the daily insults all alone. If, one day, she found means of revenging herself, nothing would be forgotten. Hugh the Younger put the book down on a chest and made a privy sign to his wife. The lays of Marie of France would go to join the gold buckle with lions in precious stones, the three gold crowns, the four crowns inset with rubies and emeralds, the hundred and twenty silver spoons, the thirty great platters, the ten gold goblets, the hangings of embroidered cloth of gold, the six-horsed coach, the linen, the silver bowls, the harness, the chapel ornaments. All those splendid possessions, the gifts of her father and relations, which had been her wedding presents, and whose inventory had been drawn up by the good Bouville himself, before her departure for England. And now they had all passed into the hands of Edward's favourites, first to Gaveston, and now to Dispenser. Even the great cloak of embroidered Turkish cloth she had worn on her wedding day had been taken from her. "'Well, my lords,' said the king, clapping his hands, Hasten to the tasks I have allotted you, and may each of you do his duty. It was his usual phrase, another of those formulae he believed to be royal, and with which he closed the meetings of his council. He went out, and the others followed him. The room emptied. Evening was beginning to fall over the cloister of Kirkham Priory, and, with its coming, a little freshness entered by the windows. Queen Isabella and Lady Mortimer dared not say a word to each other for fear of weeping. This was the last time they would be together before being separated. Would they ever meet again, and what had fate in store for them? Young Prince Edward, his eyes as usual on the ground, came and stood silently behind his mother, as if he wished to take the place of the friend who was being taken from her. Lady Dispenser came over to take the book that had attracted her husband's eye. It was a beautiful book, and its velvet binding was inlaid with precious stones. She had long coveted the volume, particularly since she knew how much it had cost. As she was about to pick it up, young Prince Edward put his hand on it. "'Oh, no, you wicked woman,' he said. "'You shan't have everything.' The Queen pushed the Prince's hand aside, picked up the book, and handed it to her enemy. Then she turned to her son with a smile of understanding that showed, once again, her little carnivore's teeth. A boy of eleven could not be much help to her as yet, but his attitude was important all the same, since he was the heir to the throne. Chapter 3 Messer Ptolemy has a new customer. Old Spinello Ptolemy was in his study on the first floor. He moved the arras aside with his foot and pushed open a little wooden shutter to reveal a secret opening which enabled him to keep an eye on his clerks in the great room on the ground floor. By this Judas of Florentine invention, concealed among the beams, Messer Ptolemy could see everything that went on below, and hear everything that was said. At the moment his bank and trading house appeared to be in considerable confusion. The flames of the three-branched candelabra were flickering on the counters, and his employees had ceased moving the brass balls on the abbasi by which they kept the accounts. An L-cloth measure fell with a clatter to the flagstones. The scales dipped on the money-changers' tables, though no one was touching them. The customers had all turned towards the door, and the senior clerks were standing with their hands to their chests, making ready to bow. 
Messer Ptolemy smiled. From the general disturbance, he guessed that the Count of Artois had entered his establishment. An instant later, he saw through the spy hole a huge chaperone with a red velvet crest, red gloves, red boots with ringing spurs, and a scarlet cloak that hung from the shoulders of a giant. Only Monseigneur Robert of Artois had this peculiarly shattering way of making an entrance. He set the staff trembling with terror. He tweaked the women's breasts in passing, while their husbands dared make no move. And it seemed as if he could even set the walls quaking merely by drawing breath. However, the old banker was not particularly impressed. He had known the Count of Artois much too long, and had watched him too often. And now, as he looked down on him from above, he was aware of how exaggerated, forced, and ostentatious this great lord's manner was. Monseigneur of Artois behaved like an ogre because nature had endowed him with exceptional physical proportions. In fact, he was a cunning and crafty man, and Ptolemy held Robert's accounts. The banker was more interested in the personage accompanying Artois. This was a lord dressed entirely in black. There was an air of assurance about him, though his manner seemed distant, reserved, and somewhat haughty. At first sight, Ptolemy judged him to be a man of considerable force of character. The two visitors stopped at the counter, displaying arms and harness. Monseigneur of Artois's huge red glove moved among the daggers, stilettos, and the patterns of sword hilts, turned over the saddlecloths, the stirrups, the curved bits, the scalloped, pinked, and embroidered reins. The shopman would have a good hour's work to put his counter in order again. Robert selected a pair of Toledo spurs with long rowels. The shanks were high and curved outwards to protect the Achilles tendon when the foot exerted a violent pressure against the horse's flank. A sound invention, and certainly of great use in tournaments. The side pieces were decorated with flowers and ribbons, with the device Conquer graven in round letters in the gilded steel. I make you a present of them, my lord, said the giant to the gentleman in black. The only thing that's missing is a lady to buckle them to your feet. But she won't be missing for long. The ladies of France are soon aroused by people from abroad. You can get anything you want here, he went on with a wave at the shop. My friend Ptolemy, a master usurer and a fox in business, will supply you with everything you need. I've never yet known him fail to produce anything one asks of him. Do you want to present your chaplain with a chasuble? He has thirty to choose from. A ring for your mistress. He has chests full of stones. Scenting the girls before pleasuring them, he'll provide you with a musk straight from the markets of the Orient. Are you in search of a relic? He has three cupboards full. And what's more, he sells gold to buy it all. He has currency minted in every corner of Europe, and you can see the exchanges marked up on those slates there. He sells figures, that's what he really sells. Farming profits, interest on loans, revenues from fiefs. There are clerks adding and checking behind all those little doors. What would we do without this man who grows rich on our inability to count? Let's go up to his room. The steps of the wooden corkscrew staircase were soon creaking under the weight of the Count of Artois. Messer Ptolemy closed the spy hole and let the arras fall back into place. The room the two lords entered was somberly, heavily, and sumptuously furnished. There were massive pieces of silver plate, while figured tapestries muffled every sound. It smelt of candles, incense, spices, and medicinal herbs. All the scents of a lifetime seemed to have accumulated among the rich furnishings. The banker came forward. Robert of Artois, who had not seen him for many weeks, indeed for almost three months, 
during which he had had to accompany his cousin, the King of France, first into Normandy at the end of August, and then into Anjou for the whole autumn, thought the Sienese was looking older. His white hair was thinner and fell more sparsely over the collar of his robe. Time had set its crow's feet on his face, and indeed his cheekbones looked as if they had been marked by a bird's feet. His jowls had fallen and swung beneath his chin. His chest seemed narrower and his stomach more protuberant. His nails, which were cut short, were splitting. Only his left eye, Messer Ptolemy's famous left eye, which was always three-quarters shut, still lent his face an expression of cunning and vivacity. But the other eye, the open eye, seemed a little absent, a little weary and inattentive, as if he were worn out and less concerned now with the exterior world than with the disorders of his old and exhausted body, which was nearing its end. "'Friend Ptolemy!' cried Robert of Artois, taking off his gloves and throwing them, a pool of blood, onto a table. "'Friend Ptolemy, I'm bringing you another fortune!' The banker waved his visitors into chairs. "'How much is it going to cost me, Monseigneur?' he replied. "'Come on! Come on, banker!' said Robert of Artois. "'Have I ever made you make a bad investment?' Uh, "'Never, Monseigneur. Never, I admit it. "'Payment has sometimes been a little overdue. "'But in the end, since God has vouchsafed me a fairly long life, "'I have been able to gather in the fruits of the confidence with which you have honoured me. "'But just think, Monseigneur, what would have happened had I died, "'as so many people do at fifty? "'Thanks to you, I should have died ruined.' This sally amused Robert of Artois, whose smile, spreading widely across his face, revealed strong but very dirty teeth. "'Have you ever incurred a loss through me?' he said. "'Do you remember how I once made you wager on Monseigneur of Valois against Enguerrand de Marigny? And look where Charles of Valois is today, and how Marigny ended his wicked life.' And haven't I paid you back every penny you advanced me for my war in Artois? I'm grateful to you, banker, yes. I'm grateful to you for having always supported me, even when I was in my greatest difficulties. For I was overwhelmed with debts at one time, he went on, turning to the gentleman in black. I had no lands but the county of beaumont le roger and the treasury refused to pay me its revenues. My amiable cousin, Philippe the Long, may God keep his soul in some hell or other, had imprisoned me in the Châtelet. Well, this banker here, my lord, this usurer, this greatest rogue of all the rogues Lombardy has ever produced, this man, who would take a child in its mother's womb in pawn, never abandoned me. And that's why as long as he lives, and he'll live a long time yet, Messer Ptolemy put out the first and little fingers of his right hand, and touched the wood of the table. "'Oh, yes, you will, Master Usurer. You'll live a long time yet. I'm telling you. Well, that's why this man will always be a friend of mine, and that's on the faith of Robert of Artois. And he made no mistake, for today I'm the son-in-law of Monseigneur of Valois, I sit in the King's Council, and I'm in full possession of the revenues of my county. Messer Ptolemy, the great lord I've brought to see you, is Lord Mortimer, Baron of Wigmore, who escaped from the Tower of London on August the 1st, said the banker, making an inclination of the head. A great honour, my lord, a great honour. What do you mean? Artois cried. Do you know about it? Monseigneur, said Ptolemy, the Baron of Wigmore is too important a personage for us not to have been informed. I even know, my lord, that when King Edward issued the order to his coastal sheriffs to find you and arrest you, 
you were already embarked and out of reach of English justice. I know that when he had all the ships sailing for Ireland searched, and seized every courier landing from France, your friends not only in London, but in all England, already knew of your safe arrival at the house of your cousin Germain, Monsieur Jean de Fienne, in Picardy. And I know, too, that when King Edward ordered Monsieur de Fienne to deliver you up, threatening to confiscate all his lands beyond the Channel, that lord, who is a great supporter and partisan of Monseigneur Robert, immediately sent you on to him. I cannot say that I was expecting you, my lord, but I was hoping you would come, for Monseigneur of Artois is, as he has told you, faithful to me and always thinks of me when a friend of his is in difficulties. Roger Mortimer had listened to the banker with great attention. I see, monsieur, he replied, that the Lombards have good spies at the court of England. <laughs> they are at your service, my lord. You must know that King Edward is very heavily in debt to our companies. When you have money outstanding, you watch it. And for a long time past, your king has ceased to honor his seal, at least as far as we are concerned. He wrote to us through Monseigneur, the Bishop of Exeter, his treasurer, that the poor receipts from taxes, the heavy expenses of his wars, and the intrigues of his barons did not allow of his doing better by us. And yet the duty he places on our merchandise, in the port of London alone, should suffice to discharge his debt. A servant brought hippocrats and sugared almonds, which were always offered to visitors of importance. Ptolemy poured the aromatic wine into goblets, helping himself to no more than one finger of the liquor to which he barely put his lips. At the moment, the French treasury seems to be in a better state than that of England he added. Is it known yet, Monseigneur Robert, what the figures for the year are likely to be? Provided there's no sudden calamity during the month to run, plague, famine, or indeed the marriage or funeral of one of our royal relations, there'll be a surplus of twelve thousand livres. According to the figures, Messieurs Mille de Noyer, master of the exchequer, placed before us at the council this morning. Twelve thousand livres to the good. The treasury was certainly never in so healthy a state during the reigns of Philip the Fourth and Fifth. May God put a term to the list of them. How do you manage to have surplus at the treasury, Monseigneur? Mortimer asked. Is it due to the absence of war? On the one hand, to the absence of war, and, on the other, to the fact that war is continually being prepared, but is never in fact being waged. Not to put too fine a point on it, the crusade. I must say, Charles of Valois uses the crusade to fabulous advantage. But don't go thinking I look on him as a bad Christian. He's extremely concerned to deliver Armenia from the Turks. Indeed, just as much as he is to re-establish the empire of Constantinople, whose crown he once wore, though he was never able actually to occupy the throne. But a crusade cannot be organized in a day. You have to arm ships and forge weapons. Above all, you have to find the crusaders, to negotiate with Spain and Germany. And the first step must be always to obtain a tithe on the clergy from the Pope. My dear father-in-law has obtained that tithe, and, at the moment, the treasury is being subsidized by the Pope. That interests me very much, Monseigneur, said Ptolemy. You see, I'm the Pope's banker, to the extent, at least, of a quarter share with the body. But even a quarter share is a very large sum. And if the Pope should become impoverished, Artois, who was taking a big gulp of Hippocras, exploded into the silver goblet and made signs that he was choking. Impoverished? The Holy Father? 
he cried, as soon as he had swallowed the wine. He's worth hundreds of thousands of florins. There's a man who could teach you your business, Spinello. What a banker he'd have made, had he not entered the priesthood. For he found the papal treasury emptier than was my pocket six years ago. I know, I know, Ptolemy murmured. The fact is, you see, the priests are the best tax collectors God ever put on earth, and Monseigneur of Valois has grasped that fact. Instead of being ruthless about the taxes, whose collectors are hated anyway, he makes the priests collect the tithe. Eh, we shall set out on a crusade one of these days, but meantime the Pope pays by shearing his sheep. Ptolemy was gently rubbing his right leg. For some time past he had felt a sensation of cold in it, and some pain in walking. You were saying, Monseigneur, that a council was held this morning. Was anything of particular interest decided on? he asked. Uh, just the usual stuff. We discussed the price of candles, and forbade the mixing of tallow with wax, and the mingling of old jam with new. For all merchandise sold in wrappers, the weight of the wrappers is to be deducted and not included in the price. But this is all to please the common people, and show them we have their interests at heart. Ptolemy listened and watched his two visitors. They both seemed to him very young. How old was Robert of Artois? Thirty-five? Thirty-six? And the Englishman seemed much the same age. Everyone under sixty seemed to him astonishingly young. How much they still had to do, how many emotions still to suffer, battles to fight, and ambitions to realize. How many mornings they would see that he would never know. How often these two men would awaken and breathe the air of a new day, when he himself was under the ground. And what kind of man was Lord Mortimer? The clear-cut face, the thick eyebrows, the straight line of the eyelids across the flint-coloured eyes, the sombre clothes, the way he crossed his arms, the silent, haughty assurance of a man who had sat on the pinnacle of power and intended to preserve all his dignity in exile, even the automatic gesture with which Mortimer ran his finger across the short white scar on his lip, all pleased the old Sienese and Ptolemy felt he would like this lord to recover his happiness. For some time past, Ptolemy had acquired almost a taste for thinking of others. Are the regulations concerning the export of currency to be promulgated in the near future, Monseigneur? he asked. Robert of Artois hesitated before replying. Oh, of course, I don't suppose you've been told yet, Ptolemy added. Of course, naturally I've been told. You very well know that nothing is done without my advice being asked by the king, and by Monseigneur Valois above all. The order will be sealed in two days' time. No one will be permitted to export gold or silver currency stamped with the dye of France from the kingdom. Only pilgrims will be allowed to provide themselves with a few small coins. The banker pretended to attach no greater importance to this piece of news than he had to the price of candles, or the adulteration of jam. But he was already thinking, That means foreign currency will alone be permitted to be taken out of the kingdom. As a result, it will increase in value. What a help these blabbers are to us in our profession! How the boasters give us for so little the information they could sell so dear. So, my lord, he went on, turning to Mortimer, you intend to establish yourself in France. What can I provide? It was Robert who replied, What a great lord needs to maintain his rank. You're accustomed enough to that, Ptolemy. The banker rang a handbell. He told the servant to bring his great book, and added, 
If Monsieur Boccaccio is not left, ask him to wait until I'm free. The book was brought, a thick volume covered in black leather, smooth from much handling, and its vellum leaves held together by adjustable fastenings, so that more leaves could be added as desired. This device enabled Monsieur Ptolemy to keep the accounts of his important clients in alphabetical order, and not to have to search for scattered pages. The banker placed the volume on his knees, and opened it with some ceremony. "'You'll find yourself in good company, my lord,' he said. "'Look, honour where honour is due. My book begins with the Count of Artois.' <laughs> You've a great many pages, Monseigneur, he added with a little laugh, looking at Robert. Here's the Count de Bouville for his missions to the Pope and to Naples. And here's Madame the Queen Clemence. The banker inclined his head in deference. Eh, she gave us a lot of anxiety after the death of Louis X. It was as if mourning put her in a frenzy of spending. The Holy Father himself exhorted her to moderation in a special letter, and she had to pawn her jewels with me to pay off her debts. Now she is living in the Palace of the Templars, which she exchanged against the castle of Vincennes. She gets her dowry, and seems to have found peace. He went on turning over the pages which rustled under his hand. And now I'm boasting, he thought. But one must do something to emphasize the importance of the services one renders, and to show that one's not dazzled by a new borrower. He had a clever way of letting them see the names, while concealing the figures with his arm. He was only being half indiscreet. And, after all, he had to admit that his whole life was contained in this book, and that he enjoyed every opportunity of looking through it. Each name, each figure, evoked so many memories, so many intrigues, so many secrets of which he had been the recipient, and so many entreaties by which he had been able to measure his power. Each figure commemorated a visit, a letter, a clever deal, a feeling of sympathy, or one of harshness, towards a negligent debtor. It was nearly fifty years since Spinello Ptolemy, on his arrival from Siena, had begun by doing the rounds of the fairs of Champagne, and then come to live here, in the Rue des Lombards, to keep a bank. Another page, and another, which caught in his broken nails. A black line was drawn through a name. Here's Monsieur Dante Alighieri, the poet, but only for a small sum, when he came to Paris to visit Queen Clemence, after she had become a widow. He was a great friend of hers, as he had been of King Charles of Hungary, Madame Clemence's father. I remember him sitting in your chair, my lord. A man without a spark of kindness. He was the son of a money-changer, and he talked to me for a whole hour with great contempt of the financier's trade. But he could afford to be ill-natured, and go off and get drunk with women in houses of ill-fame, while talking of his pure love for the Lady Beatrice. <laughs> he made our language sing as no one before him has ever done. And how he described the inferno, my lord. Oh, you've not read it. Ah, you must have it translated. One trembles to think that it may perhaps be like that. Do you know that in Ravenna, where Monsieur Dante spent his last years, the people used to scatter from his path in fear, because they thought he really had gone down into hell? And even now, many people refuse to believe that he died two years ago, for they say he was a magician and couldn't die. He certainly didn't like banking, nor indeed Monseigneur of Valois, who exiled him from Florence. The whole time he was talking of Dante, Ptolemy was putting out his two fingers again and touching the wood of his chair. There, 
That's where you'll be, my lord, he went on, making a mark in his big book. Immediately after Monseigneur de Marigny. But be reassured, not the one who was hanged, and whom Monseigneur of Artois mentioned a little while ago. No, his brother, the Bishop of Beauvais. From today you have a credit with me of ten thousand livres. You can draw on it at your convenience, and look on my modest house as your own. Cloth, arms, jewels, you will find every kind of goods you may require at my counters, and can charge them against this credit. He was carrying on his trade by habit, lending people the wherewithal to buy what he sold. And what about your lawsuit against your aunt, Monseigneur? Are you thinking of taking it up again, now that you're so powerful? He asked Robert of Artois. I most certainly shall, but at the right time, the giant replied, getting to his feet. There's no hurry, and I've learnt that too much haste is a bad thing. I'm letting my dear aunt grow older. I'm leaving her to exhaust herself in small lawsuits against her vassals, make new enemies every day by her chicanery, and put her castles, which I treated a bit roughly on my last visit to her lands, which are really mine, into order again. She's beginning to realize what it costs her to hold on to my property. She had to lend Monseigneur Valois fifty thousand livres, which she'll never see again, for they went to make up my wife's dowry, and incidentally enabled me to pay you off. So, you see, she's not quite so noxious a woman as people say, the bitch. I merely take care not to see too much of her. She's so fond of me, she might spoil me with one of those sweet dishes from which so many people in her entourage have died. But I shall have my county, banker. I shall have it. You can be sure of that. And on that day, as I've promised you, you shall become my treasurer. Monsieur Ptolemy showed his visitors out, walking down the stairs behind them with some prudence, and accompanied them to the door that gave on to the Rue des Lombards. When Roger Mortimer asked him what interest he was charging on the money he was lending him, the banker waved the question aside. Merely do me the pleasure, he said of coming up to see me when you have business with the bank. I am sure there is much in which you can instruct me, my lord. A smile accompanied the words, and the left eyelid rose a little to reveal a brief glance that implied, We'll talk alone, not in front of blabbers. The cold November wind blowing in from the street made the old man shiver a little. Then, as soon as the door was closed, Ptolemy went behind his counters into a little waiting-room where he found Boccaccio, the travelling representative of the Bardi Company. "'Friend Boccaccio,' he said, "'today and tomorrow, by all the English, Dutch, and Spanish currency you can, all the Italian florins, doubloons, ducats, and foreign money you can find, offer a denier.' even two deniers above the present rate of exchange. Within three days they'll have increased in value by a quarter. Every traveller will have to come to us for foreign currency, since they'll be forbidden to export French gold. I'll go halves with you on the profits. Having a pretty good idea of how much foreign gold was available, and adding it to what he already had in his coffers, Ptolemy calculated that the operation would make him a profit of from fifteen to twenty thousand livres. He had just lent ten thousand, and would therefore make about double his loan. With the profits he could make further loans. Mere routine. When Boccaccio congratulated him on his ability, and, turning the compliment in his thin-lipped bourgeois Florentine way, said that it was not in vain that the Lombard companies in Paris had chosen Messer Spinello Ptolemy for their captain-general, the old man replied, 
Uh, after fifty years in the business, I no longer deserve any credit for it. It's simply second nature. If I were really clever, do you know what I would have done? I'd have bought up your reserves of florins and kept all the profit for myself. But when you come to think of it, what use would it be to me? You'll learn, Boccaccio. You're still very young. Boccaccio had sons who were already grey at the temples. You reach an age when you have a feeling of working to no purpose if you're merely working for yourself. I miss my nephew, and yet his difficulties are more or less resolved. I'm sure that he'd be running no risk if he came back now. But that young devil of a Guccio refuses to come. He's being stubborn from pride, I think. And in the evening, when the clerks have left and the servants gone to bed, this big house seems very empty. I sometimes regret Siena. Your nephew ought to have done what I did, Spinello, said Boccaccio, when I found myself in a similar difficulty with a woman of Paris. I removed my son and took him to Italy. Messer Ptolemy shook his head and thought how melancholy a house was without children. Guccio's son must be seven by now, and Ptolemy had never seen him. The mother refused to allow it. The banker rubbed his right leg, which felt heavy and cold. He had pins and needles in it. Over the years, death began to catch up with you, little by little, taking you by the feet. Presently, before going to bed, he would send for a basin of hot water and put his leg in it. Chapter 4 The False Crusade Monseigneur Mortimer, I shall have great need of brave and gallant knights such as you for my crusade, declared Charles of Valois. You will think me very vain to say my crusade, when in truth it is our Lord's. But I must confess, and everyone will recognize the fact, that if this vast enterprise, the greatest and most glorious to which the Christian nations can be summoned, takes place, it will be because I shall have organized it with my own hands. And so, Monseigneur Mortimer, I ask you straight out, and with that frankness you will learn to recognize as natural to me. Will you join me? Roger Mortimer sat up straight in his chair. He frowned a little and lowered his lids over his flint-colored eyes. Was he being merely offered the command of a banner of twenty knights, like some little country noble, or some soldier of fortune stranded here by the mischances of fate. The proposal was mere charity. It was the first time Mortimer had been received by the Count of Valois, who till now had always been busy with his duties in council, or receiving foreign ambassadors, or travelling about the kingdom. But now, at last, Mortimer was face to face with the man who ruled France, who had that very day appointed one of his protégés, Jean de Cherchemont, as the new Chancellor, and on whom his own fate depended. For Mortimer's situation, undoubtedly enviable for a man who had been condemned to prison for life, though painful for a great lord, was that of an exile who had nothing to offer and was reduced to begging and hoping. The interview was taking place in what had once been the King of Sicily's palace, which Charles of Valois had received from his first father-in-law, Charles the Lame of Naples, as a wedding present. There were some dozen people in the great audience chamber, equerries, courtiers, secretaries, all talking quietly in little groups, frequently turning their eyes towards their master, who was giving audience like a real sovereign, seated on a sort of throne surmounted by a canopy. Monseigneur Valois was dressed in a long indoor robe of blue velvet, embroidered with lilies and capital V's, which parted in front to show a fur lining. His hands were laden with rings. He wore his private seal, 
which was carved from a precious stone, hanging from his belt by a gold chain. And on his head was a velvet cap of maintenance, held in place by a chaste circlet of gold, a sort of undress crown. Among his entourage were his eldest son, Philippe of Valois, a strapping fellow with a long nose, who was leaning on the back of the throne, and his son-in-law, Robert of Artois, who was sitting on a stool, his huge red leather boots stretched out in front of him. A tree trunk was burning on the hearth nearby. Monseigneur, Mortimer said slowly, if the help of a man who's first among the barons of the Welsh marches, who has governed the kingdom of Ireland, and has commanded in a number of battles, can be of help to you, I willingly give you my aid in defence of Christianity, and my blood is at your service from this moment. Valois realised that here was a proud man, who spoke of his fiefs in the marches as if he still held them, and that he must treat him tactfully if he wished to make use of him. I have the honour, my lord, he replied, to see a raid under the banner of the King of France, or rather mine, since it has been arranged that my nephew shall continue to govern the kingdom while I command the crusade. To see a raid, I say, the leading sovereign princes of Europe, my cousin, Jean of Luxembourg, King of Bohemia, my brother-in-law, Robert of Naples and Sicily, my cousin, Alfonso of Spain, as well as the republics of Genoa and Venice, who, at the Holy Father's request, will give us the support of their galleys. You will be in no bad company, my lord, and I shall see to it that everyone gives you the respect and honour due to the great lord you are. France, from which your ancestors sprung, and which gave birth to your mother, will make sure that your deserts are better recognised than they appear to be in England. Mortimer bowed in silence. Whatever this assurance might be worth, he would see that it came to more than mere words. "'For it is fifty years and more,' went on Monseigneur of Valois, "'since anything of importance was done by Europe in the service of God. To be precise, since my grandfather San Louis, who, if he won his way to heaven by it, lost his life in the process.' Encouraged by our absence, the infidels have raised their heads, and believe themselves masters everywhere. They ravage the coasts, pillage ships, hinder trade, and, by their mere presence, profane the holy places. And what have we done? Year after year we've retreated from all our possessions and establishments. We've abandoned the castles we built, and have neglected to defend the sacred rights we had acquired. And this has all happened as a result of the suppression of the Templars, of which my elder brother, peace to his soul, though in this I never approved him, was the instrument. But those times are past. At the beginning of this year, delegates from Lesser Armenia came to ask our help against the Turks. I give grateful thanks to my nephew, King Charles IV, for his understanding of the importance of this appeal and for giving his support to the steps I then took. Indeed, he now believes the idea to have been originally his. Anyway, it is most satisfactory that he should now have faith in it. And so, as soon as our own forces have been assembled, we shall go to attack the Saracens in their distant lands. Robert of Artois, who was listening to this speech for the hundredth time, nodded his head as if much impressed, while secretly amused at the enthusiasm his father-in-law displayed in explaining the greatness of his cause. Robert was well aware of what lay behind all this. He knew that, though it was indeed the intention to attack the Turks, the Christians were to be jostled a little on the way, for the Emperor Andronicus Palaeologos, who reigned in Byzantium, was not, so far as one knew, the champion of Mahomet. No doubt his church was not altogether the true one, and it made the sign of the cross a bit askew. Nevertheless, it did make the sign of the cross. 
But Monseigneur Valois was still pursuing his idea of reconstructing, to his own advantage, the fabulous empire of Constantinople, which extended not only over the Byzantine territories, but over Cyprus, Rhodes, Armenia, and all the old kingdoms of the Courtenays and the Lusignan. And when Count Charles arrived there with all his banners, Andronicus Palaeologos, from what one heard, would not be able to put up much of a defence. Monseigneur of Valois's head was full of the dreams of a Caesar. It was remarkable, also, that he always indulged in a system which consisted of asking for the maximum so as to obtain a little. In this way he had tried to exchange his command of the crusade and his pretensions to the throne of Constantinople against the little kingdom of Arles by the Rhone, on condition that Viennois was added to it. He had negotiated with Jean of Luxembourg about this at the beginning of the year, but the transaction had come to nothing, owing to the opposition of the Count of Savoy, and that of the King of Naples, who, since he owned lands in Provence, had no wish to see his turbulent relative create an independent kingdom for himself on the borders of his states. So Monseigneur of Valois had resumed plans for the holy expedition with more enthusiasm than ever. It was clear that he would have to go in search of the sovereign crown, which had eluded his grasp in Spain, in Germany, and even in Arles, at the farther ends of the earth. But though Robert knew all these things, it would have been unwise to mention them. Of course, all the difficulties have not yet been overcome, went on Monseigneur of Valois. We're still in negotiation with the Holy Father over the number of knights and how much they shall be paid. We want eight thousand knights and thirty thousand footmen, and each baron to receive twenty sol a day, and each knight ten. Seven sol and six deniers for the squires, and two sol for the footmen. Pope John wants me to limit my army to four thousand knights and fifteen thousand footmen. He has, nevertheless, promised me twelve armed galleys. He has given us the tithe, but is looking askance at twelve hundred thousand livres a year, during the five years the crusade will last, which is the sum we're asking, and, above all, at the four hundred thousand livres the King of France requires for ancillary expenses, of which three hundred thousand are to be paid to the good Charles of Valois himself, thought Robert of Artois. At that price it's worth while commanding a crusade. But to cavil at it would be unbecoming, since I shall get my share of it. Ah, uh, if I'd only been at Lyon, the place of my late nephew Philippe, during the last conclave, cried Valois, I should have chosen a cardinal, though I wish to say nothing against the Holy Father, who understood more clearly the true interests of Christianity, and didn't require so much persuading. Particularly since we hanged his nephew at Montfaucon last May, observed Robert of Artois. Mortimer turned in his chair and looked at Robert of Artois in surprise. A nephew of the Pope. What nephew? Do you mean to say you don't know about it, cousin? said Robert of Artois, taking the opportunity to get to his feet, for he found it difficult to remain still for long. He went over to the hearth and kicked the logs. Mortimer had already ceased to be my lord to him, and had become my cousin, on account of a distant relationship they had discovered through the Fien family. Soon he would become simply Roger. Do you mean to say, he went on, that you've not heard of the splendid adventures of the noble lord Jourdain de Lille, so noble and so powerful that the Holy Father gave him his niece in marriage? And yet, when I come to think of it, how could you have heard about it? You were in prison at the time, through the good offices of your friend Edward. Ah, it was a little affair that would have made much less stir had it not been for the fellow's alliances. This Jordan, 
a Gascon lord, had committed a few minor misdeeds, such as robbery, homicide, rape, deflowering virgins, and a little buggery with the young men into the bargain. The king, at the request of Pope John, agreed to pardon him, and even restored his property to put him on a promise of reform. Reform? Jourdain returned to his fief, and we soon heard that he'd begun all over again, and worse than ever, that he was keeping thieves, murderers, and other bad hats about him, who plundered priests and laymen for his benefit. A king's sergeant, carrying his lilied staff, was sent to arrest him. Do you know how Jourdain received the sergeant? He had him seized, beaten with the royal staff, and, just to complete things, impaled on it, of which the man died. Robert uttered a loud laugh that made the window panes rattle in their leads. How gaily Monseigneur of Artois laughed, and how, in his heart of hearts, he approved, even envied, except for his sad end, Monsieur Jourdain de Lille. He would have liked to have had him for a friend. One really does not know which was the greater crime, he went on to have killed an officer of the king, or to have befouled the lilies with a sergeant's guts. For his deserts, my lord Jourdain was judged worthy to be strung up to the gibbet at Montfaucon. He was taken there with great ceremony, being dragged at the horse's tail, and was hanged in the robes with which his uncle, the Pope, had presented him. You can still see him in them, should you happen to pass that way. They've become a little too big for him now. And Robert began laughing again, his head thrown back, his thumbs in his belt. His amusement was so sincere and infectious that Roger Mortimer began laughing too. And Valois was laughing, and his son Philippe. The courtiers at the farther end of the room gazed at them with curiosity. One of the blessings of our lot is to be ignorant of our end. And these four great barons were right to seize any opportunity to be amused, for one of them would be dead within two years, and another had but seven years to wait, almost to the day, to be dragged to execution in his turn at the horse's tail through the streets of a town. Laughing together had made them feel more friendly towards each other. Mortimer suddenly had the feeling that he had been admitted to Valois's inner circle of power, and felt a little more at ease. He glanced sympathetically at Monseigneur Charles's face. It was a broad, high-coloured face, the face of a man who ate too much, and whom the duties of his position deprived of the opportunity of taking enough exercise. Mortimer had not seen Valois since various meetings long ago. Once in England, during the celebrations for Queen Isabella's marriage, and a second time, in 1313, when he had accompanied the English sovereigns to Paris to pay their first homage. And all this, which seemed but yesterday, was already in the distant past. Monseigneur Valois, who had been a young man then, had since become this massive and imposing personage, and Mortimer himself had lived, on the best expectation of life, half his allotted span, if God willed that he should not be killed in battle, drowned at sea, or die by the axe of Edward's executioner. To have reached the age of thirty-seven was already a long span of life, particularly when you were surrounded by so many jealousies and enemies when you had risked your life in tournaments and in war, and spent eighteen months in the dungeons of the tower. Clearly he must not waste his time, nor neglect opportunities for adventure. The idea of a crusade was beginning to interest Roger Mortimer, after all. "'And when will your ship sail, Monseigneur?' he asked. "'In eighteen months' time, I think,' replied Valois. I shall send a third embassy to Avignon to make a definite arrangement about the subsidies, the bulls of indulgences, and the order of battle. It will be a splendid expedition, Monseigneur Mortimer, 
in which the people one sees about at courts, who talk so much and so valiantly of war, will be able to show what they can do outside the tournament ground, said Philippe of Valois, who had so far not uttered a word, and now blushed a little. Charles of Valois' eldest son was already imagining the swelling sails of galleys, landings on distant shores, the banners, the knights, the shock of the heavy French cavalry charging the infidel, the crescent trampled beneath the horse's hooves. Saracen girls captured in the secret depths of palaces, and beautiful naked slaves in chains. And nothing was going to prevent Philippe of Valois from slaking his desires on those buxom wenches. His wide nostrils were already distending. For Jean the Lame would remain in France. He loved his wife, of course, but couldn't help trembling in her presence, for her jealousy burst out into furious scenes whenever he so much as looked at another woman's breast. Oh, this sister of Marguerite of Burgundy had a far from easy character. And, indeed, it can so happen that one may love one's wife, and yet be impelled by the forces of nature to desire other women. It would need a crusade, at least, for tall Philippe to dare to deceive his lame wife. Mortimer sat up a little straighter and pulled at his black tunic. He wanted to turn the conversation to his own affairs, which had nothing to do with the crusade. Monseigneur, he said to Charles of Valois, you can count on me to march in your ranks, but I've come also to ask of you. The word was said. The ex-justiciar of Ireland had uttered that word without which no petitioner can hope to receive anything, and without which no powerful man accords his support. To ask, to seek, to pray. But there was no need for him to say anything more. I know, I know, replied Charles of Valois. My son-in-law Robert has informed me. You want me to plead your case with King Edward? Well, my loyal friend. Because he had asked, he had suddenly become a friend. Well, I shall not do it, for it would serve no purpose except to expose me to further insult. Do you know the answer your King Edward sent me by the Count de Bouville? Yes, you must of course be aware of it. And when the license for the marriage had already been asked of the Holy Father, what sort of figure does he make me out? And do you really expect me, after that, to ask him to restore your lands to you, give you back your titles, and dismiss, for the one implies the other, those shameless dispensers of his? And at the same time to restore to Queen Isabella my poor niece, cried Valois. I know, my loyal friend, I know it all. Do you think that I, or the King of France, can make King Edward change both his morals and his ministers? Nevertheless, you must be aware that he sent the Bishop of Rochester to demand that we hand you over. And we refused. We refused even to give the Bishop audience. This is the first affront I've been able to offer Edward in exchange for his. We are linked to each other, Monseigneur of Mortimer, by the outrages that have been inflicted on us. And, if either of us has an opportunity of revenge, I can promise you, my dear lord, that we shall avenge ourselves jointly. Mortimer, though he gave no sign, felt an overwhelming despair. The audience, from which Robert of Artois had promised him such wonderful results, my father-in-law Charles can do anything. If he likes you, and he undoubtedly will, you can be sure of gaining the day. If necessary, he'll bring the Pope in on your side. Seemed to be over. And what had it achieved? Nothing at all. Merely the promise of some vague command in the land of the Saracens in eighteen months' time. Roger Mortimer was already considering leaving Paris and going to see the Pope, and if he could get nothing out of him, then he'd go to the Emperor of Germany. 
Oh, how bitter were the disappointments of exile! His uncle of Chirk had forewarned him. It was then that Robert of Artois broke the somewhat embarrassed silence by saying, Charles, why should we not create the opportunity for the revenge of which you spoke just now? He was the only man at court who called the Count of Valois by his Christian name, having maintained the habit from the time they were mere cousins. Besides, his size, strength, and general truculence gave him rights no one else would have dared assume. Robert is right, said Philippe of Valois. One might, for instance, invite King Edward to the crusade, and then— a vague gesture completed his thought. Tall Philippe was clearly of an imaginative turn. He could see them all crossing a ford, or better still, riding across the desert. They would meet a band of the infidel, they would let Edward lead a charge, and then coldly abandon him into the hands of the Saracens. That would be a fine revenge. Never! cried Charles of Valois. Never will Edward join his banners to mine. Besides, can one even think of him as a Christian prince? Indeed, it's only the Saracens who have such morals as his. In spite of Valois' indignation, Mortimer felt a certain anxiety. He knew only too well what the speeches of princes were worth, and how the enemies of yesterday became reconciled tomorrow, even if only hypocritically when it was in their interest to do so. If it occurred to Monseigneur Valois, so as to increase the size of his crusade, to invite Edward, and if Edward pretended to accept, even if you did invite him, Monseigneur, Mortimer said, there's very little likelihood of King Edward responding to your invitation. He likes wrestling, but hates arms, and it was not he, I can promise you, who defeated me at Shrewsbury but Thomas of Lancaster's bad tactics. Edward would plead, and with reason, the danger he's in from the Scots. But I want the Scots in my crusade, said Valois. Robert of Artois was knocking his huge fists impatiently together. He was utterly indifferent to the crusade, and, to tell the truth, had no wish to go on it. To begin with, he was always seasick. He would undertake anything on shore, but not at sea. A new-born babe would be better at it than he was. Besides, his thoughts were concerned, in the first place, with the recovery of his county of Artois, and to go and wander about the ends of the earth for five years was unlikely to benefit his affairs. The throne of Constantinople was no part of his inheritance, and to find himself one day governing some desert island amid forgotten seas had no attraction for him. He had no interest in the spice trade, nor any need to go and capture Saracen women. Paris was overflowing with Uri at fifty sol, and a bourgeois for even less, and Madame de Beaumont, his wife, the daughter of Monseigneur Valois, closed her eyes to all his infidelities. It was therefore in Robert's interest to postpone the date of the crusade as long as possible, and, while pretending enthusiasm for it, to do his best to delay it. He had a plan in mind, and it was not for nothing he had brought Roger Mortimer to see his father-in-law. "'I wonder, Charles,' he said, whether it is really wise to leave the kingdom of France deprived of its men for so long, and without either its nobility or your hand at the helm, at the mercy of the King of England, who's given so much evidence of his ill will towards us. The castles will be provisioned, Robert, and we shall leave sufficient garrisons, Valois replied. But without the nobility and most of the knights, and without you, I repeat, who are our one great general, who will defend the kingdom in our absence? The constable, who is nearly seventy-five, and can only remain in the saddle by a miracle? Our king, Charles? 
If Edward, as Lord Mortimer tells us, doesn't much care for war, our dear cousin is still less skilled in it. Indeed, if it comes to that, what can he do except show himself fresh and smiling to the people? It would be folly to leave the field open to Edward's sly tricks without having first weakened him by a defeat. Then let's help the Scots, suggested Philippe of Valois. Let's land on their coasts and support their war. For my part, I'm ready to do so. Robert of Artois looked down so as not to show what he was thinking. There'd be a pretty mess if brave Philippe took command of an expedition to Scotland. The heir to the Valois had already shown his capacity in Italy, where he had been sent to support the papal legate against the Visconti of Milan. Philippe had arrived proudly with his banners, and had then allowed himself to be so imposed on and outmaneuvered by Galaziano Visconti that he had, in fact, yielded everything while believing himself victorious and had come home without even having engaged in a skirmish. One needed to beware, above all, of any enterprise in which he was engaged. None of which prevented Philippe of Valois being Robert's best and closest friend, as well as his brother-in-law. But, indeed, you can think what you like of your friends, provided you don't tell them. Roger Mortimer had paled a little on hearing Philippe of Valois' suggestion, for if he was King Edward's adversary and enemy, England was nevertheless still his country. For the moment, he said, the Scots are being more or less peaceful. They appear to be respecting the treaty they imposed on Edward a year ago. But really, said Robert, to get to Scotland you have to cross the sea. Let's keep our ships for the crusade. But we have better grounds on which to defy that bugger Edward. He has failed to render homage for Aquitaine. If we forced him to come and defend his rights to his duchy in France, and then went and crushed him, we should, in the first place, all be avenged, and, in the second, he'd stay quiet enough during our absence. Valois was fiddling with his rings and reflecting. Once again, Robert was showing himself to be a wise counsellor. Robert's suggestion was still vague, but already Valois was visualizing its implications. Aquitaine was far from unknown territory to him. He had campaigned there, his first great and victorious campaign, in 1294. It would undoubtedly be good training for our knights, who've not been properly to war for a long time now, he said, and also an opportunity of trying out this gunpowder artillery the Italians are beginning to make use of, and which our old friend Ptolemy offers to supply us with. And the King of France can certainly sequester the Duchy of Aquitaine, owing to the default in rendering homage for it. He thought for a moment. But it won't necessarily lead to a real campaign, he went on. As usual, there'll be negotiations. It'll become a matter for parliaments and embassies, and eventually the homage will be rendered with a bad grace. It's not really a completely safe pretext. Robert of Artois sat down again, his elbows on his knees, his fists supporting his chin. We can find a more sure pretext than a mere failure to render homage, he said. I have no need to inform you, Cousin Mortimer, of all the difficulties, quarrels, and battles to which Aquitaine has given rise since Duchess Eleanor, having made her first husband, our King Louis the Seventh, so notorious a cuckold that their marriage was dissolved, took her wanton body and her duchy to your King Henry the Second of England. Nor need I tell you of the treaty with which our good King Saint Louis, who did his best to put things on an equitable basis, tried to put a term to a hundred years of war. But equity goes for nothing in settlements between kingdoms. 
The treaty Monseigneur Saint Louis concluded with Henry III Plantagenet in the year of Grace 1259 was so confused that a cat couldn't have found her kittens in it. Even the Seneschal de Jeanville, your wife's great uncle, Cousin Mortimer, who was devoted to the sainted king, advised him not to sign it. Indeed, we have to admit frankly that the treaty was a piece of folly. Robert felt like adding, as was also everything else Saint Louis did, for he was undoubtedly the most disastrous king we ever had. What with his ruinous crusades, his botched treaties, and his moral laws, in which what is black in one passage is discovered to be white in another. Oh, how much happier France would have been had she been spared that reign. And yet, since St. Louis' death, everyone regrets him, for their recollection is at fault. They remember only how he dealt out justice under an oak, and, through listening to the lies of bumpkins, wasted the time he should have been devoting to the kingdom. He went on. Since the death of St. Louis, there has been nothing but disputes, arguments, treaties concluded and broken, homage paid with reservations, hearings by Parliament, plaintiffs non-suited or condemned, rebellions in those lands, and then further prosecutions. But when you, Charles, were sent by our brother, Philip the Fair, into Aquitaine, Robert asked, turning to Valois, and so effectively restored order there, what were the actual motives given for your expedition? Serious rioting in Béon, where French and English sailors had come to blows and shed blood. Very well, cried Robert. We must organize an occasion for more rioting like that of Béon. We must take steps to see that somewhere or other the subjects of the two kings come to serious blows, and that a few people get killed. And I believe I know the very place for it. He pointed his huge forefinger at them and went on. In the Treaty of Paris, confirmed by the Peace of 1303, and reviewed by the jurists of Perigueux in the year 1311, the case of certain lordships, which are called privileged, has always been reserved. For though they lie within the borders of Aquitaine, they owe direct allegiance to the King of France. And these lordships themselves have dependencies, vassal territories in Aquitaine. But it has never been definitely decided whether these dependencies are subject to the King of France or to the Duke of Aquitaine. You see the point? I do, said Monseigneur Valois. His son Philippe did not see it. He opened wide blue eyes, and his failure to understand was so obvious that his father explained. It's quite simple, my boy. Suppose I gave you, as if it were a fief, the whole of this house, but reserved to myself the use and free disposal of this room in which we're now sitting. And this room has, as a dependency, the anteroom, which controls this door. Which of us enjoys rights over the anteroom and is responsible for its furnishing and cleaning? The whole plan, Valois added, turning back to Robert, depends on being able to arrange action of sufficient importance to compel Edward to make a rejoinder. There's a very suitable dependency, the giant replied, in the lands of San Sardos, which appertain to the priory of Salac in the diocese of Perigueux. Their status was argued when Philip the Fair agreed to a treaty of association with the prior of Salat, which made the King of France co-lord of that lordship. Edward I appealed to the Parliament of Paris, but nothing was decided. If the King of France, as co-lord of Salat, builds a castle in the dependency of saint Sardos and puts into it a strong garrison threatening the surrounding territory, what does the King of England, as Duke of Aquitaine, do about it? He must clearly give orders to his Seneschal to oppose it, and will want to station troops there himself. And the first time a couple of soldiers meet, or an officer of the King is maltreated or even insulted, 
Robert spread wide his great hands, as if the result was obvious. And Monseigneur of Valois, in his blue, gold-embroidered velvet robes, rose from his throne. He could already see himself in the saddle at the head of his banners. He would leave for Guienne, where, thirty years ago, he had won a great victory for the King of France. I congratulate you, brother, cried Philippe of Valois, on the fact that so distinguished a knight as you are should also have as great a knowledge of procedure as a lawyer. Ah, uh, there's no great merit attached to that, you know, brother. It's not from any particular liking that I've been led to inquire into the laws of France and the edicts of Parliament. It's due to my lawsuit about Artois. And since, so far, it has been no use to me, let it at least be some use to my friends, said Robert of Artois, bowing slightly to Roger Mortimer, as if this whole great affair was being organized entirely for his benefit. Your coming has been of great assistance to us, my lord, said Charles of Valois, for our causes are linked, and we shall not fail to ask you most strictly for your counsel throughout this enterprise, which may God protect. Mortimer felt disconcerted and embarrassed. He had done nothing and suggested nothing, but his mere presence seemed to have occasioned the others to give concrete form to their secret aspirations. And now he will be required to take part in a war against his own country, and he had no choice in the matter. And so, if God so willed it, the French were going to make war in France against the French subjects of the King of England, with the support of a great English baron, and money furnished by the Pope for the freeing of Armenia from the Turks. Chapter 5 A Time of Waiting The end of the autumn passed, then winter, spring, and the beginning of summer. Roger Mortimer saw Paris in all the four seasons of the year. He saw mud accumulating in its narrow streets, snow covering the great roofs of the abbeys and the fields of Saint-Germain, then the buds opening on the trees by the banks of the Seine, and the sun shining on the square tower of the Louvre, on the round tower of Nell, and on the pointed steeple of the Saint-Chapelle. An exile has to wait. It is his role, one might think, almost his function. He has to wait for the bad times to pass. He has to wait till the people of the country in which he has taken refuge finish arranging their own affairs, so as to have time at last to concern themselves with his. After his first days in exile, when his misfortunes excite curiosity, and everyone wants to secure him, as if he were a rare animal on exhibition, his presence soon becomes wearisome, embarrassing, a mute reproach even. One cannot be concerned with his affairs all the time. After all, he is the petitioner, so let him be patient. So Roger Mortimer waited, as he had waited two months in Picardy, when staying with his cousin Jean de Fienne, for the French court to return to Paris. As he had waited for Monseigneur Valois to find time among all his other tasks to give him audience. And now he was waiting for the war in Guienne, with which his destiny seemed to be unavoidably involved. Oh, Monseigneur Valois had not delayed in giving his orders. The officers of the King of France, as Robert had advised, had begun to mark out the foundations of a castle at saint sardos in the disputed dependencies of the lordship of Salat. But a castle is not built in a day, nor even in three months, and the people of the King of England had not seemed unduly concerned, at least to start with. It was a matter of waiting for an incident to occur. Roger Mortimer devoted his leisure to exploring the capital, which he had seen only on a brief visit ten years earlier, and to discovering the French people, whom he knew but little. How powerful and populous a nation it was, 
and how very different from England. On both sides of the Channel it was generally believed that the two nations were very similar, because their nobility derived from the same source. But what disparities there were when you looked closer! The whole population of the Kingdom of England, which numbered two million souls, did not amount to a tenth of the total of the King of France's subjects. The French numbered approximately twenty-two million. Paris alone had three hundred thousand inhabitants, while London had but forty thousand. And what a seething mass of people there were in the streets! How active trade and industry were! What huge sums of money changed hands! To become aware of it, one had only to take a walk across the Pont au Change, or along the quay of the goldsmiths, and listen to all the little hammers beating gold in the back shops, or walk, holding one's nose a little, through the butcher's district behind the Châtelet, where the flayers and tripe sellers worked, or go down the Rue Saint-Denis, where the mercer's shops were, or go and inspect the stuffs in the great draper's market, while big business was conducted in the comparative silence of the Rue des Lombards, which Mortimer now knew well. Nearly three hundred and fifty guilds and corporations regulated and controlled the conduct of these trades. Each had its laws, customs, and feast days, and there was practically no day in the year on which, after mass had been heard and a conference held in the parlour, a great banquet was not given for the masters and companions. Sometimes it was the hatters, sometimes the candle-makers, sometimes the tanners. On the hill of saint Genevieve, a whole population of clerics and doctors in hoods argued in Latin, and the echoes of their controversies over apologetics or the principles of Aristotle furnished the seed for discussions throughout the whole of Christendom. The great barons and prelates, as well as many foreign sovereigns, maintained houses in the city where they held a sort of court. The nobility frequented the streets of the cité, the mercer's gallery in the royal palace, and the neighbourhood of the townhouses of Valois, Navarre, Artois, Burgundy, and Savoy. Each of these houses was a sort of permanent agency for the great fiefs. In them were concentrated the interests of each province. And the city was ceaselessly growing, pushing out its suburbs into the gardens and fields beyond the walls of Philip Augustus, which were now beginning to disappear, swamped by the new building. If you went a little way out of Paris, you saw that the countryside was prosperous. Mere drovers and swineherds often possessed a vineyard or field of their own. Women employed in tilling the land, or indeed in other trades, never worked on Saturday afternoons, for which they were, however, paid. Moreover, almost everywhere work ceased on Saturdays at the third ringing for Vespers. The large number of religious feast days were all holidays, as were the feast days of the corporations. And yet these people complained. But what were their principal grievances? Tithes and taxes, of course, as in every country in every period, and the fact that they always had someone over them to whom they belonged. They had the feeling that they were always working for someone else's benefit, and that they could never dispose freely either of themselves or the fruits of their labour. In spite of the decrees of Philip V, which had indeed been insufficiently observed, there were still many more serfs in France than there were in England, where most peasants were free men, bound moreover to equip themselves for service in the army, and had a form of representation in the royal parliament. This made the fact that the people of England had demanded charters from their sovereigns easier to understand. On the other hand, the nobility of France was not divided like England's. There were, of course, many sworn enemies over matters of personal interest, 
such as the Count of Artois and his Aunt Maou. There were clans and parties, but the whole nobility made common front when it was a question of the general interest or the defence of the realm. The conception of the nation was clearer and claimed greater adherence. At this period, the real similarity between the two countries lay in the persons of their kings. Both in London and in Paris, the crown had devolved on a weak man, incapable of that true concern for the public good without which a prince is but a prince in name. Mortimer had been presented to the King of France and had seen him on several occasions. He had been able to form no high opinion of this man of twenty-nine, whom the lords were accustomed to call Charles the Fair, and the people Charles the Fool, because, though in face and figure he resembled his father closely enough, he had not an ounce of brains behind his noble appearance. "'Have you found suitable lodgings, my Lord Mortimer? "'Is your wife with you?' Oh, how you must miss her! How many children has she borne you? This was practically the sum of the king's conversation with the exile, and on each occasion he had asked him once again, Is your wife with you? How many children has she borne you? Having forgotten the answers between two audiences. His preoccupations seemed to be entirely domestic and uxorious. His unfortunate marriage to Blanche of Burgundy, from which he had retained a scar, had been dissolved by an annulment in which he himself had not appeared in the best light. Monseigneur of Valois had immediately married him off to Marie of Luxembourg, the young sister of the King of Bohemia, with whom Valois, at that particular moment, wished to come to an understanding over the Kingdom of Arles. And now Marie of Luxembourg was pregnant, and Charles the Fair fussed over her in a rather silly way. The king's incompetence did not, however, prevent France from taking a hand in the affairs of the whole world. The council governed in the king's name, and Monseigneur of Valois in the name of the council. Nothing, so it appeared, could be done without France having decided on it. She was, at this time, giving continual advice to the papacy, and the great courier, Robin Cris Maria, who earned eight livres and some deniers, a real fortune, for making the journey to Avignon, was constantly occupied carrying dispatches, requisitioning his horses from the monasteries on the way. And it was the same with regard to all the courts, those of Naples, Aragon, and Germany for the affairs of Germany were being closely watched, and Charles of Valois and his friend Jean of Luxembourg had worked hard to get the Pope to excommunicate the Emperor Ludwig of Bavaria, so that the crown of the Holy Roman Empire might be offered... To whom, indeed? To Monseigneur of Valois himself, of course. This was an old dream with which he was infatuated. Whenever the throne of the Holy Roman Empire had been vacant, or made vacant, Monseigneur of Valois had put himself forward as a candidate. At the same time, the preparations for the crusade were being pushed forward, and it had to be recognized that, could the crusade be led by the emperor, it would make a great impression on the infidel, and on Christians too, for that matter. There was also trouble with Flanders, which was always causing the crown anxiety. Whether the people were rebelling against their count because he was loyal to the King of France, or whether the count himself rose against the king to satisfy his people. And then, too, there was concern over England, and Roger Mortimer was now summoned by Valois whenever this subject was in question. Mortimer had taken lodgings near Robert of Artois' house in the Rue Saint-Germain-des-Prés, opposite the Navarre house. Gérard de Alspé, who had been with him since his escape from the tower, was in charge of his household, in which Ogle, the barber, held the position of butler. 
The household had been increased by a few refugees, who had also been compelled to go into exile, owing to the enmity of the dispensers. In particular, there was John Maltravers, an English lord belonging to Mortimer's party, and, like Mortimer himself, a descendant of a companion of the Conqueror. He had been declared a king's enemy. Maltravers had a long, dark face, with straight, lank hair and huge teeth. He looked like his horse. He was not the most agreeable of companions, and was inclined to make people start with an abrupt, neighing laugh, which generally appeared quite motiveless. But you do not choose your friends in exile. Common misfortune forces them on you. Mortimer learnt from Maltravers that his wife had been transferred to Skipton Castle in the county of York, her sole attendants being her lady, her equerry, a laundress, a footman, and a page, and that she received only thirteen shillings and four deniers a week on which to keep herself and her people. It might almost have been imprisonment. As for Queen Isabella, her lot became increasingly difficult from day to day. The dispensers plundered, despoiled, and humiliated her with a patient perfection of cruelty. I have nothing left of my own but my life, she sent word to Mortimer, and I much fear they're preparing to take that from me. Hasten, my brother, to my defense. But the King of France, is your wife with you? Have you any sons? Had no opinion apart from Monseigneur of Valois, and Valois was putting all decision off till he had seen the results of the action he had taken in Aquitaine. But suppose the dispensers assassinated the Queen meanwhile? They won't dare, Valois replied. Mortimer went to get news from the banker Ptolemy, through whose good offices he carried on his correspondence with the other side of the channel. The Lombards had a better postal service than the court, and their travellers were cleverer at concealing messages. The correspondence between Mortimer and Bishop Orleton was therefore fairly regular. The Bishop of Hereford had paid dearly for organising Mortimer's escape, but he had courage and was standing up to the king. As the first English bishop ever to be arraigned before a lay court of justice, he refused to answer his accusers, and in this he was supported by all the archbishops and bishops in the kingdom, who saw their privileges threatened. Edward had pursued the prosecution, had Orleton found guilty, and ordered the confiscation of his property. The king had also written to the pope, and demanded the bishop's dethronement as a rebel. It was essential that Monseigneur Valois should make representations to John the Twenty-Second to prevent the measure being taken, for its inevitable result would be to bring Orleton to the scaffold. As far as Henry Crouchback was concerned, the situation was somewhat confused, for Edward had made him Earl of Lancaster in March, and had returned to him both the titles and the properties of his brother, who had been beheaded, including the great castle of Kenilworth. And then, almost immediately afterwards, the king had found a letter of friendship and encouragement he had written to Orleton, and had accused Crouchback of high treason. And your king still obstinately refuses to pay us! Since you frequently see Monseigneur of Valois and Artois, and other friend, said Ptolemy, make sure you remind them, my lord, of those gunpowder engines with which they have been experimenting in Italy, and which must be of great use in besieging towns. My nephew in Siena, and the body in Florence, can undertake to supply them. As pieces of artillery, they are much easier to place in position than those great catapults with crossbeams, and they do more damage. Monseigneur of Valois should equip his crusade with them, if he ever undertakes it. To begin with, the women had taken considerable interest in Mortimer, in this high personage with such strange ways, 
who was always dressed in austere and mysterious black, and who was continually biting the white scar on his lower lip. They made him repeat the story of his escape over and over again, and, as he recounted it, exquisite bosoms tended to heave beneath white and transparent linen bodices. His grave, rather hoarse voice, that had so unexpected an intonation on certain words, was calculated to touch the heart free. On several occasions, Robert of Artois had tried to impel the English lord into arms that asked for nothing better than to open to him. He had also suggested to Mortimer that, if his tastes tended more towards the lower classes, he could procure for him women of easy virtue to distract him from his cares. But Mortimer had yielded to none of these temptations, so much so that, since he gave but little appearance of being inordinately straight-laced, people began wondering to what this apparent virtue might be due, and whether it was not that he shared the morals of his king. Indeed, no one guessed the truth, which was simply that the man, who had wagered his safety on a raven's death, had staked a reversal of fortune in his favour on mere chastity. He had sworn an oath not to touch a woman before he had returned to the land of England, and had recovered his titles and his power. It was a knightly oath, such as a Lancelot or an Amadis, some companion of King Arthur, might have made. But as time went on, Roger Mortimer had to admit that he had been rather hasty in making such an oath, and that it contributed not a little to his depression. At last good news came from Aquitaine. The Seneschal of the King of England in Guienne, Messire Bassett, who was all the more solicitous for his authority because his name gave rise to laughter, began to take alarm at the castle that was being built at saint sardos he saw in it both the usurpation of the rights of his master, the King of England, and a personal insult. Assembling a few troops, he suddenly entered saint sardos pillaged the town, arrested the officers in charge of the work, and hanged them from gallows which, since they bore lilies on escutcheons, marked the King of France's sovereignty over the dependency. Monsieur Ralph Bassett, did not act alone in this expedition. Several lords of the region had joined in with him. As soon as Robert of Artois heard what had happened, he called for Mortimer and took him to Charles of Valois. Monseigneur of Artois was beside himself with joy and pride. He laughed even louder than usual, and gave his friends playful taps that sent them rebounding against the walls. At last the opportunity was at hand, born of his fertile brain. The affair was immediately discussed in the Privy Council, the usual representations were made, and the men who were guilty of the sack of saint sardus were summoned to appear before the Parliament of Toulouse. Would they present themselves, plead guilty to their crime, and make submission? It was very much feared that they might. By good fortune, one of them, and only one, Raymond Bernard de Montpezat, refused to surrender to the summons. No more was needed. The rebel was condemned by default, his property decreed to be confiscated, and Jean de Roy, who had succeeded Pierre Hector de Gallard as Grand Master of the Cross Bowmen, was sent into Guienne with a small escort to seize both the Lord of Montpezat and his property, and see to the dismantling of his castle. But it was the Lord of Montpezat who had the better of it, for he took the royal officer prisoner and demanded a ransom for him. King Edward had nothing to do with the matter, but the turn of events aggravated the case, and Robert of Artois exulted. For a grand master of cross bowmen was not the man to be taken prisoner without serious consequences. Further protests were made, and now direct to the King of England, supported by a threat to confiscate the duchy. 
Early in April, the Earl of Kent, half-brother to King Edward, accompanied by the Archbishop of Dublin, came to propose to Charles IV that their differences might be settled by remitting Edward's duty to pay homage. Mortimer, who saw Kent during his visit, their relations were perfectly courteous, though the circumstances were far from easy, assured him of the utter uselessness of the proposal. The young Earl of Kent was indeed perfectly aware of it, and had embarked on his mission only with reluctance. He departed with the King of France's refusal, which had been transmitted to him with some contempt by Charles of Valois. It looked as if the war, which Robert of Artois had invented, might be on the point of breaking out. But at this very moment the new Queen, Marie of Luxembourg, died suddenly at Issoudun, having been brought to bed before her time of a stillborn child. War could not be made during a period of mourning. Moreover, King Charles was so despondent that he was almost incapable of presiding over his council. As a husband, fate appeared to be decidedly against him. He had been first deceived and now was a widower. Monseigneur of Valois had to lay everything else aside to set about finding the king a third wife. For the king had become anxious and ill-tempered, and indeed blamed every one but himself for the fact that there was no heir to the throne. His father had arranged his first marriage, his uncle the second, and neither seemed to have been very successful. But it was not so easy now to find princesses who were prepared to marry into the family of France, which people were beginning to say was pursued by bad luck. Charles of Valois would have been delighted to give his nephew one of his remaining daughters, had their ages been suitable. But unfortunately, even the eldest, the daughter who had been formerly proposed for the heir apparent of England, was no more than ten years old and Charles the Fair was far from being prepared to await in patience either the recovery of the comfort of his knights or the assuring of the succession. And Roger Mortimer had to wait until a wife had been found for the king. But Charles the Fourth had another cousin Germain, the daughter of Monseigneur Louis of Evreux, now dead, and sister of Philippe of Evreux, who had been married to Jean of Navarre, the supposed bastard of Marguerite of Burgundy. Though lacking in beauty, this Jean of Evreux had a good figure, and, above all, was of an age to become a mother. Monseigneur of Valois, who was longing to resolve the difficulty, encouraged the whole court to influence Charles in favour of this marriage. Three months after the death of Marie of Luxembourg, a new license was asked of the Pope, and Robert of Artois, son-in-law to Charles of Valois, who was the king's uncle, himself became uncle by marriage to the sovereign, who was already his cousin, since Jean of Evreux was the daughter of his late sister, Marguerite of Artois. The marriage took place on July the 5th. Four days earlier, Charles had decided on the confiscation of Aquitaine and Ponthieu for rebellion and failure to render homage. Pope John the Twenty Second, since he considered it his duty to intervene whenever a conflict developed between sovereigns, wrote to King Edward and pressed him to come to render homage so that at least one of the points in dispute might be resolved. But the French army was already on the march and assembling at Orléans, while a fleet was being equipped in the ports to attack the English coast. In the meantime, the King of England had ordered levies to be made in Aquitaine, and Monsieur Ralph Bassett was assembling his banners. The Earl of Kent was on his way back to France, but this time by sea all the way, to take up the post of lieutenant in the duchy to which he had been appointed by his half-brother. Was war about to break out? 
not at all. Monseigneur of Valois had to go to Bas or Aube to meet Leopold of Habsburg about the elections to the Holy Roman Empire, and conclude a treaty by which Habsburg undertook not to come forward as a candidate, in return for a sum of money and various pensions and revenues, in the event of Valois being elected emperor. Roger Mortimer still had to wait. Finally, on August the 1st, in a crushing heat that boiled the knights in their armour as if in so many saucepans, Charles of Valois, stout, resplendent, a crest on his helmet and a surcoat of gold over his mail, had himself hoisted into the saddle. Among his entourage were his second son, the Count of Alencon, his nephew, Philippe of Evreux, the king's new brother-in-law, the constable, Gaucher de Châtillon, Roger Mortimer, and finally Robert of Artois, who, mounted on a horse in keeping with his own size, could overlook the whole army. Was Monseigneur of Valois, as he left for this campaign, his second in Guienne, a campaign he had himself desired, decided on, and almost invented, pleased and happy, or merely satisfied. He was none of these things. His mood was peculiarly morose, because Charles IV had refused to sign his commission as the king's lieutenant in Aquitaine. If anyone had a right to that title, was it not Charles of Valois? And what sort of figure did he cut when the Earl of Kent, that young whippersnapper, and his nephew into the bargain, had been appointed to the lieutenancy by King Edward. One might well wonder what was passing through Charles the Fair's mind, and what reasons he had for his intransigent obstinacy in refusing what was so clearly necessary, when he was normally incapable of making up his mind about anything at all. Indeed, and Valois had no hesitation in discussing it with his companions, was this crowned fool, this ninny, worth all the trouble one took to govern his kingdom for him. Would he one day also have to be provided with an heir? The old constable Gaucher de Châtillon, who was theoretically in command of the army, since Valois had no official commission, was screwing up his saurian eyes beneath his old-fashioned helm. He was rather deaf, but at seventy-four still looked well on horseback. Roger Mortimer had bought his arms from Ptolemy. His hard, bright eyes, the colour of new steel, gleamed beneath his raised visor. Since, through his king's fault, he was marching against his own country, he wore a surcoat of black velvet as a sign of mourning. He would never forget the date on which they were setting out. It was the 1st of August, 1324 the feast of St. Peter ad Vincula, and it was a year to the very day since he had escaped from the Tower of London. Chapter 6 The Bombards The ringing of the tocsin surprised young Edmund, Earl of Kent, as he was lying on the flagstones of a room in the castle, trying vainly to get cool. He had half undressed, and was wearing only cloth breeches, as he lay there with outspread arms, motionless and overcome by the Bordeaux summer. His favourite greyhound lay panting beside him. The dog was the first to hear the tocsin. It rose on its front legs, pointed with its nose, and laid its quivering ears back. The young Earl of Kent woke out of his doze, stretched himself, and suddenly realized that this huge clangor came from the bells of La Réole, which were all wildly ringing. In an instant he was on his feet, had seized the thin cambric shirt he had thrown over a chair, and had hastily put it on. But already there was a sound of footsteps hurrying towards his door. Monsieur Ralph Bassett, the Seneschal, came in, followed by some local lords the Lord of Bergerac, the Barons of Budeau and Mauvaisin, and the Lord of Montpezat. 
on whose account, at least he thought so and took pride in it, the war had broken out. The Seneschal Bassett was a very short man indeed, and the young Earl of Kent was surprised by his lack of inches each time he saw him. Moreover, he was as round as a barrel, for he had a prodigious appetite, and was always on the verge of losing his temper, which made his neck swell and his eyes pop. The Greyhound disliked the Seneschal, and growled whenever it saw him. "'Is it a fire or the French, Monsieur Seneschal?' asked the Earl of Kent. "'The French! The French, Monseigneur!' cried the Seneschal, almost shocked by the question. "'Come and look! You can already make them out!' The Earl of Kent bent to gaze into a tin mirror, and put his fair curls straight about his ears. Then he followed the Seneschal. In his white shirt, open across his chest, and falling loose over his belt, with neither boots nor spurs, and his head bare, he gave a curious impression of grace and intrepidity, also perhaps of a certain lack of responsibility, among these armed barons in their iron mail. As he emerged from the keep, the huge clangour of the bells took him by surprise, and the bright August sun dazzled him. The greyhound started howling. They went up to the top of the Thomas Tower, the great round tower which had been built by Richard Coeur de Lyon. Indeed, what has that ancestor of his not built? The outer fortifications of the Tower of London, Chateau Gaillard, the castle of La Réole, the wide Garonne flowed sparkling at the foot of the almost precipitous hill, its course meandering across the great fertile plain which was bounded by the distant blue line of the Argenois hills. "'I can't make anything out,' said the Earl of Kent, who was expecting to see the French vanguard on the outskirts of the town. "'Yes, look there, Monseigneur!' someone shouted above the noise of the toxin. "'By the river, upstream, towards saint Bazai. Screwing up his eyes and shading them with his hand, the Earl of Kent was finally able to make out a glittering ribbon advancing parallel to the river. He was told it was the reflection of the sun on breastplates and horse armour. The din of the bells was still making the air quiver. The ringer's arms must have been exhausted. Below, the population of the town was hurrying to and fro, swarming in the streets, and particularly about the town hall. How small men seemed when observed from the battlements of a citadel! Mere insects! Frightened peasants were crowding down the roads leading to the town, some dragging a cow along, some driving goats before them, some goading their ox-teams. Everyone was flying from the fields, and soon the people from the neighbouring villages would start arriving, their belongings on their backs or heaped in carts. And the whole crowd of them would have to find what lodging they could in a town already overpopulated by the troops and knights of Guienne. "'We shall be unable to make any proper estimate of the numbers of the French for another two hours, and they won't be under the walls before nightfall,' the Seneschal said." Oh, uh, it's a bad time of year for making war, said the Lord of Bergerac peevishly, for he had had to fly before the French advance from saint foy la grande a few days earlier. Why is it a bad time of year? asked the Earl of Kent, pointing to the clear sky and the smiling countryside below. It was rather hot, of course, but wasn't that better than rain and mud? Had these people of Aquitaine been in the Scottish wars, they might have complained less. "'Because it's the grape-harvest, Monseigneur,' said the Lord of Montpezat. "'The villains will be aghast to see their vines trampled underfoot, and they'll blame us. "'The Count of Valois knows very well what he's doing. "'He did the same in 1294. "'Ravage the whole country to wear it down the more quickly.' 
The Earl of Kent shrugged his shoulders. The Bordeaux country would not be affected by the loss of a few barrels, and war or no war, one would still be able to go on drinking claret. An unexpected little breeze was blowing about the top of the Thomas Tower. It entered the young prince's open shirt and played agreeably over his skin. How marvellous it felt merely to be alive! The Earl of Kent placed his elbows on the warm stone of the battlements and allowed himself to dream. At twenty-three he was the king's lieutenant for the whole duchy. That is to say, invested with all the royal powers, justice, war, finance. In his own person he was the king himself. It was he who said, I will it, and who was obeyed. He could give the order, hang him. Not that he was thinking of giving any such order, but he had the power to do so. And then, above all, he was far from England, far from the court, far from his half-brother and his whims, angers, and suspicions, far from the dispensers with whom he had of necessity to pretend to be on good terms, though he hated them. Here he was on his own, his own master, and master of all he surveyed. An army was coming to meet him, but he would charge it and defeat it. There could be no doubt of that. An astrologer had told him that he would accomplish his greatest actions and achieve renown between the ages of twenty-four and twenty-six. His childhood dreams were suddenly coming true. A great plain, an army, sovereign power. No, indeed, he had never felt happier to be alive in his life. His head was swimming a little with an intoxication which was entirely due to his own feelings and to the breeze playing over his chest, the vastness of the horizon. Your orders, Monseigneur, asked Monsieur Bassett, who was becoming impatient. The Earl of Kent turned and looked at the little Seneschal, with a shade of haughty astonishment. "'My orders?' he repeated. "'Have the trumpets sounded, of course, Messieurs Seneschal, and get your people to horse. We shall go out to meet them and charge.' "'But what with, Monseigneur?' "'Good God, with our troops, Bassett!' "'Monseigneur, we have barely two hundred knights here, and there are more than fifteen hundred coming against us, according to the figures in our possession.' Is that not correct, Monsieur de Bergerac? Reginald de Pont de Bergerac nodded agreement. The little seneschal's neck was redder and more swollen than ever. He was aghast and on the verge of exploding at such imprudence. Have we no news of reinforcements? asked the Earl of Kent. No, Monseigneur, still nothing. The king, your brother, if you will forgive my saying so, is letting us down badly. They had been waiting for these long heralded reinforcements from England for four weeks, and the constable of Bordeaux, who had troops, made a pretext of their failure to arrive for not moving himself, for he had received an order from King Edward to march when the reinforcements had disembarked. The young Earl of Kent was not so much a sovereign as it might appear. Owing to the delay and the consequent lack of men, who could tell if the promised reinforcements had ever been shipped? They had been unable to prevent Monseigneur of Valois strolling across the countryside from Argen to Marmonde and from Bergerac to Dura, as if in a pleasure park. And now that Uncle Valois was in sight, with his long ribbon of steel, there was still nothing that could be done about it. Is that also your advice, Montpezat? asked the Earl of Kent. "'I fear so, Monseigneur. I very much fear so,' replied the Lord of Montpezat, chewing his black moustaches, for he was obsessed with a longing for revenge. As a reprisal for his disobedience, Valois had ordered his castle to be demolished. "'And you, Bergerac?' Kent asked again. 
It makes me weep with rage, said Pont de Bergerac, with that strong sing-song accent that was common to all the minor lords of the region. Edmund of Kent did not bother to ask the barons of Budos and Farg de Mauvezin for their opinions, for they could speak neither French nor English, but only Gascon, and Kent could not understand a word they said. In any case, their expressions were sufficient answer. Very well, then. Close the gates, Monsieur Seneschal, and make dispositions for a siege. And when the reinforcements do arrive, they'll take the French in the rear, and perhaps that will be better still, said the Earl of Kent, trying to console himself. He scratched his greyhound's forehead with the tips of his fingers, and then leaned on the warm stone again to watch the valley. There was an old saying, who holds La Réole holds Guienne. They would hold out as long as was necessary. For an army, too easy an advance is almost as exhausting as a retreat. Having met no resistance to bring it to a halt, even if only for a day, to draw breath, the French army had been marching unceasingly for more than three weeks, to be precise, for twenty-five days. The great host, with its banners, knights, squires, archers, wagons, forges, and cookers, with the merchants and brothel-keepers in its train, extended over a league of the plain. Its horses were wither galled, and every few minutes one of them cast a shoe. Many of the knights had had to give up wearing their armour, which, aided by the heat, had given them sores and boils at the joints. The footmen were wearily dragging their heavy nailed boots. Moreover, the fine black plums of Argent, which looked ripe enough on the trees, had violently purged the thirsty, pilfering soldiers. They were continually leaving the column to lower their breeches by the roadside. The constable Gaucher de Chatillon slept as much as he could on his horse. He had trained himself to do this through nearly fifty years of the profession of arms and eight wars or campaigns. "'I shall sleep a little,' he would say to his two squires. Adjusting their horse's pace to his, they placed themselves on each side of the constable, so as to prop him up should he slip sideways, and the old leader, his back well supported by the cantle, snored inside his helm. Robert of Artois, though he sweated, grew no thinner. For twenty yards around he diffused the stench of a wild beast. He had made a friend of one of the English in Mortimer's train, the tall Baron Maltravers, who looked like a horse, and he had even offered him a place in his banner because he was a great gambler and ready to handle the dice-box at every halt. Charles of Valois' ill-humour was not improving. Surrounded by his son, Alencon, his nephew, Evreux, the two marshals, Mathieu de Trie and Jean de Barre, and his cousin Alfonso of Spain, he spent his time swearing at everything, at the intolerable climate, the stuffiness of the nights, and the furnace of the days, at the flies, at the greasy food. The wine they served him was but thin stuff, and fit for rustics, though they were in a country famous for its wines, were they not? Where did these people hide their good cakes? The eggs tasted bad, and the milk was sour. Monseigneur Valois sometimes woke up in the morning feeling sick, and for several days past he had been suffering from a dull pain in the left shoulder which worried him and then the footmen marched so slowly. Oh, if one could make war with the chivalry alone! And then, had he been right to take the advice of Ptolemy, supported though it was by Robert of Artois, and drag these huge bombards on their wooden carriages all the way from Castel Sarrazin, instead of relying on the catapults and perrier to which he was accustomed? For though they might take longer to put in position, they had the great advantage of being transported in pieces. I seem to be condemned to hot suns, he said. 
My first campaign, when I was fifteen years old, was fought in the burning heat of your bare Aragon, of which I was once king for a time, cousin Alfonso, and against your grandfather. He was talking to Alfonso of Spain, heir to the throne of Aragon, reminding him, perhaps not very tactfully, of the enmity that had divided their respective families. But he could do so with impunity, for Alfonso was very easy-going, and ready to do anything to please. He was prepared to go on the crusade, since he had been asked to do so, and in the meantime to train himself for the crusade by fighting the English. "'I shall never forget the capture of Girona,' Valois went on. "'What an oven that was!' The Cardinal de Collier, since he had no crown available for my coronation, crowned me with his hat. I was stifled under that huge red piece of felt. Yes, I was fifteen years old. If my noble father, King Philippe the Bold, had not died of the fever he contracted in those parts on his way home. Talking of his father made him feel gloomy. He was thinking that he had died at forty. His elder brother, Philip the Fair, had died at forty-six, and his half-brother, Louis of Evreux, at forty-three. And he himself had turned fifty-four in March. He had clearly shown that he was the most robust member of the family. But how many more years would Providence permit him? And Campania, Romagna, and Tuscany, those are hot countries for you, he went on. I marched through the whole of Italy in midsummer, from Naples up to Siena and Florence, to chase out the Ghibelline. Some, uh, let me see, it was in 1301, twenty-three years ago. And even here, in Guienne, in the year 1294, it was summer. It always is summer. But when you have to fight in Flanders, it's always winter, and you're up to your thighs in mud. You know, Charles, it'll be hotter still on the crusade, Robert of Artois said sarcastically. Do you see us invading the Egyptian Sudan? It seems vines are not much cultivated in those parts. We shall have to drink the sand. On the crusade, the crusade, Valois replied with weary irritation. How could one even tell whether the crusade will ever take place with all the obstacles people put in my way? It's all very well to devote one's life to the service of the kingdom and the church, but in the end one grows weary of expending all one's strength for such ungrateful people. The ungrateful people were, in the first place, Pope John the Twenty-Second, who was still reluctant to grant the subsidies, almost as if he really wished to discourage the expedition. But above all, King Charles the Fourth who had not only failed to send the commission for the lieutenancy to Charles of Valois, a dereliction which was now becoming offensive, but had also taken advantage of his uncle's absence to put himself forward as a candidate for the empire. And the Pope, of course, had given him his official support. And so all Valois' splendid arrangements with Leopold of Habsburg had fallen to the ground. King Charles was considered a fool, and, in fact, was one. But on occasion he was competent enough to deal a foul blow. Valois had received the news that very day, August the 25th. It was an unsatisfactory feast of St. Louis, to say the least. He was in such a bad temper, and so busy chasing the flies from his face, that he had forgotten to look at the landscape. He saw La Réole only when they were before it, within four or five bow-shots. La Réole stood on a rocky spur above the Garonne, but was dominated by a circle of green hills. Etched against the pale sky, enclosed within her ramparts of fine yellow stone, now turning gold in the setting sun, with her steeples, her castle's turrets, and the high roof of her town hall with its open belfry, and all her crowded roofs of red tiles, she resembled the miniatures of Jerusalem you can find in books of ours. A pretty town. Furthermore, owing to the height on which Lariole was set, she was an ideal stronghold. 
the Earl of Kent had made no error in shutting himself up within her walls. She would be no easy fortress to take. The army had come to a halt, awaiting orders. But Monseigneur of Valois issued none. He was sulking. Let the constable and the marshals take what decisions seemed good to them. Since he was not the king's lieutenant and had no power, he refused to take any responsibility. Come, Alfonso, let's go and refresh ourselves, he said to his Spanish cousin. Waking up, the constable twisted his head inside his helm and stuck out an ear to hear what the leaders of his banners were saying to him. He sent the Count of Boulogne to reconnoitre. Boulogne returned an hour later, having ridden round the town by the hills. All the gates were shut, and the garrison showed no signs of making a sortie. It was therefore decided to make camp where they were, and the banners selected their areas pretty much as they liked. The vines, their branches trailing between trees and tall vine props, made agreeably sheltered tunnels. The army was exhausted and fell asleep in the clear twilight as the first stars appeared. The young Earl of Kent was unable to resist the temptation, and, after a sleepless night, of which he spent the waking hours playing Tremerel with his equerries, he sent for Seneschal Bassett, ordered him to summon his knights to arms, and, before dawn, without sound of trumpet, left the town by a sally port. The French, snoring among the vines, wakened only when the galloping Gascon knights were among them. They looked up in astonishment, only to lower their heads again as they saw the charging hooves go by. Edmund of Kent and his companions had it all their own way among the sleeping host. They hewed with their swords, struck with their maces and their leaded flails at naked ribs and legs, unprotected by greaves or breastplates. There was a cracking of bones as they drove a path, leaving screams in their wake through the French camp. Some of the great lord's tents collapsed, but soon a loud voice was heard above the hubbub, shouting, Rally to Châtillon! And the constable's banner, Ghoul, three pails vair, in chief oar, a dragon for crest, and supporting lions, was floating in the rising sun. Old Gaucher had prudently made his own vassal knights camp a little in the rear, and now came to the rescue. Cries of, Artois to the fore, and Rally to Valois, responded from either hand. Only half equipped, some on horseback and some on foot, the knights hurled themselves on the enemy. The camp was too big and too scattered, and the French knights too numerous, to enable the Earl of Kent to pursue his ravages for long. The Gascons soon became aware of a pincer movement being mounted against them. Kent had only just time to turn aside and retreat at a gallop to the gates of La Réole, behind which he could take refuge. Then, having complimented his followers, he took off his armour and went to bed, his honour vindicated. The French camp was echoing with the groaning of the wounded. Consternation reigned. Among the dead, who numbered about sixty, were Jean de Bar, one of the marshals, and the Count of Boulogne, who had made the reconnaissance the evening before. It was much deplored that these two lords, both valiant warriors, should have met so sudden and so absurd an end, slaughtered on awakening. But Kent's prowess inspired respect. Charles of Valois himself, who, the evening before, had been asserting that he would make mincemeat of the young man, if he encountered him in the lists, had now changed his opinion and almost took pride in saying, Well, Messigneur, after all, he's my nephew, don't forget that. Forgetting the wounds to his vanity, his physical ills and the heat of the season, he set himself, when sufficiently magnificent funeral honours had been rendered to the Marshal de Bar, to prepare the siege of the town. 
and in this he displayed singular activity and competence, for, though he was excessively vain, he was none the less a very remarkable soldier. All the roads leading to La Réole were cut, and the whole region controlled by posts set up in depth. Entrenchments, gabions, and other earthworks were undertaken within a short distance of the walls to give cover to the archers, while, in the most suitable places, the army began constructing emplacements for the bombards. It also started to build platforms for the crossbow men. Monseigneur Valois seemed to be everywhere, inspecting, encouraging, and issuing orders. To the rear, the knights had set up their round tents, from the summits of which floated their banners. Charles of Valois' tent, placed in a position from which it could dominate both the camp and the beleaguered town, was a veritable palace of tapestried hangings. The whole camp was situated in a huge amphitheatre under the flank of the hills. On August the 30th, Valois at last received his commission as the king's lieutenant. His mood changed at once, and from then on he seemed to have no doubt that the war was as good as won. Two days later, Mathieu de Tri, the surviving marshal, Pierre de Cugnier, and Alfonso of Spain, preceded by sounding trumpets and the white flag of envoys, advanced to the foot of the walls of La Réole to summon the Earl of Kent, on the order of the Most High and Puissant Lord Charles, Count of Valois, Lieutenant of the King of France in Gascony and Aquitaine, to yield and surrender into their hands the duchy in its entirety, in default of loyalty and the rendering of homage due. To which Seneschal Bassett, who had to stand on tiptoe to look over the battlements, replied, on the order of Edmund, Earl of Kent, Lieutenant of the King of England in Gascony and Aquitaine, that the summons could not be accepted, and that the Earl would not leave the town, nor hand over the duchy, unless he were dislodged by force. Now that a state of siege had been declared in accordance with the rules, each side went to its tasks. Monseigneur Valois put to work the thirty miners lent him by the Bishop of Metz. They were to tunnel underground galleries beneath the walls and place in them barrels of powder, which would later be exploded. Engineer Oug, who belonged to the Duke of Lorraine, guaranteed miraculous results from this operation. The walls would burst open like a flower in spring. But the besieged, becoming aware of the muffled sounds of tunnelling, put tanks of water on the ramparts. Whenever they saw the surface of the water ripple, they knew the French were digging a sap below. They dug saps from their side too, but at night, for the Lorraine miners worked by day. One morning the two galleries met, and an appalling butchery took place underground by the dim light of lanterns. The survivors emerged covered with sweat, black dust, and blood, their eyes as wild with horror as if they had returned from hell. But now the firing platforms were ready, and Monseigneur Valois decided to use the bombards. They were huge tubes of thick bronze, bound with iron hoops, mounted on wooden, wheelless carriages. Ten horses were needed to move each one of these monsters, and twenty men to load, aim, and fire it. Each was surrounded with a sort of box-like structure of heavy beams to protect the gunners should the bombard explode. These engines, which came from Pisa, had been delivered first to the Seneschal of Languedoc, who had sent them on to Castel Sarrazin and Argin. The Italian crews called them Bombarda because of the noise they made. All the great lords and the commanders of banners were assembled to see the bombards work. The constable Gaucher shrugged his shoulders and said with a growl that he did not believe in the destructive effects of these engines. Why place your trust in such new-fangled things? when you could use good mangonels, trebuchet, and perriers, 
which had proved their worth over the centuries. What need had he, Chatillon, of the founders of Lombardy to reduce the towns he had taken? Wars were won by valour and the strength of men's arms, not by having recourse to the powders of alchemists, which stank rather too much of the devil's sulphur. Beside each bombard, the gunners lit a brazier, and set an iron rod to become red-hot. Then, having loaded the bombard by the muzzle, introducing the powder with huge spoons of beaten iron, followed by a wad of tow, and then a huge stone ball weighing approximately a hundred pounds, they placed a little powder on the top of the breech in a groove which communicated with the charge inside by a touch-hole. The spectators were asked to withdraw to a distance of fifty paces. The gunners lay down with their hands over their ears. Only one remained standing by each bombard to set fire to the powder with the long iron rod which had been heated in the brazier. As soon as they had done so, they threw themselves to the ground and lay flat against the beams built round the carriages. Red flames gushed forth, and the ground shook. The noise rolled down the valley of the Garonne, and was heard from Marmont to Langon. The whole air about the bombards turned black with smoke. The back ends of them had sunk into the light soil with the recoil. The constable was coughing, spitting, and swearing. When the dust had dissipated a little, it was discovered that one of the balls had fallen among the French. It was a wonder no one had been killed. Nevertheless, it could be seen that a roof in the town had been holed. A great deal of noise for very little damage, said the constable. With the old balusters, with weights and slings, all the balls would have reached their target, without one's being asphyxiated into the bargain. In the meantime, within La Réole, no one could at first understand why a great cascade of tiles should suddenly have fallen into the street from the roof of Master Delpouch, the notary. Nor could the people make out where the thunderclap that reached their ears a moment later came from, since there was not a cloud in the sky. But then Master Delpouch came rushing out of his house, shouting that a huge stone ball had fallen into his kitchen. Then the population ran to the ramparts, only to discover that there were none of those great engines, which were the normal equipment for sieges in the French camp. At the second salvo, which was less well aimed, the balls starred the walls, and the defenders were forced to the conclusion that the noise and the projectiles came from the long tubes lying on the hillside with a cloud of smoke hanging over them. They were seized with panic, and the women rushed to the churches to pray against these inventions of the devil. The first cannon shot in a western war had been fired. On the morning of September the 22nd, the Earl of Kent was asked to receive Messire Ramon de Labisson, Jean de Miral, Imbert Esclau, the brothers Duart and Bassin de Pain, the notary Elie de Malanin, and all six Juart of La Réole, together with several burgesses who were accompanying them. The Jurat presented to the lieutenant of the King of England a long list of grievances, and in a tone that was far from being one of submission and respect. The town was without food, water, or roofs. The bottoms of the cisterns were showing, the floors of the granaries were being swept, and the population could no longer stand the hail of balls which had fallen on it every quarter of an hour for more than three weeks now. People had been killed in their beds, and children crushed in the streets. The hospital was full to overflowing with sick and wounded. The dead were lying in heaps in the crypts of the churches. The steeple of the Church of St. Peter had been hit, and the bells had fallen with a sound like the last trump, which was clear proof that God was not supporting the English cause. Moreover, the time for the grape harvest had come, 
at least in the vineyards the French had not ravaged, and the grapes could not be left to rot on the vines. The population, encouraged by the landowners and merchants, was ready to rise in revolt and fight the soldiers of the Seneschal, if necessary, to force the surrender of the town. While the Jurat were talking, a ball whistled through the air, and they heard the sound of a roof caving in. The Earl of Kent's greyhound began howling. Its master silenced it with weary irritation. Edmund of Kent had known for several days past that he would have to surrender. He had continued his obstinate resistance for no valid reason. His few troops were exhausted by the siege and in no condition to repulse an assault. To attempt another sortie against an adversary who was now solidly entrenched would have been mere folly. And now the townspeople of La Réole were threatening rebellion. Kent turned to Seneschal Bassett. Do you still believe in reinforcements from Bordeaux, Messier Ralph? he asked. It was not the Seneschal, but Kent himself, who had believed, against all the evidence, in the arrival of these promised reinforcements, who were to take Charles of Valois' army in the rear. Ralph Bassett was at the end of his tether, and had no hesitation in accusing King Edward and his dispensers of having let the defenders of La Réole down to a degree that amounted to a betrayal. The lords of Bergerac, Budot, and Montpezat looked no happier. No one felt like dying for a king who showed such little concern for his most faithful servants. Loyalty seemed to be far too ill-rewarded. "'Have you a white flag, Monsieur Seneschal?' asked the Earl of Kent. "'Very well. Have it hoisted on the top of the castle.' A few minutes later the bombards fell silent, and there reigned over the French camp that profound stillness of surprise which tends to greet an event that has been much longed for. Envoys emerged from La Réole and were conducted to the tent of Marshal de Trie, who informed them of the general terms of surrender. The town, of course, would be handed over, but the Earl of Kent must also sign and proclaim the handing over of the whole duchy to the lieutenant of the King of France. There would be no pillage, nor prisoners taken, merely hostages, and an indemnity to be fixed later. Furthermore, the Count of Valois invited the Earl of Kent to dinner. A great feast was prepared in the tent, embroidered with the lilies of France, in which Monseigneur had been living for nearly a month. The Earl of Kent arrived in his best suit of armour, but pale, and doing his best to conceal, beneath an air of dignity, his humiliation and despair. He was accompanied by the Seneschal Bassett and a number of Gascon lords. The two royal lieutenants, conqueror and conquered, conversed with a certain coolness, though calling each other Monseigneur my nephew and Monseigneur my uncle, as if even war could not break family ties. Monseigneur of Valois made the Earl of Kent sit opposite him at dinner. The Gascon knights began gorging themselves, as they had had no chance of doing for many weeks. Everyone did his best to be courteous and compliment the adversary on his valour, as if it were question merely of a tournament. The Earl of Kent was congratulated on his spirited sortie, which had cost the French a marshal. Kent replied by showing great admiration for his uncle's dispositions for the siege and his use of the bombards. "'Listen, Monsieur Constable, and all of you, Messigneur,' cried Valois, "'to what my noble nephew says. Without our bombards the town could have held out for four months. Remember that, all of you!' Kent and Mortimer watched each other across the platters, goblets, and flagons. As soon as the banquet was over, the principal leaders went into conference to negotiate the act of surrender, which had numerous articles. Kent was, in fact, prepared to yield on every point, 
with the exception of certain clauses, of which one cast a doubt on the legitimacy of the King of England's power, and another placed Seneschal Bassett and the Lord of Montpezat at the head of the list of hostages. For since these last had arrested and hanged officers of the King of France, their fate would be only too certain. But Valois insisted that the Seneschal, and the man responsible for the rebellion at Saint-Sardos, should be handed over to him. Roger Mortimer was present at the negotiations. He suggested he should have a private conversation with the Earl of Kent, but the constable opposed it. You really could not allow the terms of an armistice to be negotiated by a deserter from the opposing camp. But Robert of Artois and Charles of Valois trusted Mortimer. So the two Englishmen went apart into a corner of the tent. Are you really anxious, my lord, to return to England at once? Mortimer asked. Kent made no reply. Are you so desirous of confronting King Edward, your brother, with whose fits of passion and injustice you are so familiar? Mortimer went on. He'll reproach you with a defeat for which the dispensers are alone responsible. You must be aware, my lord, that you've been betrayed. We have known all along that you were promised reinforcements were on the way to you, when in fact they never had even been embarked and the order given by the Seneschal of Bordeaux not to come to your assistance before the reinforcements arrived, reinforcements that, in fact, did not exist, was surely nothing but a betrayal. You need not be surprised to find me well informed, for I owe it merely to the Lombard bankers. And have you not asked yourself the reason for so criminal a negligence towards you? Do you not see the object of it? Kent still remained silent, his head inclined a little to one side, gazing at his fingernails. Had you won this war, you would have been a danger to the dispensers, my lord, Mortimer went on, and would have achieved too important a position in the kingdom. They have quite naturally preferred to subject you to the discredit of a defeat, even at the price of Aquitaine which has but little importance for men who have no care but to steal the baronies of the marches one after the other. Do you not realize that my rebellion of three years ago was for England against the king, or perhaps for the king against himself? How do you know that you'll not be accused of criminal negligence and immediately cast into prison on your arrival home? You're still young, my lord, and have no idea of what those wicked men are capable. Kent smoothed his fair curls back behind his ears, and replied at last, I'm beginning to know it, my lord, and to my cost. Would you be entirely reluctant to offer yourself as the first hostage, on the guarantee, of course, that you would be treated as a prince? Since Aquitaine is now lost, and I fear for ever, our duty is to save the kingdom itself and we can do that best from here." The young man looked at Mortimer in surprise, but he was already half prepared to consent. But two hours ago, he said, I was still the lieutenant of my brother the king, and are you asking me so soon to join a rebellion? Without its being apparent, my lord, without its being apparent, Great decisions are made in a few seconds. How many seconds do you give me? There's no need, my lord. You've already made your decision. Roger Mortimer scored no little success when young Edmund, Earl of Kent, came back to the council table and announced that he was prepared to offer himself as the senior hostage. Mortimer leaned towards him and said, and now we must work to save your cousin and sister-in-law, the Queen. She deserves our love, and can be of the greatest help to us. Part 2. Isabella in Love Chapter 1. Dinner with Pope John 
The church of St. Agricola had recently been entirely rebuilt. The cathedral of the Doms, the church of the Minorites, and those of the Predicant Friars and the Augustinians had been enlarged and renovated. The Hospitallers of St. John of Jerusalem had built themselves a magnificent commandery. Beyond the Place aux Change, a new chapel to St. Anthony was rising, and the foundations for a future church of St. Didier were being dug. The Count de Bouville had been going about Avignon for a week. He no longer recognized it, nor could he find in it a single reminder of the past. Every time he went out, he was surprised and amazed. How could a town have changed its appearance so completely in eight years? For it was not only churches that had risen from the earth, or acquired new facades, raising on every hand spires, arches, rose windows, and traceries of white stone, which the winter sunlight tinged with gold, while the wind from the Rhone sang through them. On every hand, princes' and prelates' palaces, communal buildings, rich burgesses' houses, offices of Lombard companies, shops and warehouses were building. On all sides, the patient, incessant sound of masons' hammers seemed to patter like rain. The millions of little taps of metal on soft stone by which capitals are built. Constantly traversed by the torches which preceded the cardinals, even in daylight, the swarming, lively, busy crowd trampled the sawdust, the stone dust, and the rubbish. The embroidered shoes of power, being soiled by the dust of building, is the symbol of a period of wealth. No, indeed, Hugues de Bouville no longer recognized the place. Not only were his eyes filled with the dust of building by the mistral, but they were constantly being dazzled. The shops, which all boasted of being suppliers to the Holy Father, the Pope, or to their eminences of his sacred college, were full of the most sumptuous merchandise on earth. The thickest velvets, silks, cloths of gold, and the richest braid, sacerdotal jewels, Pectoral crosses, croziers, rings, ciboriums, monstrances, patterns, as well as eating platters, spoons, goblets, and tankards, engraved with the papal or with cardinal's arms, were heaped on the counters of Toro the Sienese, of Merchant Coboli, and of Master Cachet the Silversmiths. Painters were needed to decorate all these naves, ceilings, cloisters, and audience chambers. The three Pierres, Pierre de Puy, Pierre de Carmelaire, and Pierre Gaudrach, with the assistance of their innumerable pupils, were spreading gold, azure, and carmine, as they depicted the signs of the zodiac round scenes from the two testaments. Sculptors were needed and Master Macchiolo of Spoleto was carving effigies of the saints in oak and walnut, which he would then paint or cover with gold. And in the streets everyone bowed low to a man who, though preceded by no torches, was always escorted by an imposing following, carrying measuring rods and huge plans on rolls of parchment. He was Messire Guillaume de Coqueron, the chief of all the papal architects, who had been rebuilding Avignon since the year 1317 at the fabulous cost of five thousand gold florins. The women of this religious metropolis were more beautifully dressed than those of anywhere else in the world. To watch them come out of mass, walk through the streets, visit the shops, hold court in the middle of the street itself, shivering and laughing in their furred cloaks, among assiduous lords and knowing clerics, was an enchantment to the eye. Some of these ladies had no hesitation in being seen walking on the arm even of a canon or a bishop, and the two skirts swept the white dust in harmonious accord. The church's treasury enabled every human activity to prosper, it had been necessary to construct new brothels and extend the prostitutes' quarter, 
For all the monks, novices, clerics, deacons, and sub-deacons who haunted Avignon were not necessarily saints. The town magistrates had posted up strict regulations. Prostitutes and procuresses are forbidden to live in the better streets, to wear the same ornaments as respectable women, to wear veils in public, or to touch with the hand bread and fruit on the stalls, on pain of being obliged to buy the goods they have so touched. Married courtesans are expelled from the town, and will be summoned to appear before the magistrates should they enter it. But despite the regulations, the courtesans, dressed in the finest clothes, bought the best fruit, walked in the aristocratic streets, and had no difficulty in marrying. So prosperous and sought after were they. They gazed with assurance at the so-called respectable women, who behaved no better than they did, for the only difference between them was that chance had given them lovers of higher rank. And it was not only Avignon, but all the neighbouring countryside that was being transformed. On the farther side of the bridge of saint benezet on the Villeneuve bank, Cardinal Arnaud de Villa, a nephew of the Pope, was building an enormous collegiate church and Philip the Fair's tower was already being called the Old Tower, because it was thirty years old. But would any of all this have existed but for Philip the Fair, who in times past had imposed Avignon on the papacy as its headquarters? At Bédaride, Chateauneuf, and Neuve, the Pope's builders were raising churches and castles out of the earth. Bouville could not help taking a certain personal pride in all this, for it was in part due to him that the present Pope had been elected. Indeed, it was he, Bouville, who eight or even nine years ago now, after an exhausting chase in pursuit of the cardinals, who were scattered all over the countryside between Carpentras and Orange, had discovered Cardinal Duethe given him funds for his electoral campaign, and sent his name to Paris as that of the best candidate for France. In fact, Duete, who was already the candidate of the King of Naples, had taken great care to let himself be discovered. But it is the habit of ambassadors to believe themselves solely responsible for the outcome of their missions when they are successful and Bouville, on his way to the banquet Pope John the Twenty-Second was giving in his honour, stuck out his stomach, though he imagined he was throwing out his chest, shook his white hair over his fur collar, and spoke rather loudly to his equerries as he passed through the streets of Avignon. In any case, one thing appeared to be quite settled. The Holy See would not return to Italy. There was now an end to the illusions that Clement V had prudently allowed to be entertained during his pontificate. The Roman patricians might well conspire against John the Twenty-Second, and threaten that, if he did not return to the Eternal City, they would create a schism by electing another pope who would occupy the true throne of St. Peter. The one-time Burgess of Caor had answered the Roman princes, by conferring but one hat on them among the sixteen cardinals he had created since his enthronement. All the other hats had gone to Frenchmen. You see, Monsieur Count, Pope John had said to Bouville a few days earlier, at the first audience he had granted him, speaking in that hoarsely whispering voice with which he controlled Christendom in such a masterful way. You see, Monsieur Count, one must govern with one's friends and against one's enemies. Princes who spend their time and their strength trying to win over their adversaries create only discontent among their true supporters while acquiring false friends, who are always ready to betray them. To be convinced of the Pope's intention to remain in France, it was necessary only to look at the castle he had built by incorporating the old bishop's palace, and which now dominated the town with its towers, 
battlements and machicolations. The interior was divided into spacious cloisters, reception rooms, and splendidly decorated apartments, under blue ceilings strewn with stars like the sky. There were two ushers on the first door, two on the second, five on the third, and fourteen for the other doors. The palace marshal had under his orders forty couriers and sixty-three sergeants-at-arms. This was no temporary establishment. And to discover with whom Pope John intended ruling, Bouville had merely to look at the dignitaries who came to take their places at the long table gleaming with gold and silver plate in the banqueting hall, which was hung with silk tapestries. The Cardinal Archbishop of Avignon was called Arnaud de Villa. He was the son of a sister of the Pope. The Cardinal Chancellor of the Roman Church, that is to say, the Prime Minister of Christendom, a tall, stout man, who looked well in his purple, was Gosselin Duethe, the son of Pierre Duethe, that brother of the Pope whom King Philippe V had ennobled. And then there were a nephew of the Pope, Cardinal d'Amour Fessange, and a cousin of the Pope, Cardinal Raymond Leroux. Another nephew of the Pope, Pierre de Vici, controlled the papal household and its expenses, and was in charge of the two stewards, the four cellarers, the masters of the stables, and the farriery, the six grooms of the chamber, the thirty chaplains, the sixteen confessors for visiting pilgrims, the bell-ringers, the sweepers, the water-carriers, the laundresses, the physicians, the apothecaries, and the barbers. Cardinal Bertrand de Pouget was certainly not the least of the personages present at the papal table. He was the perambulating papal legate in Italy, and it was whispered of him, but of whom were things not whispered here, that he was a natural son Jack Duethe had had, when, so far from thinking he would ever become Pope, he was not yet a prelate, chancellor to the King of Naples, nor even a doctor or a cleric and had not indeed thought of leaving his native Caor, though already past his fortieth year. All Pope John's relations, down to cousins once removed, were lodged in his palace and shared his repasts. Two of them even lived in the private entresol underneath the dining-room. They had all been given posts among the hundred noble knights, one as the dispenser of charity, another as master of the apostolic chamber, who administered all the ecclesiastical income, the annates, tithes, subsidies, death duties, and taxes from the sacred penitential. The court consisted of more than four hundred persons, and its annual expenses amounted to over four thousand florins. When, eight years earlier, the conclave at Lyon had raised to the throne of St. Peter an exhausted and fragile old man, who, so it was expected, and indeed hoped, would give up the ghost the following week, the papal treasury had been empty. But during these eight years, this little old man, who looked like a feather blown by the wind, had administered so well the church's finances had taxed so successfully the adulterers, the sodomites, and the incestuous, the thieves and the criminals, the bad priests, and the bishops guilty of violence, had sold abbeys for such good prices, and had so cleverly organized all the resources of ecclesiastical property, that he had been able to build a town and acquire the greatest income in the world. He might well afford to feed his family and govern through it. Nor was he niggardly with charity to the poor and gifts to the rich. He presented his visitors with jewels and holy medals of gold, which were furnished by his usual supplier, the Jew Boncoeur. Buried, rather than seated, in an armchair with an immensely high back, 
his feet resting on two thick cushions covered with gold silk. Pope John presided over his long table, which had something of the dual quality of a consistory and a family dinner party. Bouville, sitting on his right, watched him with fascination. How the Holy Father had changed since his election! Not in physical appearance. Time no longer had power to alter that thin, pointed face, so wrinkled and mobile, its head covered with a fur-edged skull-cap, its eyes small and mouse-like, lacking both eyelashes and eyebrows, and its extraordinarily little mouth, whose upper lip tended to disappear behind a toothless gum. John the Twenty-Second carried his eighty years more easily than many people their fifty. His hands were proof of it, smooth and the skin hardly parchmenty, the joints were still perfectly flexible. It was rather in his whole demeanour, in his tone of voice and conversation, that the transformation had taken place. This man, who had originally owed his cardinal's hat to forging a royal signature, and his tiara to two years of secret intrigue, to electoral corruption, and to a month's simulation of incurable disease, seemed to have acquired a new personality, through the mere aura of the supreme pontificate. Having started with almost nothing at all, and having reached the summit of human ambition with nothing more to desire or obtain for himself personally, all the strength and redoubtable mental machinery that had elevated him to his present position could now be employed in complete detachment for the sole good of the Church such as he conceived it to be. And what energy he expended! How many there were among those who had elected him, thinking he was on the point of death, or would allow the curia to govern in his name, who repented it now! John the Twenty-Second led them a hard life. Indeed, this little man was a great sovereign of the Church. He dealt with everything, decided everything. He had not hesitated in the previous march to excommunicate the Emperor of Germany, Ludwig of Bavaria, and at the same time to remove him from his throne, and thereby open the succession to the Holy Roman Empire, about which the King of France and the Count of Valois were so concerned. He intervened in all the differences between the princes of Christendom, reminding them as was consonant with his mission as universal pastor, of their duty to keep the peace. He had recently been considering the war in Aquitaine, and had settled, during the audiences he had given Bouville, the course he intended to pursue. The sovereigns of France and England would be asked to prolong the truce signed by the Earl of Kent at La Riole, which was due to expire in this very month of December. Monseigneur Valois would make no use of the four hundred men-at-arms, and the thousand crossbow-men King Charles IV had recently sent to him at Bergerac as reinforcements. But King Edward would be urgently invited to come and render homage to the King of France with the least possible delay. The two sovereigns would free the Gascon lords they were respectively detaining, and would show them no severity for having taken the enemy's part. Finally, the Pope intended writing to Queen Isabella to adjure her to do all she could to re-establish good relations between her husband and her brother. Pope John had no more illusions than had Bouville as to the unhappy Queen's influence. But the mere fact of the Holy Father writing to her was bound to restore her credit to some extent, and might make her enemies hesitate to ill-treat her further. And then John the Twenty-Second would suggest her coming to Paris on a mission of conciliation, there to preside over the drawing up of a treaty which would leave England only a small coastal strip of the Duchy of Aquitaine, which would include Saintes, Bordeaux, Dax, and Bayonne. Thus, the political ambitions of the Count of Valois, the machinations of Robert of Artois, 
and the secret wishes of Roger Mortimer were to receive from the Holy Father a significant impulse towards their accomplishment. Bouville, having thus fulfilled the first part of his mission with success, could devote himself to the richly and delectably spiced stewed eels with which his silver bowl had been filled. We get our eels from the Lake of Martigle, Pope John remarked to Bouville. Do you like them? Fat Bouville's mouth was so full that he could reply only by assuming an expression of delighted astonishment. The papal cuisine was luxurious, and even the Friday menus were rare feasts. Fresh tunny fish, Norwegian cod, lampreys and sturgeons, prepared in twenty different ways and accompanied by twenty different sauces, succeeded each other in dish after gleaming dish. The wine of Arbois flowed like gold into the goblets. The growths of Burgundy, the Lot or the Rhone, accompanied the cheeses. For his part, the Holy Father contented himself with nibbling with his gums at a spoonful of pike pâté and sipping at a goblet of milk. He had taken it into his head that the Pope should eat nothing but white food. Bouville had been charged by Monseigneur Valois to deal with another problem, and a more delicate one, the matter of the crusade, which seemed to have fallen somewhat into the background, for John the Twenty-Second had said no word about it during their interviews. He had, nevertheless, to make up his mind to broach it. It is a rule that ambassadors should never approach thorny questions direct, and Bouville believed he was being subtle when he said, Most Holy Father, the court of France noted with much interest the Council of Valladolid, held two years ago by your legate, at which it was decreed that priests must give up their concubine under pain if they did not do so, said Pope John in his rapid whispering voice, of being deprived after two months of a third part of the yield of their benefices and two months later of another third, and two months after that to be deprived of it all. Indeed, Monsieur Count, men are sinners even if they be priests, and we know very well that we shall not succeed in suppressing all sin. But at least those who are obstinate in wrongdoing will fill our coffers, and the money can be put to good use, and many will avoid making their scandals public. And so bishops will cease attending in person the christenings and weddings of their illegitimate children, as they are all too inclined to do. Having said this, Bouville suddenly blushed. It was perhaps not very tactful to talk of illegitimate children in the presence of the Cardinal de Pouget. He had been tactless, very tactless, but no one appeared to have noticed it. So Bouville hurried on. But, Holy Father, on what grounds is a more severe punishment decreed for priests whose concubines are not Christian? Mm, the reason is a perfectly simple one, Monsieur Count, replied Pope John. The decree is aimed at Spain, where there are many Moors, and where priests find it only too easy to acquire mistresses, for there is nothing to keep them from fornicating with the tonsured. He turned slightly in his great chair, and his thin lips parted in a brief smile. He had quickly understood to what the other was leading up by turning the conversation to the moors. And now he waited, at once mistrustful and amused, while Monsieur de Bouville drank a draught of wine to give himself courage, and assumed an expression of unconcern, before saying, It is clear, most holy father, that the Council made wise decisions which will be of the greatest use to us during the Crusade, for we shall have many priests and chaplains in our armies when they advance into Moorish territory. It would be most unfortunate if they set an example of misconduct. Bouville breathed more easily. The word Crusade had been uttered. Pope John screwed up his eyes and joined the tips of his fingers together. It would be equally unfortunate, 
he replied calmly. If a similar license should proliferate among the Christian nations while their armies are busy overseas. For it is a well-known fact, Monsieur Count, that when the armies are fighting in distant lands and the most valiant combatants have been drained from the peoples, every sort of vice flourishes in the kingdoms, as if, their strength being far away, the respect due to the laws of God had departed with it. Wars are always great occasions of sin. Is Monseigneur of Valois still as determined as ever on this crusade, with which he wishes to honour our pontificate? Well, most holy father, the emissaries from Lesser Armenia— Oh, I know, I know, said Pope John, tapping his little fingers together. It was I who sent the emissaries to Monseigneur Valois. We hear from all sources that the Moors on the coast— I know, I get the same reports as Monseigneur Valois. All conversation had ceased at the great table. Bishop Pierre de Mortemar, who was accompanying Bouville on his mission, and who it was said would be made a cardinal at the next preferment, was listening, as were all the nephews and cousins, the prelates and dignitaries. The spoons scraped the plates as silently as if they were of velvet. The Pope's whisper so singularly assured, yet so lacking in tone, was difficult to catch, and one needed to be very accustomed to it to do so at any distance. Monseigneur of Valois, for whom I have a most paternal affection, has persuaded us to consent to the tithe, but until now this tithe has been used by him merely for the purposes of acquiring Aquitaine and supporting his candidature to the Holy Roman Empire. These are most noble enterprises, but they cannot be termed crusades. I am not at all sure that I shall consent to renew the tithe next year, and still less, Monsieur Count, that I shall agree to the supplementary subsidies that are being asked of me for the expedition. Bouville took the blow hard. If that was all he could report on his return to Paris, Charles of Valois would be very angry indeed. Most holy father, he replied as coldly as he could, both the Count of Valois and King Charles imagined that you were sensible of the honour Christendom would derive. The honour of Christendom, my dear son, consists in living at peace, interrupted the Pope, lightly tapping Bouville's hand. How the holy father had changed! In the old days he had always allowed people to finish their remarks, even if he had understood what they were driving at from the first word they uttered. Now he interrupted. He was too busy to wait for matters he already knew about to be explained to him. But Bouville, who had prepared his plan of attack, went on, Is it not our duty to bring the infidel to the true faith, and to go to fight heresy among them? Heresy? Heresy, Bouville? replied Pope John in an indignant whisper. Let our first care be to extirpate the heresy flourishing among our own peoples, and be less anxious to go and lance the abscess on the face of our neighbour, when leprosy is corroding our own. Heresy is my business, and I think I understand well enough how to chastise it. My tribunals are functioning and I need the help of all my priests, as indeed I do that of all the princes of Christendom, to track it down. If the chivalry of Europe takes the road to the Orient, the devil will have a free hand in France, Spain, and Italy. For how long now have the Qatari, the Albigenses, and the Spirituals been quiet? Why have I split up the big diocese of Toulouse, which was their haunt, and created sixteen new bishoprics in the Languedoc? and the pastoral, whose bands came even as far as this but a few years ago, were they not incited by heresy? Such ills cannot be extirpated in a single generation. You have to await the sons of the grandsons to have done with it. All the prelates present could bear witness to the severity with which John the Twenty-Second persecuted heresy. If they were commanded to be easy on the minor sins of human nature, 
out of consideration for the finances. The faggots, on the other hand, flamed high when it was a question of spiritual error. Indeed, the whole of Christendom was repeating the words of the monk Bernard de Lessieux, a Franciscan, who had attacked the Dominican Inquisition, and had even had the audacity to come to preach in Avignon itself, which had earned him imprisonment for life. Even St. Peter and St. Paul themselves, he had said, could not prove their innocence of heresy if they returned to this world and were accused by the Inquisitors. But, at the same time, the Holy Father could not help advocating certain strange ideas, the offspring of his lively intelligence, which, emitted from the summit of the pontifical throne, created a considerable stir among the doctors of the theological faculties. He had, for instance, pronounced against the immaculate conception of the Virgin Mary, which was not, of course, a dogma, but of which the principle was generally admitted. The most he would concede was that the Lord had purified the Virgin before her birth, but at a moment which, so he declared, was difficult to determine precisely. On the other hand, he would admit of no doubt concerning her assumption. Moreover, John the Twenty-Second did not believe in the beatific vision, in any case until the day of the last judgment, and thereby denied there could, as yet, be a single soul in paradise, or, consequently, in hell. For many theologians, such theses exhaled at least the ghost of an odour of sulphur. But, sitting at this very table, was a tall Cistercian named Jacques Fournier, the son of a baker of Foix in Ariège, one time abbot of Fontfroide, and bishop of Parmier, who was known as the White Cardinal because of the colour of his habit, and who, singled out by the Pope to become his closest confidant, employed all the resources of his talent for apologetics to support and justify the Holy Father's more daring propositions. The Pope went on. Don't worry too much, Monsieur Count, about the heresy of the Moors. Protect our coasts against their ships by all means, but leave them to the judgment of Almighty God. For, after all, they too are his creatures, and no doubt he has some design concerning them. Can any of us know what fate is in store for souls that have never been touched by the grace of the revelation? Uh, I presume they go to hell, said Bouville ingenuously. Uh, hell, <laughs> hell, <laughs> the frail pope whispered, shrugging his shoulders. Uh, do not talk of things concerning which you know nothing. Moreover, uh, don't tell me, for we're much too old friends, Bull, that it is for the salvation of the infidel Monseigneur Valois is asking for twelve hundred thousand livres of subsidy from my treasury, of which three hundred thousand are for himself. In any case, I very well know that the Count of Valois no longer has any great enthusiasm for his crusade. To be honest, most holy father, said Bouville, hesitating a little, without, of course, being as well informed as you are, it seems to me, nevertheless, that— Oh, what a very unskilful ambassador, thought Pope John. If I were in his place, I'd allow it to be believed that Valois had already assembled his banners, and I'd stand out for no less than three hundred thousand livres. When he had let Bouville flounder long enough, he said, Tell Monseigneur of Valois that the Holy Father renounces the crusade, and, knowing that Monseigneur is a most obedient son and a most excellent Christian, he will obey for the good of Holy Church herself. Bouville was very unhappy indeed. It was true that everyone was inclined to give up the crusade, but not quite like this in a couple of words, without discussion. "'I have no doubt, Most Holy Father,' Bouville replied, "'that Monseigneur of Valois will obey you. "'But he has already personally assumed very great liabilities.' 
How much does Monseigneur Valois require not to suffer too much from these liabilities he has assumed? I do not know, Most Holy Father, said Bouville, blushing pink. Monseigneur of Valois has given me no instruction in the matter. Oh, yes, indeed, I know him well enough to be sure he foresaw this. How much? He has already advanced a great sum to the knights of his own fiefs so that they might equip their banners. How much? He has been experimenting with this new gunpowder artillery. How much, Bouville? He has signed very considerable orders for weapons of all kinds. I'm no soldier, monsieur, and I'm not asking you for the number of crossbows. I merely want to know what figure Monseigneur Valois requires as compensation. But he was amused to see Bouville in such difficulties, and Bouville himself could not help smiling to see all his stratagems pierced like a sieve. There was no doubt he would have to give the figure. Whispering as softly as the Pope himself, he murmured, One hundred thousand livres. John the twenty-second shook his head and said, <sighs> That is no more than Count Charles' customary and unreasonable demand. I seem to remember that, on a certain occasion, the Florentines had to pay him even more to free themselves of the help he had brought them. It cost the Sienese a little less to persuade him to consent to leave their city, and on another occasion the King of Anjou had to disgorge a very similar sum in gratitude for assistance for which he had never asked. It's a method of financing oneself as good as another, no doubt. Do you know, Bouville, your Valois is no more than a bandit. Ah, very well, take him back the good news. We'll give him his hundred thousand livres, together with our apostolic blessing. On the whole, the Pope was glad to get out of it at the price, and Bouville was delighted that his mission was so suddenly accomplished. To have to bargain with the sovereign pontiff as if he were a Lombard merchant would have been really too painful. But the Holy Father made gestures of this kind, which were not perhaps precisely those of generosity, but rather a sound estimate of the price he must pay for power. Do you remember, Monsieur Count, went on the Pope, the time you brought me five thousand livres from the Count of Valois to this very town? to assure the election of a French cardinal by the conclave. Indeed, that was money invested at a high rate of interest. Bouville was always sentimental about the past. He remembered the misty field in the country to the north of Avignon, near Ponte, and the curious conversation they had had sitting together on a low wall. Yes, I, I remember, Most Holy Father, he said. Do you know that... When I saw you approaching, never having seen you before, I thought I had been deceived, and that you were no cardinal, but merely a very young priest, whom some prelate had disguised to send in his place. The compliment made Pope John smile. He, too, remembered well. And that young Italian? he asked. That little Sienese who worked in a bank and was with you at the time? The boy whom you later sent me at Lyon, where he served me so well during the conclave. Young Guccio Baglioni. What's happened to him? I have always thought I'd see him again. He's the only one who ever did me a service in the past, who's not come forward to ask me some favour or preferment. I don't know, Most Holy Father. I really don't know. He went back to his native Italy... I have had no news of him either. But Bouville looked a little flustered as he answered, and the Pope noticed it. If I remember correctly, there was some unfortunate business about a marriage, or a false marriage, with the daughter of the nobility, whom he had made a mother. Her brothers were persecuting him. Wasn't that it? Indeed, the Holy Father remembered it all very well. What a memory he had! I'm really very surprised, went on Pope John, that being a protégé both of yours and mine, 
as well as being professionally engaged in finance, he has not profited by the circumstances to make his fortune. He begot child. Was it born? Did it live? Yes, yes, it, it was born, Bouville said hastily. It's living somewhere in the country with its mother. He was looking more and more embarrassed. Someone told me, now who was it, went on the Pope, that the girl was wet nurse to the little posthumous king born to Madame Clemence of Hungary during the regency of the Count of Poitiers. Is that right? Yes, indeed, most holy father. I believe that was the girl. The thousands of tiny wrinkles that furrowed the Pope's face seemed to quiver. What do you mean, you believe it? Were you not curator of Madame Clemence's stock? And beside her when she had the misfortune to lose her son? You really should know who the wet nurse was? Bouville had turned purple. He should have been more careful, and realized that, when the Holy Father mentioned the name of Guccio Baglioni, there was an underlying intention behind it, and a rather cleverer one than when he himself had mentioned the Council of Valladolid and the Moors of Spain, in order to broach the question of the Crusade. In the first place, the Holy Father must certainly have news of Guccio, since the Ptolemy of Siena were one of his bankers. The Pope's little grey eyes never left those of Bouville, and the questioning went on. Madame Mao of Artois was involved in a trial, was she not? And you must have been a witness. What was the real truth of that affair, my dear Messie Count? Uh, oh, nothing more than what the court brought to light, most holy father. Mere spiteful gossip, of which Madame Mao wished to clear herself. The repast had come to an end, and the noble pages, handing around the ewers and basins, were pouring water over the diner's fingers. Two noble knights came forward to pull the Pope's chair back. Monsieur Count, he said, it has been a great joy to me to see you once more. I do not know, in view of my great age, whether this joy will be accorded me again. Bouville, who had risen to his feet, breathed more easily. The moment to say goodbye seemed to have arrived, and there would be an end to the interrogation. But, went on the Pope, before you leave, I would like to grant you the greatest favour that it lies in my power to give a Christian. I shall hear your confession myself. Come with me to my room. Chapter 2 The Holy Father's Penance Sins of the flesh? Oh, naturally, since you're a man. Sins of gluttony? One has only to look at you. You're fat. Sins of pride? Hmm? You're a great lord, but your very position obliges you to be attentive to your devotions, so you confess all these sins, which are the common basis of human nature, and are regularly absolved of them before you approach the holy table. It was a strange confession in which the vicar of Christ both asked the questions and answered them. From time to time his whispering voice was drowned by the cries of birds, for the Pope kept a chained parrot in his room, and there were parakeets, canaries, and those little red birds from the islands called cardinals fluttering about in an aviary. The floor of the room was of painted squares, on which had been laid Spanish rugs. The walls and the chairs were covered in green. The bed hangings and the curtains at the windows were of green linen and against this leafy, woodland colour the birds showed up bright as flowers. In a corner was a bathroom with a marble bath. Next door was the wardrobe, where huge cupboards contained white habits, red capes and embroidered robes, and beyond that again was the study. As Fat Bouville entered the room he had made to kneel, but the Holy Father had put him into one of the green chairs near himself. 
Indeed, no penitent could have been treated with greater consideration. Philip the Fair's ex-Chamberlain was at once surprised and relieved, for, great dignitary that he was, he had feared having to make a real confession, and to the sovereign pontiff, of all the dust, the dross, the mean desires, and the nasty actions of a life, of all the dregs that fall to the bottom of the soul through the days and the years. But the Holy Father seemed to consider these kind of sins to be trifles, or, at least, to be within the competence of humbler priests than himself. But on leaving the table, Bouville had not noticed the glances exchanged between Cardinal Gosselin d'Uethe, Cardinal de Pouget, and Jacques Fournier, the white cardinal. They were well acquainted with this particular stratagem of Pope John, the postprandial confession, which he used so as to be able to talk in real privacy to an important guest, and by which he gained knowledge of many state secrets. Who could resist this sudden offer, as flattering as it was terrifying? Everything, surprise, religious awe, and the beginnings of the digestive process was calculated to break down intellectual resistance. All that matters, went on the Pope, is that a man should have behaved well in that particular station to which God has called him in this world. And it is in this matter that his sins are visited on him most severely. You, my son, have been chamberlain to a king and entrusted with the most important missions under three others. Have you always been truly conscientious in the performance of your duties and responsibilities? I think, Father, most holy Father, I mean, that I have performed my tasks with zeal, and have been, to the best of my ability, a loyal servant to my suzerains. He broke off, realizing suddenly that he was hardly there to utter his own eulogy. Changing his tone, he went on. I must accuse myself of having failed in certain missions in which I might have succeeded. The fact is, most holy father, I have not always been clever enough, and I have sometimes realized, only when it was too late, that I have made mistakes. It is no sin to be a little slow-witted. It can happen to us all and, indeed, is the precise opposite of malice prepense. But have you committed, on the occasion of your missions, or because of your missions, such grave sins as homicide or bearing false witness? Bouville shook his head in denial. But the little grey eyes, lacking both eyelashes and eyebrows, gazed luminously and fixedly at Bouville out of that wrinkled face. Are you quite certain? Here, my dear son, is the opportunity for the complete purification of your soul. You have never borne false witness? Never? asked the Pope. Again Bouville felt ill at ease. What lay behind this persistence? The parrot uttered a raucous cry from its perch, and Bouville started. Indeed, most holy father, there is one thing weighing on my mind, though I do not really know whether it is a sin, nor which sin's name to give it. I have not myself committed homicide, I swear it, but I was unable once to prevent it and afterwards I was compelled to bear false witness. But I could not act otherwise. Tell me about it, Bouille, said the Pope. But it was now the Pope's turn to adopt a more suitable tone. Confess to me this secret that weighs on you so much, my dear son. It certainly does weigh on me, Bouville said and even more so since the death of my dear wife Marguerite, with whom I shared it. I often think that, should I die, without having entrusted it to anyone, tears suddenly sprang to his eyes. 
Why well, have I never thought of confiding it to you before, most holy father? As I was saying, I, I am often slow-witted. It was after the death of King Louis X, the eldest son of my master, Philip the Fair. Bouville glanced at the Pope, and already felt comforted. At last he was going to be able to discharge his conscience of the burden it had borne for eight years. It had undoubtedly been the worst moment of his life, and remorse still lay heavily on his mind. Of course he must confess the whole thing to the Pope. And now Bouville began to talk more easily. He recounted how, having been appointed the curator of Queen Clemence's stomach after the death of her husband, Louis Houtin, he had feared that the Countess Maou of Artois would make an attempt on the lives both of the Queen and the child she was carrying. It was at the time when Monseigneur Philippe of Poitiers, the late King's brother, was manoeuvring for the Regency against the Count of Valois and the Duke of Burgundy. At the recollection, John the Twenty-Second raised his eyes to the painted beams of the ceiling, and his thin face looked thoughtful for a moment. For it was he himself who had announced the death of his brother to Philippe of Poitiers, having learned it from the young Lombard Baglione. Oh, the Count of Poitiers had managed things very well, both with regard to the conclave and the regency. It had all been arranged that June morning in 1316 at Lyon, in the house of Consul Varey. So Bouville had feared that the Countess of Artois would commit a crime, another crime, since it was common gossip that she had murdered Louis Houtin by poison. And she had every reason to hate him, moreover, for he had just confiscated her county. But she had also had very good reason, after his death, to wish for the success of the Count of Poitiers, for she was his mother-in-law. If he became king, she was certain of holding her possessions. The one obstacle in her way was the child the queen was carrying. The child who was born and was a male. Unhappy Queen Clemence, said the Pope. Maou of Artois had arranged to be appointed godmother. In this capacity it was her duty to carry the new little king to the ceremony of presentation to the barons. Bouville had been certain, as had Madame de Bouville, that if the terrible Maou intended committing a crime, she would do so without hesitation during the ceremony, for it was the only occasion she would have of carrying the child in her arms. Bouville and his wife had therefore decided to hide the royal infant during those hours and to substitute for him the wet-nurse's son, who was but a few days older. Under the state's swaddling clothes no one would notice the substitution, for no one had as yet seen Queen Clemence's child, not even herself, for she was suffering from a serious fever and almost at the point of death. And indeed, said Bouville, Countess Mao smeared poison over the child's mouth and nose after I had handed him to her, and he died in convulsions in the presence of the barons. It was this innocent little creature I delivered over to death, and the crime was accomplished so smoothly and so quickly, and I was so perturbed that it never occurred to me to cry out at once and in public, This is a lie! And then it was too late. How could I explain? The Pope was leaning forward a little, his hands clasped over his robe, losing not a word of the story. What happened to the other child? The little king? Will. What did you do with him? He's alive, most holy father. He is alive. My late wife and I confided him to the wet nurse, and indeed we had considerable difficulty. The unfortunate woman hated us both, as you can well imagine, and was groaning in her anguish. 
With mingled threats and appeals, we made her swear on the gospel to look after the little king as if he were her own child, and never to reveal what had happened to anyone at all, even in the confessional. Oh, oh, murmured the Holy Father. And so little King John, the real king of France, is being brought up in a manner in the Ile de France, without his or anyone else's knowing who he really is, apart from the woman who passes for his mother and myself. And uh, who is this woman? She is Marie de Cresset, the woman the young Lombard, Guccio Baglioni, was in love with. Everything was now clear to the Holy Father. And does Baglioni know nothing about it? Nothing, I'm sure of it, Most Holy Father. For the Cresse woman refused ever to see him again, as we had ordered her, so as to keep her oath. Besides, it all happened very quickly, and the boy set out at once for Italy. He thinks his son is still alive. He gets news of him from time to time, through his uncle, the banker Ptolemy. But why, Bouvier, since you had proof of the crime, and it should have been easy enough to bring it home to her, did you not denounce the Countess Mo? When I think added Pope John, that she was sending her Chancellor to me at the very time to try to persuade me to support her cause against her nephew Robert. It suddenly occurred to the Pope that Robert of Artois, the rowdy giant, the sower of discord, the assassin even, for it seemed more than likely he had had a hand in the murder of Marguerite of Burgundy at Chateau Gaillard, Robert of Artois, the great baron of France, the black sheep, was nevertheless more worthy, perhaps, when all was said and done, than his cruel aunt, and that he possibly had some right on his side in his fight against her. What a world of wolves these sovereign courts were! It was the same in every kingdom. And was it to govern to pacify, and to direct this sort of flock, that God had inspired him, a poor little Burgess of Cahors, with the great ambition of attaining to the tiara, which indeed he now wore, and sometimes felt to be a trifle heavy. I kept silent, most holy father, Bouville went on, largely on the advice of my late wife, as I had let the opportune moment of confounding the murderess go by. My late wife pointed out with some truth that, if we revealed what had happened, Mao would turn furiously on the little king and on us too. Therefore, if we wanted to save him, and ourselves as well, we had to let her believe her crime had been successful. I therefore took the wet nurse's child to the Abbey of Saint-Denis, that he might be buried among the kings. The Pope was thinking. Therefore, the accusations made against Madame Maou in the lawsuit that took place the next year were well founded? he asked. Indeed they were, most holy father. Indeed they were. Monseigneur Robert was able, through his cousin, Messire Jean de Fienne, to lay his hands on a poisoner, a sorceress named Isabelle de Ferrienne, who had given to a lady-in-waiting of Countess Maou the poison she used to kill first King Louis, then the child who was presented to the barons. This Isabelle de Ferrienne, together with her Saint Jean, was brought to Paris to give evidence against Mao. You can imagine how this suited Monseigneur Robert's book. Their depositions were taken, and it clearly appeared that they had supplied the Countess, for they had previously given her the filter by which she boasted of having reconciled her daughter Jeanne to her son-in-law, the Count of Poitiers. Magic and sorcery? 
You could have had the Countess burnt, whispered the Pope. But not at that time, most holy father, not at that time. For the Count of Poitiers had become king and was giving Madame Maou such protection that, in my heart of hearts, I am sure he had been her accomplice, at least in the second crime. The Pope's narrow face seemed to crumple even more beneath his furred skullcap. These last words had pained him, for he had been fond of King Philippe V, to whom he owed his tiara, and with whom he had always been in perfect accord over all state matters. But God's punishment fell on them both, Bouville went on, for within a year they had both lost their sole male heir. The Countess's only son died at the age of seventeen, and young King Philippe lost his at only a few months old, and he never had another. But the Countess put up a clever defence against the accusations brought against her. She pleaded the irregularity of the procedure before Parliament, and the disqualification of her accusers, for she maintained her rank as a peer of France rendered her liable to be tried only by the Chamber of Barons. However, to establish her innocence, so she said, she besought her son-in-law, it was a fine scene of public hypocrisy, to have the inquiry continued so as to give her the opportunity of confounding her enemies. The Ferien sorceress and her son were heard again, but after being put to the question, they were in no very good state and were covered in blood. They retracted completely, declared that their earlier accusations were lies, and maintained that they had been persuaded to bring them by favours, prayers, promises, and also by violence to their persons, instigated, according to the records of the clerk of the court, by a person whose name should not at present be mentioned, which was equivalent to naming Monseigneur Robert of Artois. Then King Philippe the Long sat in the seat of justice himself, and made all his family and relations and all the intimates of his late brother appear before him. The Count of Valois, the Count of Evreux, Monseigneur of Bourbon, Monseigneur Gaucher, the constable, Monseigneur de Beaumont, the master of the household, and Queen Clemence herself, asking them on their oath whether they knew or believed that King Louis and his son Jean had died any but a natural death. Since no proof could be produced, the hearing was being held in public, and the Countess Maou was sitting beside the King, everyone declared, though in many cases against their private convictions, that these deaths had been due to natural causes. But, uh, no doubt, you were summoned to appear yourself. Fat Bouville hung his head. I bore false witness, most holy father, he said. But what else could I do when the whole court, the peers, the king's uncles, the privy servants, and the widowed queen herself all certified Madame Maou's innocence on oath. I should then have been accused of lying and perjury, and I should have been sent to swing at Montfaucon. He seemed so unhappy, so cast down, so sad, that one could suddenly see in that plump and fleshy face the features of the little boy he had been half a century before. The Pope was moved to compassion. Oh, calm yourself, Bouville, he said, leaning towards him and putting his hand on his shoulder. Uh, don't reproach yourself with having done wrong. God set you a problem that was a little heavy for you. I will take your secret on myself. Only the future can tell whether you did the right thing. You wanted to save a life that had been confided to you as part of the responsibilities of your position, and you saved it. You might have endangered many other lives had you spoken. 
Oh, most holy father, indeed, I feel much calmer now, said the ex-chamberlain. But what will happen to the little hidden king? What should be done about him? Wait and do nothing. I'll think about it and let you know. Go in peace, Bouvry. As for Monseigneur Valois, well, he can have his hundred thousand livres, but not a florin more. And let him stop bothering me about his crusade and come to an agreement with England. Bouville knelt, raised the Pope's hand effusively to his lips, got to his feet, and backed towards the door, since it appeared the audience was over. The Pope recalled him with a gesture. Bouville, what about your absolution? Don't you want it? A moment later, Pope John was alone and walking up and down his study with little tripping steps. The wind from the Rhone was blowing under the doors and wailing through the fine new palace. The parakeets were chirping in the aviary. The embers in the brazier in the corner of the room had turned dull. John the Twenty-Second was confronted with one of the most difficult problems he had known since his election. The real King of France was an unknown child, hidden away in the courtyard of a manor. Only two people in the world, or three now, knew of it. Fear prevented the two first from talking, and now that he himself knew, what was he to do about it, when two kings had already succeeded to the throne of France? Two kings duly crowned and anointed with the holy oil, though they were in fact nothing but usurpers. Oh, yes, indeed, it was a grave matter, nearly as grave as the excommunication of the Emperor of Germany. What should he do? Reveal the whole affair? It would throw France, and, in her wake, a great part of Europe into the most appalling dynastic turmoil. Once again, here were the seeds of war. There was also another consideration that decided him to keep silent, and it had to do with the memory of King Philippe the Long. Yes, John the Twenty-Second had been very fond of that young man, and had helped him as much as he could. Indeed, he had been the only sovereign he had ever admired, or to whom he was grateful. To tarnish his memory was to tarnish John the Twenty-Second at the same time, for without Philip the Long would he ever have become Pope. And now dear Philip was revealed to have been a criminal, or at least the accomplice of a criminal. But was it for Pope John? for Jacques Duethe to throw the first stone. Did he not owe both his hat and his tiara to the grossest frauds? And suppose, to assure his election, he had had to allow a murder to be committed. Lord, oh Lord, I thank thee for having spared me that temptation. But am I worthy of being charged with the care of thy creatures? And suppose the wet nurse talked one day, what would happen then? Could one ever trust a woman's tongue? Lord, it would be merciful if thou wouldst sometimes enlighten me. I have given Bouville absolution, but the penance is for me. He collapsed onto the green cushion of his prie dieu and remained there a long time his face hidden in his hands. Chapter 3 The Road to Paris How the French roads rang out clear beneath the horse's hooves! What happy music the crunching gravel made! And the air she was breathing, the soft, sunlit morning air, how wonderfully scented it was! What a marvellous savour it had! The buds were beginning to open, and little, tender, green, crinkled leaves stretched out across the road to caress the traveller's brows. 
No doubt the grass of the banks and fields of the Ile de France was not so thick or rich as English grass. But for Queen Isabella it was the grass of freedom, and indeed of hope. Her white mare's mane swung to the rhythm of its paces. A litter, carried by two mules, was following a few yards behind. But the Queen was too happy and too impatient to tolerate being enclosed in such a conveyance. She preferred to ride her hack and to set a faster pace. She would have liked to jump the hedge and gallop away across the grass. Boulogne, where she had been married fifteen years earlier in the church of Notre-Dame, Montreuil, Abbeville, and Beauvais had formed the stages of her journey. She had spent the preceding night at Maubisson, near Pontoir, in the royal manor where she had seen her father, Philip the Fair, for the last time. Her journey had been almost a pilgrimage through the past. It was as if she were journeying back through the stages of her life, as if fifteen years were being abolished so that she could make a new start. "'Your brother Charles would no doubt have taken her back,' Robert of Artois was saying as he rode beside Isabella, "'and he would have imposed her on us as queen. So much did he regret her, and so little could he make up his mind to find a new wife.' Of whom was Robert talking? Oh, yes, of Blanche of Burgundy. Her memory had been evoked by Maubisson, where, a little while ago, a cavalcade consisting of Henri de Sully, Jean de Roy, the Earl of Kent, Roger Mortimer, and Robert of Artois himself, together with a whole company of lords, had come to greet the traveller. Isabella had felt considerable pleasure at being treated like a queen again. "'I really believe Charles derived a secret pleasure from contemplating the horns of cuckledom she set on his brow,' Robert went on. Unfortunately, or rather fortunately, the sweet Blanche, a year before Charles became king, got herself pregnant in prison by her jailer. Those daughters of Mao are such damned hot pieces they'd set a bundle of tow on fire at five yards. The giant was riding on the queen's left, on the sunny side, and was mounted on a huge dappled percheron. He cast his shadow over the queen. She was urging her hack forward, trying to keep in the sun. Robert talked and talked, delighted to have met her again, giving rein to his naturally trivial nature, and trying, at the same time, during these first leagues, to renew the links of cousinship and old friendship. Isabella had not seen him for eleven years, she found him less changed than she had expected. His voice was still the same, and so was that odour of a great eater of venison, which his body emitted in the heat of the march, and the breeze blew in gusts about him. His hands were red and hairy to the nails, his expression malicious even when he tried to make it amiable, and his paunch bulged over his belt as if he'd swallowed a bell but the assurance of his speech and gestures was less feigned than it had been, for it had now become part of his nature. The lines that framed his mouth were cut deeper in the fat. And Mao, my bitch of an aunt, has had to resign herself to the annulment of her daughter's marriage. Uh, not without a struggle, and bearing false witness before the bishops. But she was finally confounded. For once, Cousin Charles was obstinate, because of the business with the jailer and the pregnancy. And once that weak-kneed creature sticks his toes in about something, you can't move him. There were any number of questions asked during the annulment case. They even salvaged from its dust the dispensation, granted by Clement V, allowing Charles to marry a relation, but without specifying a name. But what member of our family's ever married anyone but a cousin or a niece? So, then, Monseigneur Jean de Marigny most cleverly turned to the question of a spiritual relationship. Was not Mao Charles's godmother? Of course she denied it, 
and said she had attended the baptism only as an assistant and unofficial godmother. Then everyone, barons, stewards, valets, priests, choristers, and townsmen of Crea, where the baptism took place, gave evidence that she had held the child to hand it to Charles of Valois, and that no mistake was possible, in view of the fact that she was the tallest woman in the chapel, indeed taller by a head than anyone else. What a liar she is! Isabella compelled herself to listen, but her attention was really focused on herself, and on a curious contact which, a little while before, had moved her. How surprising a man's hair felt when it was suddenly brought in touch with your fingers. The Queen glanced up at Roger Mortimer, who had placed himself on her right with a sort of natural authority, as if he were her protector and guardian. She looked at the thick curls emerging from under his black hat. You would never have thought his hair could be so silky to the touch. It had happened by chance at the very first moment of their meeting. Isabella had been surprised to see Mortimer appear beside the Earl of Kent. So in France the rebel, fugitive and outlaw, for Edward had, of course, deprived him of all his rights, titles, and property, rode beside the King of England's brother, and seemed even to take precedence over him. The members of the English escort had looked at each other in astonishment, and Mortimer had jumped from his horse and hurried over to the Queen to kiss the hem of her dress. But the hack had moved, and Roger's lips had lightly touched Isabella's knee, while she had mechanically put out her hand and rested it on the bare head of the friend she had regained. And now, as they rode along the road, its surface striped with the shadows of the branches overhead, the silky contact of his hair was still with her, as perceptible as if it were enclosed within her velvet glove. But the most serious grounds for pronouncing the marriage annulled besides the fact that the contracting parties were not of canon age for copulating, nor indeed physically capable of doing so, were discovered in the fact that your brother Charles, when he was married, lacked the discernment to select a wife suited to his rank, or the ability to express a preference, in view of the fact that he was incapable, simple and imbecile, and that the contract was subsequently invalid. In habilis simplex et imbecilis, and every one from your uncle Valois to the last chambermaid were at one in agreeing that he was all that, and the best proof of it was that the late queen his mother had herself thought of him so stupid that she'd nicknamed him the goose. Yeah, forgive me, cousin, for talking of your brother like this, but after all, he's the king we've got over us. A pleasant companion, however, in other respects, and with a handsome face, but with not much spirit about him. You'll realize that one has to govern in his stead, and that you mustn't expect too much of him. From Isabella's left came Robert of Artois' inexhaustible voice, and his wild beast odor. From her right, Isabella felt Roger Mortimer's eyes resting on her with a disturbing persistence. From time to time she looked up at his flint-coloured eyes, his clean-cut features, and the deep cleft in his chin, at his tall, shapely figure sitting so erect in the saddle. She was surprised she had no memory of the white scar marking his lower lip. "'Are you still as chaste as ever, my fair cousin?' Robert of Artois suddenly asked her. Queen Isabella blushed, and raised her eyes furtively to Roger Mortimer, as if the question had already made her, in some inexplicable way, feel a little guilty towards him. Indeed, I've been forced to be, she replied. Do you remember our interview in London, cousin? She blushed deeper still. Of what was he reminding her, and what would Mortimer think? It had been nothing but a moment of forlornness when saying good-bye. There had not even been so much as a kiss, 
she had merely leaned her forehead against a man's chest in search of refuge. Did Robert still remember it after eleven years? She felt flattered, but not in the least moved. Had he mistaken what had been but a moment of dismay for an avowal of love? Yet, perhaps, on that day, but on that day only, had she not been queen, and had he not been in such a hurry to leave in order to denounce the Burgundy girls? Well, if you do take it into your head to change your habits, said Robert gallantly, whenever I think of you, I always have the feeling of a debt I've never collected. He broke off suddenly, having met Mortimer's eyes, and seen in them the glance of a man ready to draw his sword if he heard another word. The Queen saw the challenge, and, to keep herself in countenance, stroked the white mane of her mare. Dear Mortimer, how noble and chivalrous he was! And how good it was to breathe the air of France! And how pretty the road was! with its alternating sunlight and shade. There was an ironical half-smile on Robert of Artois's fat cheeks. As for the debt, he had thought the expression delicate enough. He must think no more of it. He felt sure that Mortimer loved Queen Isabella, and that Isabella loved Mortimer. Other people are generally aware of our love before we realize it ourselves. Ah, well, he thought, my good cousin will amuse herself with this Knight Templar. Chapter 4 King Charles It had taken about a quarter of an hour to cross the town from the gates to the palace of the city. There were tears in Queen Isabella's eyes when she set foot in the courtyard of that palace she had seen her father build, and which had already begun to acquire something of the patina of time. The black stains on the stone where the gutters emptied had not been there when Isabella had set out from this very place to become queen. The doors were thrown open at the top of the grand staircase, and Isabella couldn't help expecting to see the imposing, icy, sovereign features of King Philip the Fair. How often in the past she had gazed at her father standing at the top of these very stairs, preparing to go down into his city. The young man who now appeared, wearing a short tunic, his well-turned legs in neat white hose, followed by his chamberlains, much resembled the great dead monarch in figure and feature, but his person radiated neither strength nor majesty. He was but a pale copy, a plaster cast taken from an effigy. And yet, because the shade of the Iron King stood behind this spiritless personage, because the crowd of France was incarnate in him, as well as the headship of the family, Isabella tried three or four times to kneel to him, and each time her brother took her by the hand, raised her, and said, Welcome, sweet sister, welcome. Having forced her to rise, and still holding her by the hand, he led her through the galleries to the large private apartment, where he normally sat, asking the Queen for news of her journey. Had she been properly received at Boulogne by the captain of the town? He sent to make sure that the chamberlains were attending to the luggage, warning them not to drop the chests. Because the cloth crumples, he explained, and I noticed on my last journey to Languedoc what a state my robes had got into. Was he trying to hide his emotion or his embarrassment by fussing over such things? When they had sat down, Charles the Fair said, Well, and how are things with you, my dear sister? Poorly, brother, she replied. And what's the reason for your journey? Isabella could not help looking painfully surprised. Did her brother really not know what was going on? Robert of Artois, who had entered the palace with the leaders of the escort, making his spurs ring on the flagstones as if he were at home, 
gave Isabella a look which implied, What did I tell you? Brother, I've come to negotiate a treaty with you, which must be ratified if our two kingdoms are to stop harming one another. Charles Lefer looked thoughtful for a moment, as if he were taking time to reflect. In fact, he was thinking of nothing in particular. As during the audiences he had granted Mortimer, or indeed anyone else for that matter, he asked questions and paid no attention to the answers. The treaty, he said at last. Yes, I'm prepared to receive homage from your husband, Edward. You'll discuss it with our Uncle Charles, to whom I've given authority to deal with the matter. Were you seasick? Do you know, I've never been on the sea. It has always seemed to me a most impressive expanse of water. They had to wait till he had uttered a few more trivialities of this order before they could present the Bishop of Norwich, who was to conduct the negotiations, and Lord de Cromwell, who commanded the English escort. He greeted them with courtesy, but clearly would never remember who they were. Charles IV was doubtless little stupider than thousands of men of his age in the kingdom, who harrowed their fields the wrong way, broke the shuttles of their looms, or perpetrated errors in their accounts when selling wax and tallow. What was so unfortunate was that he was the king, and had so very few of the right qualities. I have also come, brother, said Isabella, to request your help, and to place myself under your protection, for all my possessions have been taken from me, even the county of Cornwall, which was settled on me by England in my marriage contract. You will explain your grievances to our Uncle Charles. He is a wise counsellor, and I shall approve anything he decides for your advantage, sister. I'll take you to your rooms. Charles the Fourth left the assembly to show his sister the apartments that had been set aside for her, a suite of five rooms with a private staircase. For the ordinary comings and goings of your household, he thought it proper to explain. He drew her attention to the fact that the furniture had been refurbished, that he had placed various objects in the rooms that had belonged to their parents, in particular a reliquary which their mother, Queen Jeanne of Navarre, had always kept by her bed. It contained a tooth of Saint Louis in a sort of miniature cathedral of silver gilt. The figured tapestries with which the walls were hung were new, and he drew her attention to them. He showed all the cares of a good housewife. He fingered the material of the counterpane, and besought his sister not to hesitate to ask for all the embers she might need to warm her bed. No one could have been more attentive or more affable. As for the lodgings of your suite, Monsieur de Mortimer will arrange matters with my chamberlains. I want everyone to be comfortable. He had uttered Mortimer's name without any particular intention, merely because, when English affairs were in question, his name was frequently mentioned to him. It seemed to him, therefore, quite natural that Mortimer should be in charge of the Queen of England's household. He had quite clearly forgotten that the King of England was asking for his head. He went on with his tour of the apartments, straightening the fold of a hanging here, checking the inside fastening of a shutter there. And then, suddenly coming to a halt, he leaned forward, clasped his hands behind his back, and said, We've not been very happy in our marriages, sister. I had hoped to be better served by God in the person of my dear Marie of Luxembourg than I was with Blanche. From the brief glance he gave her, Isabella realized he still felt a vague resentment at the part she had played in bringing to light the misconduct of his first wife. And then death took Marie from me, together with the heir to the throne she was about to bring into the world. After that they made me marry our cousin of Evreux, whom you will see presently. She is an amiable wife who loves me well, I think. But we were married in July last and now we're in March, 
and she shows no sign of being pregnant. I must talk to you of matters which one can only mention to a sister. Even with that wicked husband of yours, who has no liking for your sex, you have nevertheless had four children, whereas I, with my three wives... And yet, I assure you, I perform my conjugal duties most frequently, and take pleasure in them. What then, sister? Do you believe in this curse my people say hangs over our race and our house? Isabella looked sadly at him. He had suddenly become rather touching as he voiced the troubles that weighed on his mind and were, no doubt, his constant anxiety. But the most humble gardener would not have expressed himself differently when complaining of his misfortunes or the barrenness of his wife. What did this poor king want? An heir to his throne, or a child in his house? And, similarly, what was there royal about Jean of Evreux, who came to greet Isabella a few moments later? Her face was rather weak, and her expression docile. It was clear that she was humbly aware of her status as third wife that she had been selected from among the nearest relations, merely because France needed a queen, and the courts of Europe seemed reluctant to provide one. She was sad. She constantly watched her husband's face for signs of that obsession she knew so well, which, no doubt, was the sole subject of their nocturnal conversations. Isabella found the real king in Charles of Valois. He hurried to the palace as soon as he had heard that his niece had arrived, clasped her in his arms, and kissed her on both cheeks. Isabella realized at once that it was in those arms the real power resided, and nowhere else. Supper did not last long. Gathered about the sovereigns were the Counts of Valois, Artois, and their wives, the Earl of Kent, the Bishop of Norwich, and Roger Mortimer. King Charles the Fair liked to go to bed early. The English all met afterwards to confer in Queen Isabella's apartment. When they eventually left, Mortimer was the last at the door. Isabella detained him. For merely a moment, so she said, she had a message to give him. Chapter 5 The Cross of Blood they were unconscious of the passing of time. The liqueur wine, scented with rosemary, roses, and pomegranate, had sunk more than halfway down the crystal flask. The fire had burnt low in the hearth. They had not even heard the cries of the night watchman, which arose hour by hour in the distance throughout the night. They could not stop talking particularly the Queen, who, for the first time in many years, had no need to fear that a spy was concealed behind the arras to report every word she uttered. She could not have said whether she had ever confided so freely in anyone before. She had forgotten even the memory of freedom. And she could not remember ever having talked to a man who listened with so much interest replied so intelligently, and gave her such generous attention. They had days and days before them in which to talk, and yet they could not make up their minds to stop and part till tomorrow. Theirs was an orgy of confidences. They had so much to discuss. The state of the kingdoms, the treaty of peace, the Pope's letters, their common enemies— and Mortimer recounted his imprisonment, escape, and exile, and the Queen told him of her harassments and of the latest outrages the dispensers had inflicted on her. Isabella intended remaining in France till Edward came in person to render homage. This was the advice Orleton had given her at a secret interview between London and Dover. "'You cannot return to England, madame,' Before the dispensers have been driven out, Mortimer said, you cannot and you must not. Their object in persecuting me so cruelly these last months is perfectly clear. They were trying to provoke me to some foolish act of rebellion, 
so that they might accuse me of high treason and shut me up in some convent or remote castle, as they have your wife. Poor dear Jean, said Mortimer. She has suffered much on my account. And he went over to put a log on the fire. She's been such a great help to me, Isabella went on, and it was she who taught me to know what kind of man you are. On many a night I made her sleep beside me, for I was so afraid they would assassinate me. And she talked to me of you, always of you. I know you better than you realize, my lord. For a moment it seemed as if they were both waiting for something, and they were a little embarrassed, too. Mortimer was leaning towards the fire, and its glow illuminated his deeply cleft chin and thick eyebrows. Had it not been for this war in Aquitaine, continued the Queen, and the letters from the Pope, and this mission to my brother, I'm sure something terrible would have happened to me. I knew it was the only way, madame. Believe me, I had no liking for a war against the kingdom. If I consented to take part in running it and appear as a traitor. For to rebel to defend one's rights is one thing, but to go over to the enemy's camp is another. He had the campaign in Aquitaine very much on his mind, and wanted to exonerate himself. It, it was because I knew there was no hope of saving you except by weakening King Edward. And it was I who conceived the idea of your mission to France, madame. I worked for it unceasingly till it was finally agreed and you were here. There was a deep, vibrant note in Mortimer's voice. Isabella half closed her eyes. She mechanically pushed back one of the blonde tresses that framed her face like the handles of an amphora. What's that scar on your lip? I never noticed it before, she said. A present from your husband, madame. A mark he left on me so that I should never forget him, when the men of his party threw me down in my armour at Shrewsbury, where I was unlucky. And unlucky, madame, less because I lost the battle, risked death and endured prison, than because I failed in my dream of coming to you that evening, carrying the heads of the dispensers, to do homage for the battle I had fought for your sake. This was not the whole truth. The safeguarding of his estates and prerogatives had weighed at least as heavily in the military decisions taken by the Baron of the Marches as had the service of the Queen. But at this moment he was sincerely persuaded he had acted only on her behalf. And Isabella believed it too. She had so much wanted to believe it. She had so longed for the day when her cause would have a champion. And now here was that champion, sitting beside her with his long and slender hand that had held the sword, and on his face the slight but indelible mark of a wound incurred for her. In his black clothes he seemed to her to have come straight out of some romance of chivalry. Do you remember, friend Mortimer? She had dropped the My Lord, and Mortimer felt greater joy at it than if he had been victorious at Shrewsbury. Do you remember the lay of the Knight of Greylon? He knitted his thick brows. Greylon. It was a name he had heard, but he could not remember the story. It's in a book by Maria France, which was stolen from me, like everything else, Isabella went on. Greylon was so strong and so splendidly loyal a knight, and his renown so great, that the queen at that time fell in love with him without knowing him. And, having sent for him, the first words she said to him when he appeared before her were, Friend Greylon, I have never loved my husband, but I love you as much as it is possible to love, and I am yours. She was astonished at her own audacity, and that her memory should furnish her with words so exactly appropriate to her own feelings. 
For some seconds, the sound of her own voice seemed to be echoing in her ears. She waited, anxious, troubled, embarrassed, and ardent, for this new Greylong's reply. Can I now tell her I love her? Roger Mortimer wondered, as if there were anything else to say. But there are lists in which the bravest of warriors prove themselves singularly clumsy. Have you ever loved King Edward? he asked, and they both felt equally disappointed, as if they had missed an irretrievable opportunity. Was it really necessary to mention Edward at this moment? The Queen sat up a little in her chair. I thought I loved him, she said. I forced myself to it, like a girl going to her wedding with all the proper emotions. But I soon realized what sort of a man I had been married to. And now I hate him, and with so strong a hatred that it can die only with me or with him. Do you know that for long years I thought my body could inspire nothing but repulsion, and that Edward's disgust for me was due to some physical fault of mine? And do you know, I even still sometimes think so. Do you know, friend Mortimer, since I am admitting everything to you, besides, your wife knows it all, that in fifteen years Edward has entered my bed no more than twenty times, and then only on days appointed both by his astrologer and my physician. On the last occasion we had relations, when my youngest daughter was conceived, he insisted that Hugh the younger should accompany him to my bed, and he fondled and caressed him before he was able to accomplish his conjugal act telling me that I should love Hugh like himself, since they were so united that they were but one. It was then I threatened to write to the Pope. Mortimer turned scarlet with anger. Honour and love were both equally offended. Edward was utterly unworthy to be king. When would they be able to cry to all his vassals, See who is your suzerain, and before whom you have knelt and paid homage. Take back your sworn allegiance. And when there were so many unfaithful wives in the world, why should that man have a wife of such extraordinary virtue that she had respected his honour in spite of everything? Would he not have deserved it if she had dishonoured him with everyone who came along? But had she been completely faithful? Had no secret love lightened that desperate loneliness? And have you never sought the arms of another? He asked, in a voice of sombre jealousy, in that tone of voice which, so touching and moving at the awakening of love, becomes so wearying at the end of a love affair. Never, she said. Not even with your cousin, the Count of Artois, who seemed this morning to be showing you with considerable frankness that he was attracted to you. She shrugged her shoulders. You know my cousin Robert. All's one that comes to his net, queen or whore, it's all the same to him. One day long ago at Westminster I told him of my loneliness, and as we stood in a window embrasure, he offered to console me. That was all. Besides, didn't you hear him say, Are you still as chaste as ever, my fair cousin? No, dear Mortimer, my heart is desolate and free, and very weary of being so. Oh, madame, it is so long now that I have not dared tell you that you were the only woman in my thoughts cried Mortimer. Is that true, sweet friend? Is it so long? I think, madame, that it dates from the very first time I saw you. But I believe I realized it only one day at Windsor, when tears came to your eyes for some shame King Edward had put on you. But you were distant, not so much because of your crown, but because you were protected by that aloofness of demeanor you've always maintained. 
And then Lady Jeanne was with you, always talking to you, but an obstacle to my approaching you. Shall I tell you that when I was in prison there was no morning or evening I didn't think of you, and that the first question I asked when I escaped from the tower— I know, friend Roger. I know. Bishop Orleton told me. And it made me happy to think I had given money from my privy purse to help you towards freedom. Not because of the gold, which was nothing, but because of the risk, which was great. Your escape increased my troubles. He bowed very low, knelt almost, to show his gratitude. Do you know, madame, he said, his voice graver yet, that when I set foot in France, I made a vow to wear nothing but black till I could return to England, and to touch no woman till I had freed you and seen you again. He was slightly altering the original terms of his vow, and confusing, in the service of his love, the queen and the kingdom. But in Isabella's eyes he was but the more like Greylent, Percival and Lancelot. And have you kept your vow? she asked. Can you doubt it? She thanked him with a smile, with tears swimming in her great blue eyes, and with an outstretched hand, a fragile hand, that sought refuge like a bird in the tall barrens. Their fingers opened, crossed, interlaced. Clasp them, Isabella murmured. Clasp them hard, my friend. For me, too, it has been a long time. She fell silent for a moment, and then went on. Do you think we would be right? I have plighted my trust to my husband, wicked though he is. And you, for your part, have a wife who is without reproach. We have contracted alliances before God, and I have been so hard on the sins of others. Was she seeking protection against herself, or did she wish him to take the sin on himself? He got to his feet. Neither you nor I, my queen, were married of our own free choice. We have uttered vows, but not towards people we chose for ourselves. We obeyed decisions made by our families, not the wishes of our own hearts. To people like us, made for each other as we are. He fell silent. A love that fears to declare itself can lead to strange actions indeed, and desire can take the most circuitous ways to assert its rights. Mortimer was standing in front of Isabella, though their hands were still clasped in each other's. Shall we make a vow of blood brotherhood, my queen? He went on. Shall we mingle our blood, so that I may always be your support, and you always my lady? His voice was quivering under the influence of this strange and sudden inspiration, and the trembling had communicated itself to the Queen's shoulders, for there were sorcery, passion, and faith, all divine and diabolical things, and all that was chivalrous and carnal in what he was proposing. It was the blood bond of brothers in arms and of legendary lovers, the bond the Templars had brought back from the Orient in the Crusades, the bond of love that united the unhappy wife to the lover of her choice, and sometimes even in the presence of the husband, on condition their love remained chaste, or at least was held to be so. It was the oath of the body, more powerful than that of words, and it could not be broken, disavowed, or annulled. Those who pronounced it became more united than identical twins. What each possessed belonged to the other. They had to protect each other at all times, and might not survive each other. They must be blood brothers people whispered of certain couples with a shiver of fear and envy. I can ask everything of you, 
said Isabella in a low voice. He replied by lowering his lids over his flint-colored eyes. I put myself in your hands, he said. You can ask of me anything you wish. You can give me as much of yourself as you want. My love will be what you desire it to be. I could lie naked beside you naked and never touch you if you forbade it. The reality of their love did not lie in this, but it was a sort of right of honour they owed themselves in conformity with accepted tradition. A lover bound himself to show his strength of spirit and the force of his respect. He submitted himself to ordeal by courtesy, but its duration was subject to his mistress's decision. It depended on her whether it should last for ever or cease forthwith. The knight, who was to be armed, remained standing in prayer all night, his arms lying beside him, and swore to defend the widow and the orphan. But as soon as his spurs had been buckled on and he had gone to the wars, he pillaged and raped and used his sword to make widows and orphans by the hundred amid houses in flames. "'Do you agree, my queen?' he said. It was her turn to answer by lowering her lids. They had neither of them 